Section 13 of The Art of Music, Volume 1, The Pre-Classic Periods. Editor-in-Chief, Daniel Gregory Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Militia. The Beginnings of Polyphony. In the preceding chapter, we have tried to trace the perfecting of a form of melody called plain song. We have seen how the mass of the Catholic Church was set to solo music. Apart from the highly expressive quality which the music inevitably acquired because of the reality and life of the new emotional religion, the plain song of the mass did not differ from the artistic music of the Greeks and the Romans. That is to say, it brought forward no new means of effect or of expression. We may say it was the adaptation of old and tried methods to new ends. We can hardly suppose that the technique of composition had been advanced by the early Christian composers beyond the point to which the Greeks had brought it, nor that the art of music had been expanded during the first centuries of the Christian era to greater proportions than the Greeks had developed it. The theorists of the first nine centuries made blunders in trying to systematise Christian song according to the remnants of Greek theory which had been preserved. Yet the Greek scales were still in use, though misnamed by the theorists, and composers for the church still conformed to them. But about the beginning of the ninth century, a new element appeared in music for the church, which the Greeks had left practically untouched and which was probably the contribution of the barbarian peoples of northern and western Europe, either the Germans or the Celts, namely part singing. To the single plain song melodies of the ritual, composers added another accompanying melody or part. The resultant progression of concords and discords was incipient harmony, the practice of so weaving two and later three and four melodies together was the beginning of the science or art of polyphony. Polyphony was practically foreign to the music of the Greeks. They had observed, it is true, that a chorus of men and boys produced a different quality of sound from that of a chorus made up of all men or all boys, and they had analysed the difference and found the cause of it to be that boys' voices were an octave higher than men's, and that boys and men singing together did not sing the same notes. This effect, which they also imitated with voices and certain instruments, they called antiphony, and they considered it more pleasing than the effect of voices or instruments in the same pitch which they called homophony. The practice of making music in octaves was called magadizing, from the name of a large harp-like instrument, the magadis, upon which it was possible. But magadizing cannot be considered the forerunner of polyphony, for, though melodies an octave apart may be considered not strictly the same, still they pursue the same course, and are in no way independent of each other, and the effect of a melody sung in octaves differs from the effect of one sung in unison only in quality, not at all in kind. The allegiance of theorists to Greek culture all through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance has tended to conceal the actual origin of polyphony. But as early as 1767, J. J. Rousseau wrote in his Dictionnaire de Musique, It is hard not to suspect that all our harmony is an invention of the Goths or the Barbarians. And later, It was reserved to the people of the North to make this great discovery, and to bequeath it as the foundation of all the rules of the art of music. The kernel from which the complicated science of polyphony sprang is simple to understand. One voice sang a melody, another voice or an instrument, starting with it, wove a counter-melody about it, elaborated by the flourishes and melismas which are still dear to the people of the Orient. Some such sort of primitive improvisation seems to have been practised by the people of Northern Europe, and to have been taken over by the church singers. The later art of des chants sur la livre, or improvised descant, was essentially no different and seems to have been of very ancient origin. The early theorists naturally took it upon themselves to regulate and systematise the popular practice, and thereupon polyphony first comes to our notice 
through their works in a very stiff and ugly form of music called organum, which in its strictest form is hardly more to be considered polyphony than the magadizing of the Greeks. The works of many of the ninth century theorists, such as Aurelian of Réaumé and Rémy of Orzère, suggest that some form of part singing was practised in their day, though they leave us in confusion owing to the ambiguity of their language. The famous scholar Scotus Eregena, 880, mentions organum, but in a passage that is difficult and obscure. Regino, abbot of Prum in 892, is the first to define consonance and dissonance in such a way as to leave no doubt that he considers them from the point of view of polyphony, that is to say, as sounds that are the result of two different notes sung simultaneously. In the works of Hochbald of St. Amand in Flanders, quite at the end of the century, if not well into the 10th, Hochbald died in 930 or 932, over 90 years of age, there is at last a definite and clear description of organum. The word organum is an adaptation of the name of the instrument on which the art could be imitated, or perhaps on which it partly originated, the organ, just as the Greeks coined a word from Magadis. Of Hochbald's life, little is known save that he was born about 840, that he was a monk, a poet, and a musician, a disciple of Saint Remy of Auxerre, and a friend of Saint Odo of Cluny. Up to within recent years, several important works on music were attributed to him, of which only one seems now to be actually his, the tract De Harmonica Institutione, of which several copies are in existence. This and the Musica Enchiriadis of his friend Saint Odo are responsible for the widespread belief that polyphony actually sprang from a hideous progression of empty fourths and fifths. Both theorists, in their efforts to confine the current form of extemporized descant in the strict bounds of theory, reduced it thus. To a given melody taken from the plain song of the church, the descanter or organizer added another at the interval of a fifth or fourth below, which followed the first melody, or cantus firmus, note by note, in strictly parallel movement. The fourth seems to have been regarded as the pleasanter of the intervals, though, as we shall see, it led composers into difficulties, to overcome which, Hochbald himself proposed a relaxation of the stiff parallel movement between the parts. In the strict organum, or diaphony, the movement was thus. Either or both of the parts might be doubled at the octave, in which case the diaphony was called composite. Just why the intervals of the fifth and fourth should have been chosen for this parallel music, which is excruciating to our modern ears, is not positively known. The simple obvious answer to the riddle is that Hochbald and his contemporaries based their theories on the theories of the Greeks, who regarded the fifth and fourth as consonances nearest the perfect consonants of the octave and unison. But in that case we have to ask ourselves why Hochbald and his followers regarded the diaphony of the fourth as pleasanter than that of the fifth, which they nonetheless acknowledge was more nearly perfect. Dr. Hugo Riemann has suggested a solution to this difficulty, which is in substance that organum was an attempt to assimilate elements of an ancient art of singing practised by the Welsh and other Celtic singers. The Welsh scale is a pentatonic scale, that is, a scale of five steps in which half steps are skipped. In terms of the keyboard, it can be represented by a scale starting upon E flat and proceeding to the E flat above or below only by way of the black keys between or by a similar progression between any other two black keys an octave apart. In such a scale, parallel fourths are impossible as indeed they are in the Greek scales of eight notes upon which the church music was based. 
But whereas the progression of the fourths in the Greek scales is broken by the imperfect and very unpleasant interval of the tritone, in the pentatonic scale it is interrupted by the pleasing major third. Such a progression of fourths and thirds seems to spring almost naturally from the pentatonic scales and was likely very much practised by the ancient Welsh singers. A comparison of two examples will make the difference obvious. Pentatonic Octatonic The presence in the octatonic scale of the disagreeable tritone forced even Hookbald and Odo to make some provision for avoiding it. This consisted in limiting the movement of the organising voice. It was not allowed to descend below a certain point in the scale. In those cases, therefore, in which the cantus firmus began in such a way that the organising voice could not accompany it at the start without sinking below its prescribed limit, the organising voice must start with the same note as the cantus firmus and hold that note until the cantus firmus had risen so that it was possible for the organising voice to follow it at the interval of a fourth. In the same way, the parts were forced to close at the unison if the movement of the cantus firmus did not permit the organising voice to follow it at the interval of a fourth without going below its limit. The following example will make this clear. In this case, it will be noted that the movement of the parts is no longer continuously parallel, but that there are passages in which it is oblique. Indeed, it is hardly conceivable that strict parallel movement was ever adhered to in anything but theory. It is interesting to observe how even in theory it had to give way, and how by the presence of the tritone in the scale the theorists were practically forced into a genuine polyphonic style. The strict style, as we have already remarked, was hardly more polyphonic than the magadizing of the Greeks, for though the voice parts are actually different, still each is closely bound to the other and has no independent movement of its own. But in the freer style there is a difference, if not an independence, of movement. In connection with this example, it is also well to note that through the oblique movement the parts are made to sound other intervals than the fourth or fifth or unison, which with the octave were regarded for centuries as the only consonances. At the second note of the example, they are singing the harsh interval of a second. Immediately after, they sing a major third. By the earliest theorists, these dissonances were disregarded or accepted as necessary evils. The unavoidable results of the restrictions under which the organising voice was laid but if the free diaphony was practised at all, it was to lead musicians inevitably to a recognition of these intervals, and of the effect of contrasting one kind with another. In the works of Hookwald and Odo, and their contemporaries, however, the ideal is theoretically the parallel progression of the only consonances they would admit, the fourth, fifth and octave. Oblique movement was first of all a way to escape the tritone, and the unnamed dissonances were haphazard. Thus we find only the mere germ of the science of polyphony. The dry stiffness of the music and the inadequacy of the cumbersome rules must lead one to believe that learned men, true to their time, were doing what they could to define a popular free practice within the limits of theory. The sudden untraceable advent of a new free style some hundred years or more later goes to prove that the free descant of a genuinely musical people was never actually suppressed or discontinued by the influence of the theorists. However, before considering the new diaphony, we have still to trace the further progress of the organum of Hookbald and Odo. The next theorist of importance was Guido of Arezzo. To Guido have been attributed at various times most of the important inventions and reforms of early polyphonic music, 
among them descant, organum and diaphony, the hexachordal system, the staff for notation, and even the spinet. But the wealth of tradition which clothed him so gloriously has, as in the case of many others, been gradually stripped from him, till we find him disclosed as a brilliantly learned monk and a famous teacher, author of but few of the works which possibly his teaching inspired. He has recently been identified with a French monk of the Benedictine monastery of saint maur de fosse He was born at or near Arezzo, about 990, and in due time became a Benedictine monk. He must have had remarkable talent for music, for about 1022, Pope Benedict VIII, hearing that he had invented a new method for teaching singing, invited him to Rome to question him about it. He visited Rome again a few years later on the express invitation of Pope John the Nineteenth, and this time brought with him a copy of the Antiphonarium, written according to his own method of notation. The story goes that the Pope was so impressed by the new method that he refused to allow Guido to leave the audience chamber until he had himself learned to sing from it. After this, he tried to persuade Guido to remain in Rome, but Guido, on the plea of ill health, left Rome, promising to return the following year. However, he accepted an invitation from the abbot of a monastery near Ferrara to go there and teach singing to the monks and choir boys, and he stayed there several years, during which he wrote one of the most important of his works, the Micrologus, dedicated to the Bishop of Arezzo. Later he became abbot of the monastery of Santa Croce, near Arezzo, and he died there about the year 1050. During the time of his second visit to Rome, he wrote the famous letter to Michael, a monk at Pomposa, which has led historians to believe that he was actually the inventor of a new division of the scales into groups of six notes called hexachorda, and a new system of teaching based on this division. The case of Guido is typical of the period in which he lived, very evidently an unusually gifted teacher, as Huckbald was a hundred years before him. His influence was strong over the communities with which he came into contact, and spread abroad after his death, so that many innovations which were probably the results of slow growth were attributed to his inventiveness. The Micrologus contains many rules for the construction of organum below a cantus firmus, which are not very much advanced beyond those of Huckbald and Odo. The old strict diaphony is still held by him in respect, though the free is much preferred. To those intervals which result from the free treatment of the organising voice, however, he gives names, and he is conscious of their effect, so that, where Huckbald and Odo confine themselves to giving rules for the movement of the organising voice in such a way as to avoid the harsh tritone, even at the cost of other dissonances, Guido gives rules to direct singers in the use of these dissonances for themselves, which, as we have seen in the earlier treatises, were considered accidental. This marks a real advance, but there is in Guido's works the same attempt merely to make rules, to harness music to logical theory that we found in Huckbald's and Odo's, and it is again hard to believe that his method of organising was in common practice, or that it represents the style of church singing of his day. From the accounts of the early Christians, from the elaborate ornamentation of the plain song in medieval manuscripts in which it is first found written down, and from later accounts of the descanters, we are influenced to believe that music was sung in the church with a warmth of feeling, sometimes exalted, sometimes hysterical, even to the point of stamping with the feet and gesticulating, from which the standardised bald ornamentation of Guido is far removed. Furthermore, the next important treatises after Guido's, one by Johannes Cotto, and an anonymous one called Ad Organum Faciendum, deal with the subject of organum in a wholly new way, and show an advance which can hardly be explained unless we admit that a freer kind of organum was much in use in Guido's day than that which he describes and for which he makes his rules. But before proceeding with the development of the early polyphony after the time of Guido, we have to consider two inventions in music which have been for centuries placed to his credit. In the first place, he is supposed to have divided the scale, which, it will be remembered, 
had always been considered as consisting of groups of four notes called tetrachords, placed one above the other, into overlapping groups of six notes called hexachords. The first began on G, the second on C, the third on F, and the others were reduplications of these at the octave. The superiority of this system over the system of tetrachords, inherited from the Greeks, was that in each hexachord the half tone occupies the same position, that is, between the third and fourth steps. Footnote. Strict imitation would be extremely difficult in the tetrachordal system. A subject given in one tetrachord could not be imitated exactly in another, because the tetrachords varied from each other by the position of the half step within them. Compare, for instance, the modern major and minor modes. The answer given in minor to a subject announced in major is not a strict imitation. If, on the other hand, the answer to a subject in a certain hexachord was given in another hexachord, it would necessarily be a strict imitation, since in all hexachords the half step came between the third and fourth tones, between mi and fa. End of footnote. It is not certain whether Guido was the first so to divide the scale, but he evidently did much to perfect the system. There has long been a tradition that he was the first to give those names to the notes of the hexachord which are in use even at the present day. Having noticed that the successive lines of a hymn to St John the Baptist began on successive notes of the scale, the first on G, the second on A, the third on B, etc., up to the sixth note, namely E, he is supposed to have associated the first syllable of each line with the note to which it was sung. The hymn reads as follows. Ut quiant laxis, re sonari fibris, mira gestorum, famuli tuorum, solve polluti, labi reatum, Sancte Ioannis. Hence G was called ut, a, re, b, mi, c, fa, d, sol, and e, la. These are the notes of the first hexachord, and these names are given to the notes of every hexachord. The half step, therefore, was always mi, fa. Since the hexachords overlapped, several tones acquired two or even three names. For instance, the second hexachord began on C, which was also the fourth note of the first hexachord. And in the complete system, this C was called C fa ut. The fourth hexachord began on G an octave above the first. This G was not only the lowest note of the fourth hexachord, but the second of the third, and the fourth of the second. Therefore, its complete name was G sol re ut. The lowest G, which Guido is said to have added to the perfect system, was called gamma. It was always gamma ut, from which our word gamut derives. The process of giving each note its proper series of names was called solemnization. The system seems to us clumsy and inadequate. We cannot but ask ourselves why Guido did not choose the natural limit of the octave for his groups instead of the sixth. However, it was a great improvement over the yet clumsier system of the tetrachords, and was of a great service to musicians down to comparatively recent times. One may find no end of examples of its use in the works of the great polyphonic writers. As a help to students in learning it, the systems of the Guidonian hand was invented, whereby the various tones and syllables of the hexachords were assigned to the joints of the hand, and could be counted off on the hand much as children are taught in kindergarten to count on their fingers. That Guido himself invented this elementary system is doubtful, though his name has become associated with it. Guido must also be credited with valuable improvements in the art of notation. In his day, two systems were in use. One employed the letters of the alphabet, capitals for the lowest octave, small letters for the next, and double letters for the highest. This was exact, though difficult and clumsy. The other employed neumes, superimposed over the words of the text to be sung, at distances varying according to the pitch of the sound. This, though essentially graphic, was inaccurate. 
composers were already accustomed to draw two lines over the text, each of which stood for a definite pitch, one for F, coloured red, and one for C, a fifth above, coloured yellow. But the pitch of notes between or below or above these lines was, of course, still only indefinitely indicated by the distance of the neumes from them. Guido therefore added another line between these two, representing A, and one above, representing E, both coloured black. Thus the four-line staff was perfected. It has remained the orthodox staff for plain song down to the present day. This improvement of notation, in addition to the hexachordal system and the invention of solmization, have all had a lasting influence upon music, and through his close connection with them, Guido of Arezzo stands out as one of the most brilliant figures in the early history of music. Hardly a trace has survived of the development of music during the fifty years after the death of Guido, about 1050. The next works which cast light upon music were written about 1100. One is the Musica of Johannes Cotto, the other the anonymous Ad Organum Faciendum mentioned above. In both works, a wholly new style of organum makes its appearance. In the first place, the organising voice now sings normally above the cantus firmus, though the whole style is so relatively free that the parts frequently cross each other, sometimes coming to end with the organising voice below. In the second place, contrary movement in the voice parts is preferred to parallel or oblique movement, that is, if the melody ascends, the accompanying voice, if possible, descends, and vice versa. Thus the two melodies have each an individual free movement, and the science of polyphony is really underway. Moreover, they proceed now through a series of consonances. There are no haphazard dissonances as in the earlier free organum of both Hookbald and Guido. The organising voice is no longer directed only in such a way as is easiest to avoid the hated tritone, but is planned to sing always in consonance with the cantus firmus. The following example illustrates the movement of the parts in this new system. Cotto is rather indifferent, and of course dry, about the whole subject of organum. It occupied but a chapter in his rather long treatise, but the anonymous is full of enthusiasm and loud in his praises of this method of part singing and bold in his declaration of its superiority over the unaccompanied plain song. Such enthusiasm smacks a little of the layman and is but another indication of the real origin of organum in the improvised descant of the people, quite out of the despotism of theory. The anonymous gives a great many rules for the conduct of the organising or improvising voice. He has divided the system into two modes, determined by the interval at which the voices start out. For instance, rules of the first mode state how the organising voice must proceed when it starts in unison with the cantus firmus, or at the octave. If it starts at the fourth or fifth, it is controlled by the rules of the second mode. There are three other modes which are determined by the various progressions of the parts in the middle of the piece. The division into modes and the rules are of little importance, for it is obvious that only the first few notes of a piece are definitely influenced by the position at which the parts start, and that after this influence ceases to make itself felt, the modes dissolve into each other. Thus, though the enthusiasm of the anonymous points to the popularity of the current practice of organising, whatever it may have been, his rules are but another example of the inability of theory to cope with it. Still, this theoretical composition continued to claim the respect of teachers and composers late into the second half of the 12th century. A treatise by Guy, abbot of Chaly, about this time is concerned with essentially the same problems and presents no really new point of view. He is practically the last of the theorising organisers. Organum gave way to a new kind of music. In the course of over 200 years, it had run perfectly within the narrow limits to which it had been inevitably confined, and the science of it was briefly this. 
to devise over any given melody a counter melody which accompanied it note by note moving as far as possible in contrary motion sinking to meet the melody when it rose rising away from it when it fell and with few exceptions in strictest concord of octaves fifths fourths and unison rules had been formulated to cover practically all combinations which could occur in the narrow scheme the restricted cramped art then crumbled into dust and disappeared again and again this process is repeated in the history of music the essence of music and indeed of any art cannot be caught by rules and theories the stricter the rules the more surely will music rebel and seek expression in new and natural forms we cannot believe that music in the middle ages was not a means of expression that it was not warm with life and therefore we cannot believe that this dry organum of Huckbald and odo of guido of arezzo of guy of chaly which was stillborn of scholastic theory is representative of the actual practice of music either in the church or among the people on the other hand these excellent old monks were pioneers in the science of polyphonic writing inadequate and confusing as their rules and theories may be they are none the less the first rules and theories in the field the first attempts to give to polyphony the dignity and regularity of art meanwhile long before guy of chaly had written what may be taken as the final word on organum the new art which was destined to supplant it was developing both in england and in france two little pieces one ut tuo propitiatus the other mira rege mira modo have survived from the first part of the twelfth century both are written in a freely moving style in which the use of concords and discords appears quite unrestricted moreover the second of them is distinctly metrical and in lively rhythm it is noted with neumes on a staff and the rhythm is evident only through the words for the neumes gave no indication of the length or shortness of the notes which they represented but only their pitch now in both these little pieces there are places where the organizing voice sings more than one note to a note of the cantus firmus or vice versa so long as composers set only metrical texts to music the rhythm of the verse easily determined the rhythm in which the shorter notes were to be sung over the longer but the text of the mass was in unmetrical prose and if composers in setting this to music in more than one part wished one part to sing several notes to the other's one they had no means of indicating the rhythm or measure in which these notes were to be sung hence it became necessary for them to invent a standard metrical measure and a system of notation whereby it could be indicated their efforts in this direction inaugurated the second period in the history of polyphonic music which is known as the period of measured music and which extends roughly from the first half of the twelfth century to the first quarter of the fourteenth approximately eleven fifty to thirteen twenty five end of section thirteen section fourteen of the art of music volume one the pre-classic periods editor-in-chief daniel gregory mason this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Malizia. Our information regarding the development of the new art of measured music comes mainly from treatises, which appeared in the course of these two centuries. Among them the most important are the two earliest, Discantus Positio Vulgaris and De Musica Libellus, both anonymous and both belonging to the second half of the twelfth century the de musica mensurabili positio of jean de garlandia written about twelve forty five and at last the great ars cantus mensurabilis commonly attributed to franco of cologne about whose identity there is little certainty and the work of walter oddington the english mathematician written about twelve eighty de speculatione musices as the earlier theorists succeeded in compressing a certain kind of music within the strict limits of mathematical theory so the mensuralists 
finally bound up music in an exact arbitrary system from which it was again to break free in the so-called Ars Nova. But the field of their efforts was much larger than that of Organum, and the results of their work consequently of more lasting importance. The first attempts were toward the perfecting of a system of measuring music in time, and the outcome was the perfect system, a thoroughly arbitrary and unnatural scheme of triple values. That the natural division of a musical note is into two halves scarcely needs an explanation. We therefore divide our whole notes into half notes, the halves into quarters, the quarters into eighths, and so forth. But the mensuralists divided the whole note into three parts, or two unequal parts, and each of these into three more. The standard note was the longa. It was theoretically held to contain in itself the triple value of the perfect measure. Hence it was called the longa perfecta. The first subdivision of the longa in the perfect system was into three breves, and of the breve into three semi-breves. But in those cases in which the longa was divided into two unequal parts, one of these parts was still called a longa. This longa, however, was considered imperfect, and its imperfection was made up by a breve. So too the perfect breve could be divided into an imperfect and a semi-breve. Let us now consider the signs by which these values were expressed. The sign for the longa, or long as we shall henceforth call it, was a modification of one of the old neumes called a virga. That for the brevis, or breve, came from the punctum. The new signs were long and breve. The semi-breve was a lozenge-shaped alteration of the breve. This seems simple enough, until we come across the distressful circumstances that the same sign represented both the perfect and imperfect long, and that the perfect and imperfect breve too shared the same figure. The following table illustrates the early mensural notes and their equivalents in modern notation. The table is as follows. Maxima equivalent to the modern breve. Perfect long equivalent to a dotted semi-breve. Imperfect long being a semi-breve. Brevis recta, a minim. Brevis altera, a semi-breve. Semi-brevis minor, a crotchet. Semi-brevis major, a minim. And two which were added later, the minima, equivalent to a quaver, and semi-minima, a semi-quaver. In our age of utilitarian inspiration, the imperfections of such a system of notation in which the two most frequent signs had a twofold significance would be remedied by the invention of other signs. But the theorists of that day found it easier and more natural to supplement the system with numbers of rules whereby the exact values of the notes could be determined. For example, a long followed by another long was perfect. A long followed by a brief was imperfect, and to be valued as two beats. But a long followed by two briefs was perfect, for the two briefs in themselves made up a second perfect three, since one was considered as recta and the other as altera. A long followed by three briefs was obviously perfect, since the three briefs could not but make up a perfect measure. Similar rules governed the valuation of the brief. Three breves between two longs were not to be altered. Four breves between two longs also remained unaltered, since one of them counted to make up the imperfection of the preceding long. But five breves required alteration. The first three counting as one perfect measure, the last two attaining perfection by the alteration of the second of them. Semi-breves were also subject to the laws of perfection and alteration, and were governed by much the same laws as governed the breves. One who mastered all these laws was able to read music with more or less certainty, though it must have been necessary for him to look ahead constantly in order to estimate the value of the note actually before him. Later theorists did not fail to associate the mysteries of the perfect system of triple values with the trinity, and thus sprang up the belief that the earlier mensuralists 
had had the perfection of the trinity in mind when they allotted to the perfect longer its measure of three values. Yet, clumsy as the system of triple values was, it was founded upon perfectly rational principles. It was the best compromise in music between several poetic metres, some of which, like the iambic and trochaic, are essentially triple. Others, like the dactylic and anapistic, essentially double. Music during all the years while the mensualists were supreme was profoundly influenced by poetic metres. All these had been reduced by means of the triple proportion to six formulas or modes, and every piece of music was theoretically in one or another of these modes. Such a definite classification of various rhythms, besides being eminently gratifying to the learned theorists, was of considerable assistance to the singer in his way through the maze of menstrual notation, who, knowing the mode in which he was to sing, had but to fit the notes before him into the persistent, generally unvarying rhythm proper to that mode. Composers were well aware of the monotony of one rhythm long continued. They therefore interrupted the beats by pauses, and occasionally shifted in the midst of a piece from one mode to another. The pauses were represented by vertical lines across the staff, and the length of the pause was determined by the length of the line. The perfect pause of three beats being represented by a line drawn up through three spaces, the imperfect pause of two beats by one crossing two spaces and the others in proportion. The end was marked by a line drawn across the entire staff. So far, the complexities of the menstrual system of notation are not too difficult to follow with comparative ease. But the longs, the breves, and the semi-breves were employed only in the notation of syllabic music, that is, of music in which each note corresponds to a syllable of the text. In those cases, where one syllable was extended through several notes, another form of notation was employed. The several notes, so sung, were bound together in one complex sign, called a ligature. The ligatures, like the longs and the breves, were adaptations of old pneumatic signs. In the old plain song, the flourishes or melismas on single syllables were sung in a free rhythm, but the menstrualists were determined to reduce every phrase of music to exact rhythmical proportions, and these easy, graceful, soaring ornaments were crushed with the rest in the iron grip of their system. Hence the ligatures were interpreted according to the strictest rules. A few examples will serve to show the extraordinary complexity of the system. Among the old pneumatic signs which stood for a series of notes, two were of especially frequent occurrence. These were the podatus and the clivis. Of these, the first represented an ascending series. The second, which seems to have developed from the circumflex accent, a descending series. It will be noticed that the clivis begins with an upward stroke to the first note, which is represented by the heavy part of the line at the top of the curve. The pedatus has no such stroke. Several other signs were derived from these two, and those derived from the clivis began always with this upward stroke and those from the pedatus were without it. Thus all ascending ornaments were represented by a neum which had no preliminary stroke, all descending ornaments by one with the preliminary stroke. This characteristic peculiarity was maintained by the menstrualists in their ligatures. The pedatus became, the text indicates a symbol like a colon, the clivis, the text indicates a symbol, like an R, with a bulbous end. Insofar as the menstrual system of notation was graphic, in that the position of the notes in the scale presented accurately the direction of the changing pitch of the sounds they stood for, there was no need of preserving in the ligatures such peculiarities of the pneumatic signs. But, on the other hand, these peculiarities were needed to represent the menstrual value of the notes in the ligatures, the more so because the menstrualists were determined to allow no freedom in the rendering of those ornaments in ligature, but rather to reduce each one to an exact numerical value. Hence we find two kinds of ligatures, 
those which represented the traits inherited from their pneumatic ancestors, and those in which such marks were lacking. The first were very properly called cum proprietate, the others sine proprietate, and the rule was that in every ligature, cum proprietate, the first note was a brief, while in every ligature, sine proprietate, it was a long. If the ligature represented a series of briefs and semi-briefs, the preliminary stroke was upward from the note, not to it. Further than this we need not go in our explanation of notation according to the mensural system. The mensuralists had their way and reduced all music to a purely arbitrary system of triple proportion, and their notation, though bewildering and complex, was practically without flaw. The reaction from it will be treated in the next chapter. Meanwhile, we have to consider what forms of music developed under this new method. Regarding the relations of the voice parts, one is struck by the new attitude toward consonance and dissonance of which they give proof. In the old and the free organum, only four intervals were admitted as consonant, the unison, the fourth, the fifth, and the octave. The third and the sixth, which adds so much colour to our harmony, were appreciated and considered pleasant only just before the final unison or octave. The mensuralists admitted them as consonant, though they qualified them as imperfect. For, true to the time in which they lived, they divided the consonants theoretically into classes, the octave and unison being defined as perfect, the fourth and the fifth as intermediate, the third, and later the sixth, as imperfect. So far did the love of system carry them, that, feeling the need of a balancing theory of dissonances, these were divided into three classes similarly defined as perfect, intermediate, and imperfect. We should indeed be hard put today to discriminate between a perfect and an imperfect discord. Of the imperfect consonances, the thirds were first to be recognised, the minor third being preferred as less imperfect to the major. The major sixth came next, and the last to be consecrated was the minor sixth, which, for some years after the major had been admitted among the tolerably pleasant concords, was held to be intolerably dissonant. The fact that these concords, now held to be the richest and most satisfying in music, were then called imperfect, is striking proof of the perseverance of the old classical ideas of concord and discord inherited from the Greeks. Again, one must suspect that theory and practice do not walk hand in hand through the history of music in the Middle Ages. The admission of thirds and sixths, even grudgingly, among the consonant intervals, is proof that through some common or popular practice of singing, they had become familiar and pleasant to the ears of men. We have already mentioned the possible origin of organum in the practice of improvising counter-melodies, which seems to have existed among the Celts and Germans of Europe at a very early age. There is some reason to believe that in this practice, thirds and sixths played an important role. In fact, that there were two kinds of organising or descant, one of which, called gimel, consisted wholly of thirds, the other, called faux bordon, of thirds and sixths. These kinds of organising, it is true, are not mentioned by name until nearly the close of the 14th century, but there is evidence that they were of ancient origin. Whether or not these were the popular practices which brought the agreeable nature of thirds and sixths to the attention of the mensuralists has not yet been definitely determined. The reader is referred to Dr. Riemann's Geschichte der Musiktheorie im 19. Jahrhundert, Leipzig, 1898, and The Oxford History of Music, Volume 1 by H. E. Waldridge, Part 1, page 160, for discussions on both sides of the question. The word gimel was derived from the Latin gemellus, meaning twin, and the cantus gemellus, or organising in thirds, in fact, consists of twin melodies. Faux bordon means false burden, or bass. The term was applied to the practice of singers who sang the lowest part of a piece of music an octave higher than it was actually written. 
If the chord C E G is so sung, then it becomes E G C. And whereas in the original chord as written, the intervals are the third from C to E and the fifth from C to G, in the transposed form, the intervals are the third from E to G and the sixth from E to C, of which intervals faux bourdon consisted. The origin of this false singing offered by Mr. Waldridge, though properly belonging in a later period, may be summarised here. By the first quarter of the 14th century, the methods of descant had become thoroughly obnoxious to the ecclesiastical authorities, and the Pope, John the Twenty Second issued a decree in 1322 for the restriction of descant and for the re-establishing of plain song. The old parallel organum of the fifth and fourth was still allowed. Singers, chafing under the severe restraint, added a third part between the cantus firmus and the fifth, which on the written page looked innocent enough to escape detection and further enriched the effect of their singing by transposing their plain song to the octave above, which, as we have seen, then moved in the pleasant relation of the sixth to the written middle part. Thus, though the written parts looked in the book sufficiently like the old parallel organum, the effect of the singing was totally different. However, this explanation of the origin of the term faux bourdon leaves us still unenlightened as to how the sixth had come to sound so agreeably to the ears of these rebellious singers. Having perfected a system of notation, and having admitted the intervals pleasantest to our ears among the consonances to be allowed, having thus broadly widened their technique and the possibilities of music, we might well expect pleasing results from the menstrualists. But their music is, as a matter of fact, for the most part, rigid and harsh. Several new forms of composition had been invented and had been perfected, notably by the two great organists of the Notre Dame in Paris, Léo or Léonin, and his successor Perrotin. It is customary to group these compositions under three headings, namely compositions in which all parts have the same words, compositions in which not all parts have words, and compositions in which the parts have different words. Among the first, the cantilena, chanson, the rondelle and rota are best understood, though the distinction between the cantilena and the rondelle is not evident. The rondelle was a piece in which each voice sang a part of the same melody in turn, all singing together, but whereas in the rota one voice began alone and the others entered each after the other, with the same melody at stated intervals, until all were singing together. In the rondel, all voices began together, each singing its own melody, which was in turn exchanged for that of the others. Among the compositions of the second class, in which not all parts have words, the conductus and the organum purum were most in favour. Both are but vaguely understood. The organum purum evidently the survival of the old free descant, was written for two, three, or even four voices. The tenor sang the tones of a plain song melody in very long notes, while the other voices sang florid melodies above it, merely to vocalising syllables. The conductus differed from this mainly in that such passages of florid descant over extended syllables of the plain song were interspersed with passages in which the plain song moved naturally in metrical rhythm, and in which the descant accompanied it note for note. In the conductus, composers made use of all the devices of imitation and sequence which were at their command. Finally, the third class of compositions named above is represented by the motet. The motet is by far the most remarkable of all forms invented by the mensuralists. In the first part, a melody, usually some bit of plain song, was written down in a definite rhythmical formula. There were several of these formulae, called ordines, at the service of the composers. The tenor part was made up of the repetition of this short formal phrase. Over this, two descanting parts were set, which might be original with the composer, but which later were almost invariably two songs, preferably secular songs. These two songs were simply forced into rhythmical conformity to the tenor. 
They were slightly modified so as to come into consonance with each other and with the tenor at the beginning and end of the lines. Apart from this, they were in no way related, either to each other or to the tenor. So came about the remarkable series of compositions in which three distinct songs, never intended to go together, are bound fast to each other by the rules of measured music, in which the tenor drones a nonsense syllable, while the descant and the treble may be singing, the one the praises of the Virgin, the other the praises of good wine in Paris. This is surely the triumphant non plus ultra of the mensualists. Here, indeed, the rules of measured music preside in iron sway. Not only have the old free ornaments of the early church music been rigorously cramped to a formula and all the kinds of metre reduced to a stiff rule of triple perfection, but the quaint old hymns of the church have been crushed with the gay, mad songs of Paris down hard upon a droning, inexorable tenor, which, like a fettered convict, works its slow way along. A reaction was inevitable, and it was swift to follow. End of section 14section 15 of the art of music volume 1 the pre-classic periods editor in chief daniel gregory mason this librivox recording is in the public domain read by jake militia secular music of the middle ages however slim the records of early church music they still suffice to give some clues to the origin and nature of the first religious songs but when we turn to the question of secular song at the beginning of our era, we are baffled by an utter lack of tangible material. For the same monks to whom we are indebted for the early examples of sacred music were religious fanatics who looked with hostile eyes upon the profane creations of their lay contemporaries. Yet we may be confident of the continued and uninterrupted existence not only of some sort of folk music, but also of the germs at least of an art music, however crude, throughout that period of confusion, incident to and following the crumbling of the Roman Empire. We need but point to our discourse upon the music of primitive peoples, the traces of musical culture left by the ancients, and especially the high achievements of the Greeks, as evidence that whatever the stage of a people's intellectual development Music is a prime factor of individual and racial expression. Furthermore, at almost every period, there is recognisable the distinction between folk music proper, the spontaneous collective expression of racial sentiment, and the more sophisticated creations which we may designate as art. Thus the music transmitted by the Greeks to the Romans, if added to ever so slightly, no doubt was continued with the other forms of Greek culture. The Symposias, Scolia, and lyrics of Hellas had their progeny in the odes of Horace and Catullus. The Bards, the Aeids, and Rhapsodists had their counterpart, degenerate, if you will, in the Histriones, the gladiators and performers in the arena of declining Rome. Turning to the barbarians who caused the empire's fall, we learn that already Tacitus recorded the activities of the German bardit who intoned war songs before their chiefs and inspired them to new victories. While Athenius and Diodorus Siculus both tell of the Celtic bards who had an organization in the earliest Middle Ages and were regularly educated for their profession. Because of the fact that our earliest musical records are ecclesiastical, the impression might prevail that modern music had its origin in the Christian church. But, although almost completely subjected to it as its guardian mother, and almost wholly occupied in its service, the beginnings of Christian music antedate the church itself. Pagan rites had their music no less than Christian, just as we find elements of Greek philosophy in the teaching of Christianity. So the church reconciled pagan festivals with its own holidays, and with them adapted elements of pagan music. Thus our Easter was a continuation of the pagan May Day festivals, and in the old Easter hymn, O Phili et Filii, we find again the old Celtic May Day songs, the Chanson de Quête, 
which still survive in France. We here reproduce one above the other. This example, sung to the text, O Fili et Filii, Rex Celestis Rex Gloriae, This example sung to the text En revenant des dons les champs, en revenant des dons les champs. The midwinter festival merged into our Christmas, and the midsummer festival corresponding to the feast of St. John the Baptist both became connected with masses and songs common to both beliefs. The Tonus Peregrinus, sung to the psalm When Israel Came Out of Egypt, already an old melody in the ninth century, is almost identical with old French secular songs, and we have already observed the adoption of vulgar melodies into sequences and motets. It must be remembered that for a considerable period Christianity and paganism coexisted as tolerant companions. The former could not totally blot out the traditions, customs, conventions, ideas and myths of classic paganism which were rooted in the popular consciousness. All through the Middle Ages, says Simmons, uneasy and imperfect memories of Greece and Rome had haunted Europe. Alexander the Great Conqueror, Hector the Noble Knight and Lover, Helen who set Troy town on fire, Virgil the Magician, Dame Venus lingering about the hill of Hersel, these phantoms, whereof the positive historic truth was lost, remained to sway the soul and stimulate a desire in myth and saga. Associated with these myths were the traditions native to the Celtic and Germanic peoples. The very bards of whom we spoke are known to have entered the service of the church in great number, though this did not prevent their travelling from castle to castle to sing before the princes ballads in praise of their heroic ancestors. Of these epics, hero tales, strange stories of conquest and adventure, the nations of Central Europe possessed a rich treasure, and we hear that about 800 AD, Charlemagne, the sovereign patron of liberal arts, ordered a collection of them to be made. Tolerant though he was of the traditions of his people, the profane songs of love and satire, sometimes indecent, which were sung about the churches, became subjects of his censure and no doubt the trouble they caused was but one indication of the growing antagonism between Christian and non-Christian, the intolerance of the later Middle Ages. Already Charles's son, Ludwig the Pious, looked with disfavour upon the heathen epics. As time went on, and clerical influence broadened, the personalities of pagan tradition became associated with the spirit of evil. Dame Venus had now become the she-devil, the seductress of pious knights. Footnote. The legend of Tannhäuser, perpetuated in Wagner's opera, is an example of this superstition. End of footnote. This again gave rise to new ideas, traditions, and superstitions. The mystic and the supernatural caught hold of the people's fancy and were reflected in their poetry and song. Among the earliest epics, of which the verses are extant, are fragments such as the song on the victory of Clotar the Second over the Saxons in 622 AD. Helger, a historian of the ninth century, tells us that, thanks to its rustic character, it ran from lip to lip when it was sung the women provided the chorus by clapping their hands. Its Latin text is said to be merely a translation of a popular version, which would antedate the earliest known vernacular song by over two centuries. Of a more advanced type is the Song of Roland, the famous chronicle of the death of the Count of Brittany, in the Pass of Roncesvalles, during Charlemagne's return from the conquest of the Spanish March. Its musical notation was lost, but it was sung as late as 1356, at the Battle of Poitiers. Though this great epic consists of no less than 4,000 verses, Tiesso points out that its hero had long been celebrated in innumerable short lyrics, easy to remember, which all the people sang. Many were the epics describing the valiant deeds of Charlemagne himself, 
and posterity deified him as the hero of heroes in numerous strains that are lost to us. But one of which the music has been deciphered, though with varying results, is the Planctus Caroli, a complaint, on the death of the great emperor, 813 AD. Footnote. Complaint was the generic name for the narrative form of song. The later Chanson de Geste, the legend of the passion and of the saints, early romances, and the ballads of the peasants all belonged to this genus. End of footnote. Then there is the quaint vernacular song in praise of King Ludwig III, celebrating his victory over the Normans, 832 AD. Einen Kuning weiß ich, heißet Herr Ludwig, der gerne Gott dienet, weil er ihm's lohnet, etc. Translation A king I know, named Lord Ludwig, who serves God gladly, for he rewards him, etc. But with isolated exceptions like this one, all the early epics were written in Latin. Even the early songs of the First Crusaders, 11th century, are still in that language. Their origin may in many instances have been ecclesiastical. Written by some monk secluded within his monastery walls, they may never have been sung by the people. Their melodies, akin to the plain chant of the church, may never have entered into the popular consciousness. Yet it is in the popular consciousness that we must look for the true origin of medieval secular music. In folk song itself, we must seek the germs of the art which bore such rich blossoms as the troubadour and minnesinger lyrics, and which in turn refreshed by its influence the music of the church itself. As folk songs, we are wont to designate those lyrics of simple character, which handed down from generation to generation are the common property of all the people. Every nation, regardless of the degree of its musical intelligence, possesses a stock of such songs, so natural in their simple ingenuity as to disarm the criticism of art, whose rules they follow unconsciously and with perfect concealment of means. Their origin is often lost in the obscurity of tradition, and we accept them generally and without question as part and parcel of our racial inheritance. Yet, while in a sense spontaneous, every folk song did originate in the consciousness of some one person. The fact that we do not know its author's name argues simply that the song has outlived the memory of him who created it. He was a man of the people, more gifted than his fellows, who saw the world through a poet's eye, but who spoke the same language, was reared in the same traditions and swayed by the same passions and sentiments as they who were unable to express such things in memorable form. This fellow, whose natural language is music, becomes their spokesman. Their heartbeats are the accents of his song. His talent is independent of culture. A natural facility, an introspective faculty, and a certain routine suffice to give his song the coherence and definiteness of pattern which fasten it upon the memory. Language is the only requisite for the transmission of his art. Once language is fixed, and has become the common property of the people, this song, vibrating the heartstrings of its maker's countrymen, will be repeated by another, who perchance will fashion others like it. His son, if he be gifted like himself, will do likewise, and so the inexhaustible well of popular genius will flow unceasingly from age to age. In the sentiments and thoughts common to all, then, we will find the impulses of the songs which we shall now discuss. Considering the different shades of our temperament, sadness, contentment, gladness and exuberance, we find that each gives rise to a species of song, of which the second is naturally the least distinctive the two extremes calling for the most decisive expression. Now sadness and melancholy have their concrete causes, and it is in the narration of these causes that the heart vents its sorrow. Hence the narrative form, the complaint, whose very name would confirm our reasoning, is the earliest form of folk song in the vulgar tongue. In a warlike people, this would naturally dwell upon warlike, heroic themes, and we have already pointed out the early origin of the epic. The musical form of epic was perhaps the simplest of all, taking for its sole rhythm the accent of the words, one or two short phrases, chanted much in the manner of the plain song, sufficing for innumerable verses. It is notable too 
that the church, adroitly seizing upon popular music as a power of influence, adopted this form to another genus, the légende, which, though developed by clericals, struck as deep a root in the people's imagination. Thus we see in the ninth century the chant of Saint Eulalia, and in the tenth, the life of Saint Leisure, which already shows great advance in form, being composed in couplets of two, four, and six verses, alternating. Possessed of better means of perpetuation, this religious epic flourished better and survived longer than the heroic complaint. Still another genus was what we might call the popular complaints, the chanson narrative, which dealt with the people's own characters, with the common causes of woe, the common soldier and the peasant, the death of a husband or a son. Such a one is the chanson de Renault, which is considered the classic type of popular song. It is sung in every part of France, and its traces are found in Spain, Italy, Sweden, and Norway. It is unquestionably of great age, though its date cannot be fixed. The following example of Chanson de Renault is sung to the following text. Quand Jean Renault de Guerre revint, tenait ce trip dans ses mains. Sa mère à la fenêtre en haut, voici venir mon fils Renault. This strain is sung through thirteen stanzas, recounting Renaud's return from the wars to his home, where mother and wife await him, only to die upon the stroke of midnight. The mother artfully conceals the fact from his young spouse, till finally she hears the news from the boys in the street, and sees the catafalque in the church. Her grief is expressed in two final stanzas upon this melody. This example is sung to the following text. Renaud, Renaud, mon réconfort, te voilà donc en rang de mort. Divin Renaud, mon réconfort, te voilà donc en rang de mort. The last stanza very naively telling of her own death. She had said for him three verses, at the first she confessed, at the second she took sacrament, at the third she expired. The music is notable not only for its perfect symmetry and the fidelity with which it expresses the sentiment, but also its discriminating use of the natural and flattered B to produce a plaintive effect to both the employment of modern tonality and the chromatic element in popular song we shall have occasion to return. The 6-8 rhythm is no less remarkable, giving the piece a crispness and definiteness never attained by medieval church music. Parallel to the narrative song, there developed a lighter genre, as old as the complaint itself, which corresponds to comedy as the latter does to tragedy. Its personages are the same, but stripped of all their sombre aspect. Its story has a happy conclusion. Its subject is not infrequently comic and satirical. Tiesso quotes, in contrast to the Chanson de Renaud, an example which is still heard in the provinces of France. Like the song already quoted, it narrates the return of soldiers from the war, but where the first has the mark of death upon him, the other returns with a rose between his lips. It is perhaps not so old as the Chanson de Renault, but equally characteristic and particularly Gallic in flavour. This example is sung to the following text. Trois gens, tambour, son revenant de guerre. Trois gens, tambour, son revenant de guerre. Eri et ran, ran peter plan, son revenant de guerre.
Note the crisp rhythm, the decided major tonality, and the exuberant spirit of the song. Many early melodies show these same characteristics, which at once remind us of that other elemental form of folk music, the dance song in which rhythm is the essential element. Rhythm is the feature which most of all distinguishes popular song, and secular music in general, from church music. It is essentially a emotional quality of music which the Christian church carefully excluded from its chant. We have seen, however, how people's primitive instinct causes them to mark the rhythm of a melody, and beheld the women clapping their hands to the tune of the Complaint of Clotard II. Dependent upon simple formulas which could be easily grasped and remembered, folk song naturally chose the simplest rhythmic and melodic types. Hence the dance became one of the principal rootstocks of secular music. An element which was never admitted into the narrative form, the refrain, is a distinguishing characteristic of the dance song, and in it we see the germ of the earliest of our modern instrumental forms, the rondo, originally the name of a dance. The dance song was perhaps the most varied in melodies, for the wayfaring musicians of the Middle Ages carried them from village to village and from country to country, so that there was a continuous international exchange. The rhythmic nature of folk song carries us into another field of speculation, namely the influence of the people's daily occupations, the close relation between daily life and song in ages when life in its individual and social manifestations could be reduced to simple formulae. Occupational songs have from the earliest times been an important factor in folk music, and it is obvious that early in the Middle Ages such songs were closely associated with the movements of the human body in various occupations. Dr. Boucher calls attention to the fact that the blacksmith at his anvil, the navvy in the street, are striking iambi, troches, spondes, dactyls, and anapests. He has collected an enormous amount of folk songs that were sung by the woodman as he wielded his axe, by the boatman plying his oars, by the peasant as he ploughed his acre, scattered the seed, mowed the field, and reaped the harvest. This, however, pertains particularly to Germany, where Bucher's investigations were chiefly carried on, and whither we must now direct the reader's attention. To trace and formulate distinctions between the folk songs of the northern and southern nations is hazardous undertaking, since the Celtic element which so largely determines the music of Ireland, Scotland and Wales is also present in France and Spain, and since the wars between the various races as well as the great international movements of the Crusades tended to modify national distinctions. All these meetings and collisions between the different nations have left traces in the songs of the individual peoples. However, northern folk song may in general be said to be simpler and more regular in outline, and striving for greater continuity of design or pattern than southern. Rhythm is simpler, firmer, and less given to eccentricities. The tonality is usually clearer, and minor scales seem to predominate. In the dance songs, the passionate and boisterous element, characteristic of the dances of the Slavic and Latin races, is lacking. The folk song of Northern Europe draws largely upon the stock of topics held in common. Ever since Johann Gottfried Herder, in his Stimmen der Wölke in Lieden, the voices of the peoples in song, called attention to the treasures of folk song, the patient research of painstaking scholars has brought forth proof upon proof to show how closely the nations of the North are related, in spite of political boundary lines and other barriers. The recurrence of the same saga or story of ancient myth or hero lore in Scandinavian song and in German, the resemblance between the German Tannhäuser, the Swedish knight Olaf, the Scottish Thomas the Rhymer, and the Flemish Heer Daniel or Heer Halloween, make the question of priority seem irrelevant. North and south of the Channel, and even east and west of the Rhine, the contents of legendary song are curiously alike. In manner too, northern folk songs have many features in common, an instinctive simplicity of language, a freedom from obscurities and far-fetched allusions, the prevalence of a four-lined strophe, an alliteration, an assonance which only in time yield to rhyme. 
the singing of the same tune to an indefinite number of lines or stanzas is common to Celtic bards, Norse skalds, and German singers, and links them to their forerunners in classical antiquity, the Greek rhapsodists. In following the outline of the poem, the melody is usually cast in lines, each closing with a cadence or fall. The lines form groups or couplets, either similar or dissimilar in the manner of rhyming verse lines. The first couple of phrases is repeated to give the structure stability. The middle portion forms the contrast, either by being broken up into shorter lengths or founded upon different notes of the scale. The dominant in the middle cadence is of frequent occurrence. The rhythm is simple. Impressionable and receptive by nature, the German people have always given to imitation of foreign models, and there is no doubt that the international movements during the Crusades and the visits of wandering minstrels of foreign birth introduced alien elements and obliterated some of the original features of German folk song. The pathetic rise of a tune through the fifth to the minor seventh suggests Scandinavian influence. The alternation of major and relative minor may be traced to the same source. Still, the German Volkslied had some traits that distinguish it from the folk song of other northern nations. It is more firmly knit, more formal, and less emotional. Unlike English song, which favours a repetition of short phrases, a single figure which, repeated on different degrees of the scale, sometimes makes up the whole tune, German folk song repeats short phrases only to establish balance after contrast, or to make the essential parts of the structure correspond. There is a marked tendency to make the formal climax coincide with the emotional, but in this respect the Volkslied does not reach the admirable symmetry of the Irish folk song. A distinctive form is the Jodel or Jodler of the mountaineers of Germany, the Tyrol and Switzerland. Based upon broken chords or arpeggios, it suggests, as do some other folk songs built upon a harmonic foundation, that the German people had an innate sense for diatonic harmony, long before harmony as such became an element of musical composition. Footnote. The cowhorn tune of Salzburg, 14th century, suggests that the arpeggio manner may have been derived from the horn itself, which was the most common instrument in the pastoral regions of the Tyrol and Switzerland. End of footnote. With the exception of the yodler, which is unique for its exuberance of spirit, the Volkslied is rather reserved and contained in manner. It reflects the serious contemplative character and the healthy, well-poised temperament of a physically and spiritually strong race. Song and dance entered largely into the life of medieval German villages and towns. When village communities depended upon their own resources for work and play, every village had its own musicians. The peasant boys usually played the fiddle, the shepherds the shalmi, while the flute was hardly less popular. In the towns there were several functionaries identified with certain forms of song. The watchman on the town wall, Türmer, was blowing a tune on his horn. The wait, or Nachtwächter, admonished the people to observe the curfew hour and repair for the night. And when the postilon, or courier, came through the gates with clatter of hoofs and cracking of whips, the rousing notes of his horn brought young and old into the street to greet the bringer of news. The smallest community had its town piper. There was no festivity without song or dance, and the instrumentalist playing for the dance was accompanied by a presenter for the singing and a leader for the steps. The great variety of occupations and pastimes, accompanied by song and dance, made for a great variety of folk tunes. From this folk song of medieval Germany, dealing with the realities of life in their manifold manifestations, one could almost reconstruct the whole life of the race, its history, beliefs, superstitions, activities, social and domestic customs, its intimate domestic relations, and its important public functions. The Tage, Leichen, Tanz, Spruch, Zauber, and Wünschelieder, the harvest, spinning, soldiers, and other trade and labour songs, are a musical commentary as illuminating to the historian as any other relics of the past. Many beautiful melodies still heard by the traveller 
in Brittany, Normandy, Provence, or the rural sections of Germany date from the Middle Ages. Their charm and their vitality are such that they have survived the onslaught of advancing civilization for eight centuries or more. They take us back to the time when agriculture was the one great pursuit of man, when in solitude song lightened his labour, and in company song cheered his rest, when every custom, ceremonial, occupation, had its songs, when music was a solace to all alike, when that terrible distinction between the lettered and unlettered did not exist. For neither in Greece nor in the Middle Ages did it exist, the same poetry pleased all, the prince and the burgher, the knight and peasant. In certain Breton provinces, says Tiesso, following an old feudal law, established in the 11th and 12th centuries, certain revenues were paid in song. In one place the prior exacted the tax of nuptial song from the newly married on the Sunday after the wedding. In another, every new bride was obliged to perform a song and dance, whereupon the lord would decorate the bride with a flower bonnet, while all the women married during the year danced and sang a song. Eloquent testimony, indeed, of the love of music among our early forefathers. We have had occasion to mention the vagrant musicians, that singular adjunct to middle-age society, which appeared in every country of Central Europe, in Germany as Fahrende, in France as Fabliot or Contraire, and later as Jongleur or Menetrier in England as minstrel. Gustav Freytag has speculatively traced their origin back to the Roman gladiators, actors and performers mentioned above, a despised race who were, like their supposed posterity, beyond the pale of the law. When the Germanic hordes swept away the degenerate opulence of Rome, this class may well be supposed to have scattered among the barbarian conquerors. As once in the arena, they now stood before the huts of Frankish chieftains, performing their tricks and piping strange tunes. To the populace of the Middle Ages, they were welcome guests, for they provided the one means of artistic entertainment outside the church. In Germany, the Fahrende Sänger, or Spielmann, whether a native who had travelled in many lands, or a singer of foreign birth, was sure to find his way into the remotest huts of the countryside. He brought with him new tunes and took with him those that he heard at the fireside that had given him hospitality. In this way, the stock of tunes handed down from father to son and from mother to daughter was in every generation enlarged by acquisitions from without. The minstrel was the medium of musical exchange between the town and the country, between the several provinces and between different nations. He was the middleman and the teacher through whom echoes of the songs of Norse skulls, Welsh and Irish bards, and French and Provençal singers reached the German people and vice versa. He was especially popular in England, where numerous instances are quoted of minstrels appearing at royal weddings and other great functions, not only individually but in large numbers, and being so richly rewarded for their services that the church complained because they were better paid than priests. Individual German sovereigns also seem to have appreciated their skill and distinguished them by marks of favour. In 1355, Emperor Charles IV appointed one Johann der Fiedler, Rex Omnium Historiorum, for the Archbishopric of Mayence, and thirty years later another minstrel, the piper Brachte, bore the official title König der Fahrende Lüte, King of the Wayfarers. In France, too, the vagrant appears as the original type of popular singer. He ran from one end of the land to the other. Received and even invited by the great lords, he went from castle to castle, his head filled with songs, or his pockets with parchments, if indeed he could read. Perchance he would stop in the common of some village, play a few stray arpeggios on his viol, and, having collected an enthusiastic audience, sing a complaint, the adventures of a favourite hero, or perhaps recount the story of a celebrated crime, embellished with horrifying details. 
Again, he might sing a love romance, or even a scriptural legende. The prodigal son, or some other parable, the life of a saint, or the passion of our Lord. With the growth of the cities and the development of the middle class, the wandering minstrel lost popularity in Germany, even among the people. His itinerant life bred a disregard of social customs and conventions, which caused no little concern among the respectable burghers of larger communities. And both the Sachsenspiegel and the Schwabenspiegel, chronicles of the 13th century, record the fact that minstrels were outside the social pale and even excluded from membership in the church. Yet these same outcasts of the church, excluded from its sacraments, would gather the faithful in the cathedral square, and, exciting the people's fancy with sacred legends and miracles, would, as it were, become the self-appointed allies of the clergy. But at last, in uncompromising opposition to them, the resident musicians of the towns associated themselves in the manner of guilds, and monopolised the privilege of furnishing music for public functions, being employed and paid by the city councils. The earliest musicians' guild of this kind was the Nikolai Brüderschaft, Brotherhood of St. Nicholas, organised in Vienna in 1288. Its management was entrusted to a high official, the Musikantenvogt, later Oberspielgraf, who represented the highest tribunal in matters of music. The policy of these musicians' guilds was similar to that of musicians' unions of the present day. In a district covered by the guilds, only persons enrolled as paying members were allowed to play or sing for money. It was different in France. Here the jongleur, by virtue of special circumstances, became a privileged character and enjoyed the continued patronage of the aristocracy, for he was an all-important factor in the musicianship of chivalry, which we shall presently discuss. We have left out of our consideration of folk music so far that all-important element of modern song, the mainspring of lyricism, romantic love. In an age when man's entire spiritual life was dictated by religious dogma, his natural instincts, branded as profane and unworthy, were naturally excluded from the objects of his poetic expression. But the church could not completely triumph over nature. The fundamental human sentiments, above all profane love, after having for more than ten centuries been excluded from the expression which musical science might have vouchsafed to them, now seemed to take their revenge, to free themselves from long subjection, to let voices hitherto condemned to silence be heard at last. By the side of the altars where psalms were sung, where the things of the world were condemned, the free and subtle stories of exalted love arose, like irresistible protests of the human heart. The cult of the ideal woman, the mother of the saviour, the virgin immaculate, continued, but beside it was heard the praise of the woman of France, of Germany, of Italy, the subject of another sort of devotion, as exalted and often as pure. The chivalrous qualities of the race, disciplined and refined by Christian dogma, but rebelling against asceticism, reappeared and reclaimed their rights with a new vivacity. This new spirit pervaded all classes of society. The nobility especially now affected a finer, more spiritual manner of life. Christian metaphysics, superior education, and the advanced social position of women were the things which prepared the way for chivalry, that new moral code propagated by formal orders of knighthood. The Crusades and contact with Eastern culture confirmed its establishment. With this first renaissance of the modern spirit came also the awakening of a new appreciation of the beauties of nature. Man began to notice the first flowers, the song of birds, the signs of spring's awakening. This gave rise to a species of popular song known as the pastoral, pastorelle, which was afterward adopted and cultivated by the troubadours, who subjected it to certain rules respecting the sequence of different lengths of verses, etc. Besides the pastorelle, numerous other forms of love songs. We need only mention the serenades peculiar to the south, the Basque country, and Corsica especially, are of truly popular origin. 
it may not be out of place here to quote the charming love romance in narrative form, entitled Aucassin et Nicolette, dating from the beginning of the 13th century, which had an undoubted influence upon the music of chivalry both in France and in Germany. It comprises 21 vocal pieces interspersed with 20 prose sections, which are to be read, not sung, as the superscription Or cédiant et cantant et flabluant indicates, in distinction from the Or cant of the verse sections. The verse also forms part of the narrative, with the exception of Orcassin's song to the evening star, which is purely lyric, but of the same musical treatment as the epic songs of the piece. Verse 1. The text is Es toilette, je te vois. Verse 2. The text is Que la lune très à soi. Twelve more verses follow, and finally verse 15 to the text Suer dus ami. The second musical line here serves for 13 successive text lines with continuous rhyme, another example of this most ancient method of cantillation. We must now pass on to the development of the love song, which seems to have been the special task of a gifted and celebrated race of knighthood, the glorious post-musicians called troubadours and trouvères in France and minnesinger in Germany. End of section 15. Section 16 of The Art of Music, Volume 1, The Pre-Classic Periods. Editor-in-Chief Daniel Gregory Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Melitzia. The Troubadours and Trouvères, so-called from Trouba or Trouvères, to find, were in sharp contrast to the vagrant professional musicians, noble knights, who practised the graceful arts as gifted amateurs, primarily in the impassioned praise of a woman and for the sole prize of her favour, with such zeal and superior intelligence that they soon outstripped in skill their meaner colleagues, who now became their servants. France was, it will be recalled at this time, linguistically divided into two sections. The long doc was spoken in the south, and the long doi in the north. In the south, in Provence and Languedoc, the so-called troubadour movement had its inception. That glorious land, endowed with all the charms of sunny skies, which surpassed all other European provinces in culture, prosperity, and spiritual contentment, was the cradle of this chivalry with which are associated supreme sensual enjoyment, a passion for splendour, and the worship of women, thus uniting all the conditions of poetic art. Chivalry spread rapidly beyond the limits of these provinces, however, and across the Pyrenees, where lay the three Christian kingdoms of Castile-Léon, Navarre, and Aragon. Counts, dukes, and kings extended their patronage to this knightly poet-band, and vied with each in attaching to their courts a brilliant assemblage of singers. The Counts of Provence, especially Raymond Berengar III and his successors, the Counts of Toulouse, Anjou, and Poitou, the Kings of Aragon, Castile, and Léon, the Margraves of Montferrat and Est, the French royal court, where Eleanor of Poitou was queen, and the court of England under Henry II, the second husband of Queen Eleanor, provided rallying centres. Even the sovereigns themselves were ambitious for the favour of the muses. The earliest troubadour of prominence was Guillaume, Count of Poitiers, 1087-1127. Contemporary with him was Robert, Duke of Normandy, the son of William the Conqueror, who, after returning from the Crusade, 1106, was till his death a prisoner of his brother Henry I of England in the castle of Cardiff, where he is said to have attained the rank of a Welsh bard. 
This remarkable and sudden flowering of lyric poetry among the knighthood of the 11th century, continuing for two centuries and more, the record of which stands brightly emblazoned upon the shield of musical history, has never been satisfactorily explained. Riemann thinks that the education of the young nobility in the monasteries certainly had a refining influence. The familiarity with old Breton and British literature, the legend of King Arthur's round table, the old Celtic narrative poems and romances, especially the legend of Tristan and Isolt, which were known through old French adaptations, likewise had an influence. By their own testimony, however, the Provençal poets found their immediate suggestions in folk song itself, as interpreted by the jongleurs. The latter's entire repertoire of classic and medieval chronicles was adopted by the troubadours, whose own experiences in the Crusades later caused them to substitute recent chivalric deeds for antique subjects. The forms of the jongleur's art we find again in the troubadour creations, but refined in style, governed by definite laws of poetry, more exalted in sentiment, so that without sacrifice of spontaneity, they have gained distinction and variety, and have become conscious works of art. As we are concerned here only with their musical significance, which indeed has been generally ignored by literary historians, and underestimated by musicians, we shall have little to say about these forms, for great as is the variety of their content, we fail to find parallel distinctions in their musical settings. It should not be overlooked, however, that certain poetic devices and ingenuities gave rise to more advanced musical forms, i.e. the repetition of a phrase on two rhyming verses at the beginning of a song, followed by a variant, which is the elementary form of the lead. The so-called verse gives a starting point for troubadour lyrics. This was the name given to a strictly normal composition, in a measure of eight syllables, with probably an amplification of the more sporadic, uneven verse forms of the jongleurs. The chanson is a more sophisticated form, consisting of alternating verses of different lengths. Giron de Bournay, 1175-1220, is known as its first exponent. Then we find again the familiar narrative form in the guise of chansons de geste, epics recounting deeds of valour, the sirvants, employed in a lover's address to his mistress as well as in satire, which is an early prototype of the famous terza rima, later adopted by Dante and Petrarch, and the tenson, a controversial song in which the same subject is treated by rival poets, real and fictitious, in alternating verses. The Breton narrative, or lie, of melancholy character, as represented in the Tristan legend, was also adopted by the troubadours. Other lyrics are variously designated as canson, canzona, sola, a merry song, romance, more characteristic of the trouvère, alba, or bard, a morning song, serena, serenade, an evening song, and pastoral, the favourite form already mentioned, which is the richest in popular elements, dance rhythms, refrains, etc. The pastoral is characterised by extreme simplicity of theme. Its characters are shepherds and shepherdesses, and it usually begins in the narrative form, the narrator fixing the time of his adventure, the early morn, and the scene, invariably a field, where he meets a shepherdess in the shade of a bush or at the edge of a spring. The amorous dialogue which follows has a happy conclusion if the lover be a shepherd, an unhappy one if he be a knight. The sentiments expressed in the troubadour pastoral are, of course, rather those of knight and lady in the disguise of shepherds than those of real shepherds. Robin and Marion, the usual hero and heroine of pastoral songs, are the central personalities of a whole cycle, the origin of which is exceedingly ancient, far behind the day of Adam de la Halle, who is perhaps the most famous composer of pastorals. Most of the medieval pastorals preserved to us belong to this cycle. The famous Robin Mem is still sung, we are told, by the peasants of northern France. It runs as follows. 
This example is sung to the text. Robin m'aime, Robin m'a. Demande si mara. The pastoral song survived the Middle Ages and was a favourite down to the Revolution, long before which it had, however, found its way into the aristocracy and polite society of cities, and so lost the little natural flavour which still clung to it in the days of the troubadours. Robin and Marion made way for Tiersis and Aminta, Phyllis and Lysidas, beribboned and bespangled counterfeits of the original article. To illustrate how hackneyed this type of song, and the plays later made out of them had become in the time of Molière, we may quote Monsieur Jourdain. Why all these shepherds? I see nothing else. To which the dancing master replies peremptorily, When characters speak in music it is necessary, for the sake of realism, to make them shepherds. Song was ever affected by shepherds. It is hardly natural that princes and princesses should vent their passions in musical dialogue. Among troubadour dance forms, there should also be mentioned the carole or ronde de carole, retroenza, estampida, and esplingeri, jumping dance. Particularly notable is the estampida of Rambo de Vacueiras, 1180-1270, a troubadour at the court of Montferrat the lover of the beautiful princess Beatrice. The story connected with it aptly illustrates the influence of the jongleurs. When one day a band of these, native of France, came to the court, they awakened general merriment with a new estampida played on their viols. Only Rambaud could not be roused from his melancholy, and Beatrice asked him therefore to sing a song himself, and so regain a happier mood whereupon he composed the charming dance-song Calenda Maya in the manner of the jongleur's estampida. It should be noted here that, in the transcriptions of troubadour songs, and most of the small manuscript treasure preserved to us still once unfolding, there has until recently prevailed the error to interpret them as measured music. Measured music came into use, we have seen, with Franco of Cologne, about AD 1200, but nevertheless many writers did not adopt it for centuries thereafter. 
The troubadours persistently followed the meter of the verse instead of fitting their melodies into a set rhythmic scheme, and most naturally so when we consider that they were primarily poets. Hence the square notes in which they note their melodies are really nothing but neumes on a staff. This use has given rise to the error common to most historians, who in forcing the beautiful, spontaneous tunes into a straight jacket of modern measurement, deprived them of their rhythmic and melodic grace in a manner which did violence to the verses as well. In considering their musical quality, we must call attention to the fact that, while devoid of the rich beauties of modern harmony, these songs, availing themselves both of the antique modes and modern tonalities, are able to convey nobility of sentiment, passion, and varied shades of emotion. Breathing the tender grace of a day that is dead, they are, in some instances, still able to charm in our noisy age, and the influence which they had upon the course of the art can hardly be overappreciated. It has been mentioned that the jongleurs came largely into the service of the troubadours. It is they who accompanied the knights in their travels from castle to castle, providing the lighter kinds of amusement, and the instrumental accompaniment such as it was on their viols or rotas. Sometimes indeed singing their master's songs, with the dissemination of which they were frequently entrusted. That they often undertook to improve these compositions on their own account, we gather from the words of Père d'Auvergne and others, entreating jongleurs not to meddle with their verses and melodies. Sometimes, no doubt, they were more gifted than the troubadour, and provided the melody for his verses as well. In some instances, indeed, a jongleur became a troubadour or trouvère, and sometimes a troubadour became a jongleur, as in the case of Gorselm Faidit, who lost money at dice and was forced to earn a livelihood by his art. For that was the real distinction between the two. One sang for glory, the other for gain. As long as they did not make a trade of their art, lowly born and bastards took equal rank with princes and nobles in the earlier periods, at least. While at first the troubadour disdained to accompany his own singing, he soon learned the art from the jongleur and in many cases became his own accompanist. His favourite instruments were the viol, the rota, a former fiddle, and the organistrum, the middle-aged hurdy-gurdy. The quality of the melodies or chords he wrested from them can hardly be conjectured, for we must not forget that of polyphony, still in its incipient stages among the learned musicians of the church, he had no knowledge, not at least until about the time of Adam de la Halle, 1240-1287, who forms the bridge, as it were, from the trouvères to the scientific musicians of the Netherlands school. We must now briefly enumerate a few of the illustrious Provençal troubadours. There were about 400 poets of fame. The list is headed by Guillaume, Count of Poitiers. Soon after him comes the fiery and poetic Bernard de Ventador, 1140-1195, patronised by Queen Eleanor, and Macabrun, the foundling, who wrote between 1150 and 1195, in a most involved style and generally a satirical vein. Then comes Geoffrey Rudel, Prince of Blaya, 1140-1170, famous for his languishing love songs. Père d'Auvergne, 1152-1215, the master of the troubadours, renowned for artistic finish. Guillaume de Castebagne, 1181-1196, whose poetic adulation of his lady cost him his life at the hand of her jealous husband, while the object of his affection was forced to eat his heart. Père Vidal, 1175-1215, perhaps the most celebrated of all the troubadours. Bertrand de Vaughan, 1180-1195, famous for his war songs. Folquet de Marseille, 1180-1231, Bishop of Toulouse. Rambo de Vacairas, 1180-1207, the cynical and caustic Monk of Montaudon, 1180-1200, Arnaud Daniel, 1180-1200, a nobleman of Perigord celebrated by Petrarch and Dante. Gorsem Faidit, 1190-1240, Savary de Morlion, 1200-1230, who fought with Raymond of Toulouse against Simon de Montfort. Père Cardinal, 1210-1230, to 
and Guiron Riquier, 1250-1294, the last true troubadour. Among the women, of whom seventeen achieved great reputation, the foremost was Beatrice, Countess of D and wife of Guillaume de Poitiers. The crushing out of the troubadours is ascribed to the Albigensian Crusade, which lasted from 1207 to 1244. The Albigenses' home was in the very heart of the troubadour country, and the legate of Pope Innocent III, sent as inquisitor, was murdered there during his attempt to extirpate the heresy. The crusade of revenge which followed was particularly directed against Count Raymond of Toulouse, staunch patron of the troubadours, who flocked to his standard and raised their voices in songs of war and religious controversy. Their odes, pasquinades, and siavants were sung by their jongleurs in marketplaces and at fairs, while they themselves girt on their swords and fought. During a fierce war of twenty years, waves of soldiers and clergy swept through the lonely vineyards and gardens, leaving only blackened ruin in their wake. The bright days of the troubadour were ended, the society that supported him was crushed, and the blow that fell in Provence reverberated through all the land. The race was not extinct, however. Its representatives found a welcome at the courts of Castile, of Aragon, and of Sicily, where Frederick the Second was king. From this last centre they unquestionably exerted an important influence upon the Italian Renaissance, to which we shall recur in a later chapter. In this connection we may mention the interesting fact that the poet Dante, early in the 14th century, visited the troubadours in their home and drew inspiration from their art. The Trouvert's ascendancy dates from about 1137, when Eleanor of Aquitaine became Queen of France. At her court, the knights who spoke the Long Doi came in contact with those of the South, and from them received their poetic impulse. Besides this linguistic difference, the only other distinction is the somewhat more earnest character of Trouvert songs. Among their illustrious representatives we must name first King Richard I, 1169-1199, of England, Coeur de Lyon, and his Menestrel, Blondel de Nel. Then there are Marie de France, at the court of Henry II of England, Thibault IV, Count of Champagne, afterward King of Navarre, 1208-1253, to Raoul de Coucy, end of 12th century, Perrin d'Angécourt, Audefroy le Bastard, Guillaume de Dijon, Gérard de Bretal, and Adam de la Halle, surnamed Le Bossu d'Arras, the Hunchback of Arras, whose works are preserved to us and are published by Kussmaker in modern notation. That he was a genuinely inspired poet and composer is eloquently attested by his chansons, rondeaux, and motets, in which he also displays a complete mastery of the musical science of his day. The most important of his works is the pastoral comedy Le Jeu de Robin et de Marion, which he arranged at the command of the King of Naples about the year 1285. Very little of the music was his own, most of it was taken from the stock of popular song. As a wanderer over Europe, a man of free, wild life, who had yet undergone strict musical training in the monasteries of northern France, he is interesting as showing the contrast of theoretical and of actual music, and the first efforts to combine the one with the other. It is difficult, if not impossible, to say just how much the troubadours and the trouvères influenced the development of music. The troubadours found a footing in Sicily and southern Italy and influenced the growth of the so-called Ars Nova, which will be treated in the next chapter. Melodies of the trouvères were adopted by the Netherland composers as the foundations of their masses. These are definite points at which secular and religious music certainly touched. If beyond this the relations between them are vague and hard to trace, the movements of which the troubadours and the trouvères are manifestations are nonetheless of vital significance in the history of music. Through them the undercurrent of real free music, which we may be sure never ceased to flow even when the crushing weight of scholasticism was heaviest, welled to the surface. They represent spontaneous joy and human delight in ages fettered with theology and logic. 
They represent the real source of music. Those who would believe that the great Italian Renaissance was not primarily a return to classicism, but an all-powerful and general awakening of man to the beauty and delight of earth, will find in the music of the troubadours and trouvères this natural delight expressed. If, as it happened, music was the last to rise up in the freedom of the Renaissance, it was because music got no help in her need of expression from a study of the music of the ancients. Music had to build slowly by her own means, unaided by precedent and past accomplishment, fed and encouraged only by the natural love of man's heart to sing, a love which is here attested in the Dark Ages, and to which she finally turned. We must again give our attention to Germany, where a musical development parallel to that of the Provençal and French chivalry had been going forward since the 12th century. Art music as such had so far been confined in Germany to the church, the composers and scholars devoted to its practice were to be found largely in the monasteries. But about the beginning of the 12th century, an attempt was made by poet-singers of noble birth to found a school of secular song, expressing their ideals of life and appealing to people of their rank. This conscious effort of aristocratic singers shared with the unconscious achievement of folk song a certain range of topics, notably historical and sacred, and a certain naivete of attitude. In other respects it differed from it radically, both in content and in manner, for it was founded upon the ideal of chivalry, and was full of the spirit of gallantry. But while the southern poet-singers made profane love their one great theme, German chivalric poetry in a curious way blended the medieval adoration of the Virgin Mary with the worship of women in general. From this devotion to Fru Minne, Dame Love, it was called Minnegesang, and its singers Minnesinger. The beauties of nature, ever present in German poetry, also formed an important subject in Minnegesang. Though simple enough in itself, this first art song of the Germans never equalled the ingenuousness of the Volkslied, for a burden of knowledge hampered the flight of the poet's imaginations and chilled the ardour of their sentiments, and in the attempt to escape from base realities they frequently lost themselves in elusive abstractions. The allegorical element, almost absent in the Volkslied, was largely represented in Minigazang, which is full of poetic allusions to the heavenly virtues that lead to salvation, and to the deadly sins that pave the road to perdition. Minigazang was more personal and direct than the Volkslied, which tends to socialise or generalise an individual experience until it applies and appeals to all. A product of the castles, Minigazang was frequently a matter of ambition, encouraged by the hope of finding favour with a princely patron or winning the love of a high-born lady. The Volkslied, a product of the people, made no such appeal and was its own reward. The tournaments of song were therefore limited to the Minnesinger and represented a counterpart of those other contests which in the period of chivalry brought out physical prowess and skill. There is an element of partisan controversy in the writings of even recent historians concerning the respective merits of the troubadours and Minnesinger, some maintaining the superiority and originality of the latter, while others like Combarieux call them simply imitators of the troubadours. The fact that they appeared somewhat later is not sufficient evidence for such a statement, however, and may be explained by the fact that in Germany, chivalry flourished later. The German knights, it will be remembered, did not participate in the First Crusade. Doubtless the same influences making for exalted expression were at work in both countries, and the early epics of which we have spoken were in a sense the common property of both. Moreover, the epic poems of the Celtic people, the Breton, Lies, etc., preceded the Provençal lyrics and probably reached Germany by direct road. A fundamental difference between the two schools, which strongly argues a separate origin, is the fact that, in form, Minigazang approached the heavier epic style of the northern bards, rather than the lighter lyric vein of the southern singers. Inasmuch as German poetry contained a great variety of verse forms with a varying number of syllables, Minigazang developed a great variety of rhythms. Unlike Romance lyricism, 
German composition never forsook the principle of accentuation for the sake of mere syllabic proportion, enumeration. In other words, the Germans considered only the accented syllables, subordinating the unaccented so that they might be either eliminated or increased in number without disturbing the rhythmic contour, which means a very different relation between text and melody. Melody corresponding with verbal accent makes for correct emphasis and a natural and logical declamation. The stereotyped contour of the troubadour songs, which their composers sought to overcome by excessive melodic ornament, is not found to the same extent in Minigazan, where the change of hypermeters and catalectics provides in itself a considerable variety of rhythm, even where the same melody is retained for a succession of stanzas. This sort of adaptation must have required considerable skill in execution. It has, moreover, given no end of trouble to modern transcribers in the determination of phrase limits. In the example here given, we follow the interpretation of Riemann. It is an excerpt from the Jena manuscript, being the only example dating from the 12th century. Its author is Old Sperwogel, and its serious contemplative character will illustrate the difference between the works of Troubadours and Minnesinger. We give only the first line of the melody in four of the thirteen forms which it assumes over the various texts of succeeding verses. Melody 1 <laughs> Melody 2 Melody 3 Melody 4 A form especially cultivated by the Minnesinger was the Obad, or Tagelied, which originated with the Provencal troubadours. In its German form it usually represents a lover, lingering near his beloved, whom the watchman's trumpet call announcing the dawn's approach speeds on his homeward way. In the earliest known Targa lead by Diet von Eist, 1180, the song of a bird is heard instead of the watchman's call, but in later examples the horn call assumes greater prominence and is even represented by a melody without text at the beginning or in the middle of a verse. In one by Vislav, such a sequence of apparently superfluous notes at the end of the first verse puzzled transcribers until recently, when its significance was discovered. In subsequent verses of this example, words are supplied for the notes of the call. This example sung to the following text. List du in der Minne dro, ich seh den lechten Morgen froh, de Vorgeln singen den Tag, Herr ist ho. The instrumental portions may perhaps have been hummed in imitation of the horn, but the principle is the same. Still later we find examples such as Nachthorn and Taghorn of the monk of Salzburg, which are marked Auch gut zu blasen, translation also good for blowing, 
One of the early names of Minnesingers is that of Tannhauser, or Tannhäuser, who was born between 1210 and 1220. To him is credited a Buslied, Song of Penitence, but it was probably in existence long before, customary among penitents, and only later ascribed to him. The participation of Tannhäuser in the song tournament of the Wartburg, as represented in the Wagner opera, is obviously a dramatic license of the composer, as the event took place before his birth in 1208. One of the most striking figures is Nithart von Rieventhal, who endeavoured to infuse new life into the courtly formalism of Minnegesang by drawing upon the folk song and folk dance. He called the new genre which he created, and which was a mild parody upon the peasant tunes then popular in rural Austria and Bavaria, Dörperlicher Singen, village singing, in contrast to the Herfischer Singen, courtly singing of his class. His dance songs differ from other Minnesinger's lyrics in their syllabic structure, as of necessity their pronounced rhythm did not admit superfluous syllables. The melodic correspondence between rhyming verses already noted in Troubadour Chansons is a prominent feature with Nithart. But more remarkable than this is the fine imitation of melodic elements corresponding to short rhyming lines within simple verses, Stollen or Abgesang. This example sung to the following lyrics. Wis willkommen meinen Schin, wer möcht uns ergesen din? Wann du kannst verschwenden pin, das sagt uns dies Judith. Der Winde ist so lang hier gelegen, auf dem Welt und in den Wegen. Willeklich gab er den Segen, da er von hinnen schied. Nu will du die Heide aber ehren, und will kleinen Vogelen die Suse Stimme lehren, dass sie bald in dem Wald es Susen sank gemähen. Wislav von Rügen, another Minnesinger, who tried to leave the beaten path, showed a marked tendency toward a more direct and faithful reflection of the emotional contents of his song. His Senende Klage, longing complaint, in which he emulates what he refers to as the Senende Wiese, melody, of the untutored man, is an evidence of the attempt of Minnesinger at characterization, and we frequently meet with such specific names of Turner or Weisen which indicate the intention to convey an individual sentiment in melody. The apparent sameness in many of the tunes seems less insistent when we consider the question of tempo, which must have differentiated their performance, but which was never indicated in the manuscripts. Hermann der Damen and Heinrich von Meissen, surnamed Frauenlob for his songs in praise of women, were famous for their Leiche, allegorical sacred songs on the order of the sequences, with melodies strictly adapted to a text, consisting of irregular stanzas with little repetition. Of the songs of the two greatest Minnesinger, Wolfram von Eschenbach and Walter von der Vogelweide, only the poems exist. The melodies passing for theirs are of doubtful origin. The greatest patrons of Minnegesang among the sovereigns of Germany 
with the Emperor Frederick I, Barbarossa, who died in 1190, Conradin, the last of the Hohenstaufen, who died 1268, and Wenceslaus of Bohemia, a contemporary of Conradin. Minigazang was not to the same extent as troubadour poetry a courtly art, yet the castles of these sovereigns naturally became centres of development, as did also the courts of the Austrian dukes, when Heinrich von Melk, der Kürenberger, Dietmar von Eist, and Niethart held forth. The courts of the margraves of Bavaria and Swabia, where we find the margrave of Rietenberg, Meinlo von Schwenningen, Speervogel, and Reinmar von Zweter, and finally the castle of the landgrave of Thuringia, which boasted of such bright ornaments as Tannhäuser, Heinrich von Weldecker, Walter von der Vogelweide, and Wolfram von Eschenbach, of whom the last two have attained the rank of national poets. The formal, stately character of Minnesong prevented its becoming as popular as the troubadour song in France. Another reason for this is the fact that the more pronounced caste feeling of the Germans forbade them to enlist the assistance of musicians of inferior station. Whatever accompaniment there may have been was provided by the poet-singers themselves. With the decline of feudalism and chivalry, and the development of the industries, the middle class acquired a social prominence which roused dormant ambitions and developed latent abilities. The craftsmen had formed societies with strictly graded membership, a most elaborate set of statutes, and rigid ceremonial of initiation. They were as much a social as an intellectual manifestation, being developed to mutual improvement and recreation, and music entered largely into their programme. Association with minnesingers who were not of noble rank, and who, instead of bearing the title Ritter, knight, were called Meister, masters, gradually awakened the desire of the good burghers to emulate the example of the aristocracy and cultivate song in the manner of Minnegazang. The story that Emperor Otto I was founder of Meistergesang, master song, and gave to twelve masters, among them Heinrich Frauenlaub, Bartel Regenbogen, and Klingsor, something like a charter, has long been proved a myth, since the emperor and these personages were not even contemporaries. But the fact that Frauenlaub, who was one of the last Minnesingers, is claimed as one of the founders of Meistergesang, shows how closely the latter followed upon the former. There is little doubt, however, that the master song was first cultivated in a Meistersingschule, school of master song, in Mayens, whence it spread to other cities, foremost among them Nuremberg, Augsburg, Regensburg, Ulm, and Munich. The Meistersingschulen recruited their members from the singing schools of the artisan guilds, Candidates were subjected to a rigorous examination, and had to account not only for their previous life, their family connections, moral standing, and religious convictions, but had to pledge themselves to hold the ideal of their art, to live a pure and worthy life, and to be loyal and helpful to the fellow members of the school. There were school friends, scholars, poets, and singers. Above them in rank were four merka, markers or judges one of whom had to compare the text of the song with the scriptural passage upon which it was founded, while the second judged the syllabic accent, the third the rhyme, and the fourth the tune. The highest grade was that of Meister, a title conferred upon him who was capable of fixing the standard of both text and music. Prize contests were a feature of the public performances and carried on the tradition of the song tournament of chivalry. The meetings were held in church. The prize consisted of a string of ornamental coins, a bunch of artificial flowers, or the permission at the end of the meeting to stand at the church door and receive from the parting audience a fee in current coin. The spirit of medieval artisan life and of scholastic formalism was paramount in the organisation and all its activities. It is admirably reflected in Richard Wagner's Meistersinger von Nuremberg, where, embodied in the figure of Beckmesser, the Merker becomes the type of the pedant who rates the letter higher than the spirit. As religion was foremost in men's minds at that period, 
Meistergesang dealt at first mainly with religious topics and turned out prosy biblical paraphrases with numerous historical and allegorical allusions. The versification followed closely the models of the Minnegesang, the structure of the master's strophes being almost identical with that of their aristocratic compatriots. Even the terms weiser and ton used by the later Minnesingers to denote meter and melody were adopted by the master singers. The song itself was in the form of a so-called bar. Its parts were gesetze. Each gesatz consisted of two stollen, strophe and antistrophe, sung to the same melody. Then followed a stollen in the tune of the last gesatz. The rules governing the composition of these songs were called tabulateur. The verse form, or ton, was given special names, such as the lange ton or graue ton, or suggesting the contents were called bierweiss, brunnenweiss, blutton, lindenschmidtton, or named after the authors as regenbogenton, schillerton, etc. Frauenlob was held in such esteem by the greatest of the master singers that Hans Sachs himself wrote some twenty-five songs or more in the Frauenlob Torn. Although the structure of these songs was hidebound in formal restrictions, the spirit reflected a sturdy sincerity which was in keeping with the racial temperament of the singers and not without charm. Few manuscripts of the Meister singers contain the music of the songs, and their notation is not always reliable. They employed neumes like the Minnesingers before them, but they limited themselves almost exclusively to semibreves, reserving the minims only for ornamental figures. These figures, called blumen, flowers or fiorituri, when inserted as an interlude or at the final cadence, made a pleasing effect, in contrast to the even movement of the melody, which, without any perceptible rhythmic division, was likely to be monotonous. Footnote. The bloomer was sometimes applied to the first syllable of a song when it was probably intended to prepare the mood, but produced a rather ludicrous effect. Even Hans Sachs begins his song Dre Frumme König Jude with a bloomer of ten notes, all on the word Dre. End of footnote. Recent musical authorities, among them Riemann, incline to the opinion that the master singer's melodies were far better than the reputation they enjoy. While some writers claim that they accompany their songs on the harp, the violin, lute, or zither, others make no mention whatever of instrumental accompaniment, and Genet, in his book on Hans Sachs and his time, distinctly states that they were sung without accompaniment. Among the most famous Meistersingers were Heinrich Frauenlaub, mentioned above, Hans Foltz, Hans Rosenplut, Konrad Nachtigall, Konrad Mörner, Michel Beheim, Jörg Schiller, Bartel Regenbogen, Heinrich von Üglin, and Muscatblut. But far above his colleagues towers Hans Sachs, the shoemaker poet of Nuremberg. His achievements as poet, dramatist, and musician are in even in quality. His farces assure him of a more prominent place in German literature than the rank accorded to him in musical history for his setting of the psalms. But taken as a whole, his personality typifies what was best in the art of his class at that period. An art practiced under conditions which did not favour the free and bold flight of creative genius. It was Hans Sachs who first of all the master singers openly espoused the cause of the new church by greeting the appearance of Luther in his famous song, Die Wittenbergische Nachtigall. In his naive, sincere devotion to the new creed, he undertook also to revise some of the older master songs to make them conform to the new spirit, and his contributions to Protestant church music were highly esteemed by his contemporaries. Individual impulse, both emotional and musical, being curbed by rigid rules, Meistergesang was a less direct expression of personality than Minnegesang, and a less frank reflection of sentiment than the Volkslied. Lacking spontaneity and wider human appeal, it fostered a spirit of severe formalism, which could not have much influence upon the development of music in general. 
On the other hand, this formalistic severity imparted a technical and spiritual discipline which was not to be undervalued, and the stress laid upon a serious and dignified attitude toward the art of music may have done no little toward counterbalancing the frivolous tendencies which sprang up here and there during the religious, social and political unrest of the 15th and 16th centuries. Nor was the relation between Meistergesang and the Reformation without influence upon the development of Protestant church music. For in the slow and measured movement of the songs, dealing with sacred themes and sung unisono by the members of the Singschule at the opening of their meetings, one can recognize an essential feature of the Protestant chorale. Thus we may conclude with the statement that the real value to posterity of the art movements we have discussed lies in their influence upon the two great social movements that signalize the dawn of the modern era, namely the Renaissance in Italy and the Reformation in Germany, both of which are again reflected in the music of a later day. The new spirit is echoed in the sublime words of Hans Sachs. Awake, draws nigh the break of day, I hear upon the hawthorn spray a bonny little nightingale. Her song resounds through hill and dale, The night descends the western sky, And from the east the dawn draws nigh. With red ardour the flush of day Breaks through the cloud-banks dull and grey. From the English translation of Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg by Frederick Corder. End of section 16「Section 17 of The Art of Music, Volume 1, The Pre-Classic Periods. Editor-in-Chief, Daniel Gregory Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Militia. The Rise of the Netherlands Schools We have already discussed the origins of polyphony and the condition of secular popular music in the dim periods of the Middle Ages. We shall confine ourselves in this chapter, for the most part, to the development of polyphony, the art of music within the church, not because it was only within the church that polyphony was perfected, but because the art can be most easily and consistently traced in church music. None of the great composers whose importance we shall discuss restricted himself only to religious music, but all gave the greater part of their energy thereto and most of the available knowledge of music from 1300 to 1600 is related to the church. It must not be forgotten, on the other hand, that secular music exerted a vigorous influence upon ecclesiastical music, an influence constantly combated by the church authorities, yet constantly triumphant. The two styles acted and reacted upon each other in a manner which may be observed at various periods of musical history. The study of the development of music from 1300 to 1600 is largely the study of the art or science of polyphony. Polyphony, or counterpoint, is primarily the art of combining two or more voice parts so that they shall maintain their independent character and individual interest and still harmonise with each other. Early musical notes were written as dots, or points, one voice under or against another, whereby the term contra punctum, meaning simply note against note, originated. As has been previously explained, the first, or more important, melody, called subject, theme, or cantus firmus, was generally placed in the tenor, so called from tenere, to hold, on account of its holding the melody, and the addition of one or more melodies to the cantus firmus, or theme, under strict rules and regulations, is the art of counterpoint. One of the most important devices for enhancing interest in the principal melody is known as imitation, that is, the repetition of a theme or phrase, or parts thereof, either at a different pitch from the original, or in a different voice part, with or without rhythmic or other modifications, which, however, must not be so great as to destroy the resemblance. Combining, as it does, variety with unity of impression, and offering the composer opportunity for the display of great ingenuity, the art of imitation grew rapidly in importance, and became one of the chief and most characteristic beauties of polyphonic writing. To trace the growth of that style of writing, which has been called the Netherlands style, is our present purpose. 
Previously, we traced the beginnings of polyphony in the stiff organum, and the growth of the so-called menstrual system by which all music was reduced to triple rhythm and bound by mathematical laws, indifferent to beauty, relentlessly rigid and monotonous. During this period, the musical centre of Europe was Paris, where the organists of Notre Dame were the most influential composers. Here, the reaction against the system found voice in theoretical discussion, though this again was probably only the reflection of what had been going on in actual practice, both in France and elsewhere. Indeed, it is claimed by some writers, notably Riemann, that certain composers of Florence, under the direct influence of troubadour song, were the first to throw off the fetters of musical dogma. England, too, has a serious claim for priority in the new movement, which was influenced everywhere by the spontaneous fluorescence of secular song. But the name Ars Nova, by which the reform was designated by its protagonists, in contradistinction to the Ars Antiqua of their Franconian predecessors, has led historians to connect it with the probable author of the treatise entitled The Ars Nova. Philippe de Vitry, Bishop of Meaux, 1290-1361, is said to be the author of this treatise, as well as of several others dealing with measured music, proportions, and the relative value of the symbols of notation. In it he advocates counterpoint for several voices, rhythmic variety of a free use of chromatic alterations. None of his own compositions has been preserved to us, however. Another writer, known by the name of Jean de Maury, left several works of similarly radical character. He is not to be confused, however, with a theorist of the same name designated as the Norman, who taught at the Sorbonne from 1321 on and whose teaching was so conservative as really to constitute a reaction against the new method, the Ars Nova. This effort toward freedom was characterised first by the reintroduction of duple time into church music, in which triple time, on account of its symbolistic connection with the Trinity, had long held the field. Secondly, by the emancipation of individual voices by means of a greater variety of rhythm. Thirdly, by the prohibition of parallel octaves and fifths, and lastly, by the differentiation between half and full cadences, which in homophonic music, in plain chant and in secular song, had long been recognised. The introduction of the natural duple rhythm into music written for the church demanded the addition of new signs to the menstrual system of notation, for it was necessary that singers should be informed whether they were to sing according to the triple or double scheme, Thus there appear, about this period, new time signs. Of these, a semibrieve, still called, by the way, tempus perfectum, circle, signified the division of the brieve into three or perfect time. A half circle signified the division of the brieve into two semibrieves, and this was imperfect time. A dot within the circle, or the half circle, indicated that the semibrieve was to be divided into three minims, but without the dot, the semibrieve equaled only two minims. The three-part division of the semibrieve constituted major prolation, the two-part minor prolation. Perfect or imperfect time was sung twice as fast if the time sign was cut by a line. The second of these cut signs, that of a line through a half circle, still survives in the modern sign, signifying a la brave time. It appears likely that de Vitry himself was the first to think of using coloured notes to signify still another genus of rhythmical subdivision, called proportio hemiolia, and that he was the first to use the term contrapunctus, or counterpoint, instead of descant. Through lack of actual examples of the period, we are unable to tell how thoroughly and readily church composers adopted the methods of the Ars Nova, but eventually their advocacy was of momentous importance. It is true that secular music was the first to benefit by the advance, for it preserved naturally all the elements which the new law proposed to regulate. Hence the first form, that which constitutes the first ground of interaction, the transition to the polyphonic form of church music, was the popular chanson, an elementary form of song, evidently developed from the canson and the ballad of the troubadours, etc., which, as we know, were composed for a solo voice with an improvised instrumental accompaniment. According to Riemann, 
This development of the chanson first went forward in Italy, in connection with the movement known as the Florentine Ars Nova, a detailed account of which we have chosen to reserve for our next chapter. The Italian Ars Nova, which is held by modern historians to have influenced the French Ars Nova in various ways, and to have transmitted to it a style of composition in which the upper voice was freely invented and harmonically interpreted, though in a rude manner, by the accompanying voice or voices, a style which by 1400 was fully developed. These chansons were, it should be noted, like their prototype, chiefly for one solo voice with instrumental accompaniment, and varied by instrumental preludes, interludes, and postludes. Purely vocal polyphony in chansons was rare before 1500, though examples of an elementary kind of part songs have also been preserved, and as the polyphonic style advanced, these eventually superseded the instrumentally accompanied solo, monodic song. Meantime, however, the church had fallen heir to these primarily secular inspirations, and developed under the rules of the Ars Nova a freer, contrapuntal style, whose chief vehicles were the mass and the motet, forms whose general characteristics have been explained in previous chapters. Characteristic of this new polyphony is the so-called imitative style, whose real origin has never been discovered, and which is the distinguishing feature of the schools about to be discussed. The first indications of this imitative, or Netherland style, are found in the works of Gerano Lescarel and Guillaume de Marchot, died circa 1372. Marchot is the composer of the first known four-part mass, which was performed at the coronation of Charles V in 1360. It must be admitted that this is not a very good specimen, even of early polyphony. The parallel octaves and fifths, already prohibited by musical authorities, had no terrors for Marchot, and his discords amount to nothing less than cacophony. It is a historical landmark, however, and serves as a starting point from which to trace the development of contrapuntal methods. In justice to Marchot, it should perhaps be said that he was a much better poet than composer, and his verses deserve a higher rank than his music, which includes, besides the mass, two- and three-part chansons rondeaux and motets. For some years longer, Paris continued to be, as it had been for more than 200 years, the musical centre of Europe. The prestige it had held so long was lost ultimately, not only through an actual decline of original power, but through an abuse of the power they possessed. The standards of the old organ masters of Notre Dame, if somewhat dry, were at least scholarly, but we begin to see in the early 14th century a deterioration and a tendency among singers to make a display of their ability in improvisation. Canons and rounds of that time, and even long after, were written in a kind of shorthand, understood presumably by every trained singer, but nevertheless giving some freedom of judgment to the performer, which was easily abused. The first phrase of the Cantus Firmus was usually written out. After this, a few signs in Latin, meaning nothing to the modern musician, unskilled in the mysteries of this art, would indicate the time of entrance and relative pitch for the other voices. Imitation was almost continuously in use. The accidentals of modern notation were but rarely indicated, even as late as the time of Palestrina, and the key signature of the present day was unknown. However, the training of the chapel singers was such as to give a thorough knowledge of the use of accidentals and of the musical symbols of the time. Intricate rules for their guidance were laid down, but carried away by the flood of new ideas and unrestrained by scholarly fastidiousness, many of them indulged in liberties which loaded down the pure melody of the venerable plain chant with inappropriate ornamentations and often rendered it hopelessly unrecognisable. In protest against these unwarranted melismas and tasteless innovations of singers, especially of the cathedral choirs and of the papal chapel, the famous bull of 1322 was issued by Pope John XXII. It was not a protest primarily either against the popular full bardon, which was generally in use until after the return of the papacy to Rome, 1377, or the contrapuntal school per se. 
it was certainly not against the methods of the Ars Nova, as is proved by the use of certain technical terms peculiar to the Ars Antiqua. It is against the abuses of the latter school, the obscuring of the plain song melodies and the violation of the spirit of church music by frivolous rhythmic variations, ornamentation and juggling with counter melodies, often of profane character. Many other protests of a like nature came from the papal chair during the next 250 years, and we shall have occasion to see in a later chapter the result of the struggle between religious decorum on the one hand and on the other the vagaries of the artistic mind in the throes of development. Yet it must be granted that the masters of the old French school deserve no small credit for their scientific and practical labours. During the time of their ascendancy, the resources of notation were increased, double counterpoint was cultivated, a greater freedom in metre and rhythm was introduced, the several voices became more nearly independent, and an extraordinary degree of attention was paid to the problems involved in mensuration. They failed, however, in reaching a point at which true artistic composition, in the larger sense, begins. Of symmetrical arrangement based upon the lines of a preconceived design, they had no idea. Their highest aspirations extended no farther than the enrichment of a given melody with such harmonies as they were able to improvise at a moment's notice whereas composition, properly so called, depends for its existence upon the invention, or at least upon the selection, of a definite musical idea, which the genius of the composer presents, now in one form and now in another, until the exhaustive discussion of its various aspects produces a work of art, as consistent in its integrity as the conduct of a scholastic thesis or a dramatic poem. It was this very quality of design which distinguished the work of the Flemish composers, who, about the middle of the 14th century, gained the dominating position among European musicians. With the decline of the old French school, the musical leadership of Europe passed into the hands of the early Netherlanders, called by some historians the Gallo-Belgian school, which flourished, roughly, from the middle of the 14th to the middle of the 15th century. It will be remembered that the 14th century was an epoch of great prosperity in the Netherlands. The ancient nobility had lost power, while the towns, with their astute and far-seeing traders, had acquired extraordinary strength. Earlier, many serfs had been enfranchised, and thus a large body of sturdy workers was liberated into the independent trades, and soon became wealthier and more powerful than the nobles. The trade guilds and burghers were uncompromising in resisting the encroachments both of the feudal lords and of the church, and were therefore enabled to turn their energies toward commerce and agriculture, unchecked by the influences of a corrupt government. Great factories flourished. Vessels of Dutch merchants plied their trade in nearly every sea. Population, wealth and intelligence increased. The ancient towns... Bruges, Louvain, Antwerp, Ghent, Ypres, still bear testimony to these days of prosperity in their magnificent examples, not of ecclesiastical architecture as in Italy, but of splendid structures for municipal and domestic use. It was among these prosperous and music-loving people that the art of contrapuntal writing was nourished. They did not invent or create polyphony, as has long been believed, but they found pleasure in the fact that the principles of music could be reduced to laws and rules, and the more intricate the rules, the more the true Netherlanders delighted in them. In fact, it was this very tendency that smothered polyphony itself in course of time, but not before a vast amount of systematised knowledge had been preserved for their successors. The service of the Pope's chapel up to the time of its return to Rome from Avignon in 1377 was sung in full bourdon, or in the still older method of extemporaneous descant. Ecclesiastical records show that after the return to Rome, several Belgian musicians were among the singers in the papal choir. These brought with them, along with other music, the first masses written in counterpoint that had ever been seen there. Among the Belgians in Rome, in the early 15th century, was a tenor singer named William Dufay, born probably in Chimay in Hainaut, about 1400. 
there has been much misapprehension concerning Dufay, owing to the fact that Baini, an Italian historian, 1775 to 1844, gave erroneously the probable date of his death as 1432. Recent researches, however, especially those of Sir John Stainer, have thrown much light on the life and work of Dufay, and enabled historians to understand facts which hitherto had seemed irreconcilable. According to this recent authority, Dufay received his musical education as chorister in the cathedral at Cambrai, which in the 15th century belonged to the Netherlands. It is famous as the seat of the archbishopric of Fenelon and of Dubois, and for its ancient cathedral. According to contemporary evidence, the music of the Cambrai Cathedral was considered the most beautiful in Europe. It was but natural then that the papal choir at Rome should draw what singers it could from Cambrai. It appears that Dufay entered it as the youngest member in 1428 and remained five years. After a break, he was again appointed in the following decade, when he remained but a short period. It was at the time a frequent custom for the church to reward whom it would by ecclesiastical appointments, allowing the holder of office to reside elsewhere. According to this custom, Dufay was appointed to the canonries of Cambrai and Mons, both of which offices he held till his death, though he removed to Savoy about 1437 and travelled somewhat in the interests of his art. He died at a great age in 1474. His will is still preserved in the archives of Cambrai, and in it, among other items, he bequeaths money to the Cambrai altar boys. He is buried in the chapel of St. Etienne, beneath the stone he himself caused to be made, which, though mutilated, is still in existence. One of his last desires was that a certain motet of his own composition be sung at his deathbed. The chief source of our knowledge of Dufay's early works is the Manuscript Canonici Miscellaneous 213 in the Bodleian Library at Oxford, compiled not later than 1436, a portion of which has recently been explained and given to the public by Sir John Stainer. The manuscript represents the period of transition from Machaut to Dufay, including the early works of the latter. They are mostly in the old mensural, black notation and show an unusual proportion of secular pieces. Transcriptions and solutions of 60 of them, belonging to the period 1400 to 1441, are given by Stainer. Most of the pieces are dry in melody and show occasional harsh discords, but they also exhibit examples of fugal form and some crude attempts at expression. They are quite lacking in a certain sweetness of harmony characteristic of his later works, which has been traced to the influence of his famous English contemporary, John Dunstable. It appears advisable, therefore, to consider here the condition of music in England, which is thus to make itself felt upon the course of music in general. Though the 12th and 13th centuries do not, in England, show well-defined groups of musicians working toward a common end, such as constitute a school in the accepted sense. There can be no doubt that the English were ahead of their time in the early days of polyphony, and that English music strongly influenced composers on the continent. Indeed, a very considerable case for the actual origin of polyphony in England has been made out by recent historians of great authority, and the case is supported by the famous old English canon, Summer is Ecumen in one of the earliest extant examples of polyphonic music. The date of this interesting composition is given by Rockstro as not later than 1250. It is a charming melody composed to a gay, naive poem in the form of a round, or canon, for six voices, and is supposed to have been written by John Fawnset, a monk of Reading. In some measures, the parallel fifths and octaves show the influence of diaphony, while in others there is excellent counterpoint, which might have been written at least 150 years later. The imitation is not confined to short phrases, but is consistently carried through the four upper voices to the close, over two independent bases. The harmony is rather limited, the F major chord being in great preponderance, but on the whole the canon shows a high degree of skill in polyphonic writing. 
It is, in short, a remarkable example of the working out of an inspired folk song with two systems of part writing, which, so far as we know, were not contemporaneous. One explanation of this apparent anomaly is that the composition, originally the work of a songwriter of great natural genius, was later edited or corrected by a learned musician. Parallel octaves and fifths were not considered offensive in the 13th century, and such a learned scholar might easily have let them pass, while lifting other parts of the music to an artistic form considerably in advance of popular taste. It has been supposed, on the other hand, that the composition is really the single, accidentally preserved specimen of a whole musical literature, which has otherwise been lost. In support of this latter theory, it is urged that the art of imitation, as illustrated in the canon, must have reached a point of excellence beyond anything existing in France or Belgium at the time, and could only have been the product of a well-defined school. However the case may be, the song remains an isolated, but for its time brilliant, example testifying to the freshness, vitality and beauty of early English music. It should be added that, under the auspices of the Plain Song and Medieval Music Society of England, researches have been carried on, resulting in the publication of two volumes, the first containing photographic reproductions of 60 of the most notable examples of English harmonised music prior to the 15th century, the second transcriptions thereof into modern musical notation, with explanatory notes. The majority of the examples are written for two voices, and some for three. None of these, however, can compare, in regard to workmanship, with the Summer canon, which is also included in the collection. Not until the beginning of the 15th century do we find actual evidence of a school, and it is interesting to note the points of resemblance between it and the first Netherlands school. Both are characterised by a reliance on the plain chant melody, by a conventional opening, a lack of sensitiveness to discords, an avoidance of the third in the closing chord, and an absence of harmonic effects. Compared with the old French school, however, they show a genuine progress in the abolition of the harsher discords, the use of the third in cadences not final, and in the more frequent employment of imitation. Representatives of the early English school, it is important to note, were divided into two distinct branches, one remaining for the most part on English soil, while the other identified itself almost wholly with continental schools, and in respect to style, seems to belong to them. In this latter group was John Dunstable, born about 1390, in Dunstable, England. He died in 1453, and is buried in St. Stephen's, Walbrook, where an epitaph was said to be inscribed on two fair plated stones in the chancel each by other. Another, written by the abbot of St. Albans, is headed Upon John Dunstable, an astrologian, a mathematician, a musician, and what not, and the six lines of elegiac Latin which follow bestow upon him heartfelt praise. Dunstable was a writer of songs, both sacred and secular. One of the latter, O Rosa Bella, was discovered in the Vatican in 1847, and is one of the most beautiful specimens of the age. Of the two compositions in the possession of the British Museum, one is a sort of musical enigma, a form of composition quite in vogue among the later Netherlanders. The other is a work in three parts of some length, without words, and is found in a splendid volume of manuscript music formerly belonging to Henry VIII. Four sacred compositions, two songs, and two motets are in the archives of the Liceo Filarmonico of Bologna. Even with these few examples of his work, Dunstable's reputation as a great musician seems to rest on solid ground. More than half a dozen interesting references to him are made in contemporaneous European writings, among them being one by Tinctoris, a Belgian theorist and composer, 1445-1511, and another by a French verse writer who compares Dufay, Binchois, and Dunstable as songwriters to the advantage of the Englishman. The passage from Tinctoris refers to England as the Fons et Origo of Counterpoint, and cites Dunstable as her chief composer. 
absurd mistakes have crept into the commentaries upon Dunstable. One early writer, Sibald Hayden, 1540, claimed that he was the inventor of counterpoint, and another identified him with St. Dunstan. These and other errors were handed down by subsequent writers until Ambrose, in his Musikgeschichte, set most of them right. Of course, counterpoint was not, and in the nature of things could not be, the invention of any one man. It was built up gradually, one school contributing a little here, another there, until a comprehensive system was formed. In England, Dunstable's name was either little known, or else it was soon forgotten, for it fails to appear in an important work, Scriptores Britanniae, published in 1550, scarcely a century after his death. From the fact that all but two of his extant compositions are in continental libraries, and that his reputation, during his lifetime, was evidently far greater in Europe than in England, it is supposed that most of his life was spent abroad. Since none of Dunstable's compositions appear in the Manuscript Canonici, it is evident that his fame was not established in Europe when the collection was made, not later than 1436. Contemporary references to him, however, begin to appear about that time, or shortly after, and it is a remarkable fact that the compositions of Dufay, which are known to have been written after this date, show a marked advance both in contrapuntal skill and in style over those contained in the manuscript canonici. In face of the fact that Dunstable was not only an older contemporary of Dufay and Binchois, but that he was also an excellent master of counterpoint and style, it is therefore not unreasonable to assume that he was one of the important sources upon which these Gallo-Belgians drew for their instruction and inspiration. Like the Netherland composers, Dunstable shows a lack of variety and a failure to adapt his music to the sentiments of the words, but he far surpasses them in sweetness and beauty. His works are among the earliest to exhibit a design founded upon resources other than the plain chant melodies of the church. He was capable of writing learned musical puzzles, thus foreshadowing the frequent practice of the Netherlanders of the next century. But he also wrote in lighter vein, with charm and purity, and definitely renounced the harsh discords employed by Machaut and others. It is with good reason, therefore, that scholars have predicated from these facts the influence of Dunstable upon the early Netherlanders, even though in his native land we find no trace of his teachings until they were imported later from the Low Countries. Through Dunstable, therefore, we are led back to De Fay and his contemporaries, and the real significance of this first Netherlands school. The writers belonging to it were for centuries buried under the fame of the later Flemish composers, Ockergum and his pupils. As will be seen, however, Dufay is to be reckoned not only as an important pioneer in the strikingly brilliant achievements of the Netherlanders, but also as the actual founder of a school. Learned and well-versed in the musical science of his day, he possessed furthermore that indefinable touch of genius which enables a man to build a little higher than his forerunners, and leave art enriched by his labours. A large number of his compositions have been recovered, among them being 59 secular songs, 36 sacred songs, 8 whole masses, and about 20 sections or movements of masses. 150 compositions were discovered by Habel alone, hidden in the archives of Bologna, Rome, and Trieste. Masses and portions of masses are in the Brussels Library, others at Cambrai, still others in the Paris Library, and in Munich, a motet for three voices. The oldest datable work is a chanson, Resveilli vous êtes fait chier lit, written in honour of the marriage of Charles Malatesta, Lord of Pesaro, and Vittoria Colonna, in 1415. Dufay was one of the first composers to use the unfilled white notes, and it is believed that he introduced other changes in notation. He deserves great credit for discarding, in his later works, the empty fourths and fifths, as well as the parallel fifths, which still disfigured the music of some of the ablest composers of the early 15th century. We find, furthermore, in Dufay, a more developed, though not very extended, canonic treatment of voices, and again there is occasionally noticeable a strong tendency toward expression, 
as for example in the mass Ece Ancilla, which is even more interesting on account of its harmonic character. Moreover, after he settled at Cambrai in 1436, that is, after Dunstable's European fame was established, a new conception, similar to that found in the English composer's works, seems to animate his compositions. His dry methods change, the different voices become more melodious, the harsher discords disappear, and the use of canon grows more frequent. The feature of Dufay's epoch, however, which had a most far-reaching effect, and one which, incidentally, brought the wrath of 15th century critics upon his head, was the practice of using in the mass secular melodies in place of the Gregorian cantus firmus. For example, the folk songs, Ton jamais de Duy, Ce le face à pâle, and L'homme armé, were incorporated as subjects in a number of masses, which were named after the tunes. The absolute invention of new subjects was foreign to composers of that day, and such familiar tunes, repeated in the various parts of the mass, supplied a familiar nucleus, while the composer's ingenuity found ample play in weaving about it manifold figures and phrases. This was decidedly a new departure, and one that could not be agreeable to the church. But the new fashion was no sooner set than other composers eagerly took it up, Dufay's pupils adopted it and passed it on to the later Netherlanders, who in turn handed it down to the Romans. L'homme armé became such a favourite for the mass that the younger Gallo-Belgians, Fog and Caron, the Netherlanders Joscan and Lasso, and even the Roman Palestrina in his early work made use of it. In appropriating these secular melodies, usually only the beginning was employed and around this were woven contrapuntal devices. In this manner, the new melody acquired almost the importance of a theme. Imitation of one part by another, at a greater or less interval of time, is, at present, so inevitably a characteristic feature of every musical composition of a higher order, that it is difficult to imagine a time when it was far from being an obvious or necessary element. The invention of this art was for long attributed to Ockergum and his school though it is now apparent that it was not only practised fifty years earlier by Dufay, but that it was already used as early as 1250, as is seen in the now famous canon Summer is Ecumen In, which has been mentioned above. This epoch of the activity of the Gallo-Belgians resulted in the firm establishment of what might be called the Netherlands style. Technical ingenuity was exalted over beauty of sound. The use of martial tunes and love songs some of them accompanied by most indiscreet words, prevailed in the mass as long as the old polyphony lasted, and the art of canon, although as yet limited and crude, took its place among the indispensable adjuncts of all musical composition. Of the three composers of this period who are frequently mentioned together by the old writers, two have already been briefly discussed. The third, Giles Binchois, born about 1400, died in 1460, seven years after Dunstable, and fourteen years before Dufay. First a soldier, then a priest, Binchois became chaplain chantre to Duke Philip of Burgundy in 1452. Like Dufay, he was appointed non-resident canon of the cathedral at Mons. Twenty-eight of his compositions are in the manuscript canonici, of which all but one are secular. Six songs and two motets in the Munich Library have also been recently discovered and transcribed by Dr. Hugo Riemann. Among Binchois' extant works are also about a dozen sacred songs and six parts of masses. Like his contemporaries of the same school, Binchois was somewhat more interested in technical performance than in expression. Tinctoris mentions him with great praise as a composer whose fame would endure forever. It is evident also from the testimony of contemporary writers that both Dufay and Binchois were widely celebrated as masters and teachers of counterpoint. Another Gallo-Belgian, Eloy, born about 1400, produced a mass for five voices, a rarity for that time. This work, called Dixerunt Discipuli, is in the Vatican Library. Many of the pupils of Dufay and Binchois, among whom were Busnois, Caron, Fogue, 
Basiron, and Obrecht, became more or less celebrated in their time and constituted a kind of second generation or transitional school between the first, or Gallo-Belgian, and the later Netherland schools. Growing more familiar with the resources of the contrapuntal method, they improved upon the work of their masters, while adhering, in essentials, to their precepts. Dufay and Binchois, for instance, usually imitated the pattern either in unison or the octave. Their followers used also the canon in the fifth, and carried it out with more skill. They discovered the construction of chords, though they still had no idea of rational chord progressions. Boussnois especially was a more skilful harmonist than Dufay. His fame spread to Italy, and Petrucci included a number of his songs in one of the earliest publications about 1503. Among these pieces is a four-part chanson, Dieu quel mariage, which, according to Naumann, is remarkable not only for the refinement of its harmony, but also on account of its masterly treatment of the melody. This is placed partly in the tenor and partly in the alto, a novel feature for the time, with no disturbance of the free motion and canonic flow of the other two parts. Bousnois also had more skill in design than Dufay, actually employing the beginning of the melody as a theme and building upon it the whole canonic structure of the voices. The spirit of change was upon the art of music, as it had been in turn upon architecture, poetry and painting. Dry outlines were giving place to greater fullness of detail, to greater richness of colouring, harmony and expression. But even as music was the last of the arts to be affected by the renascent vitality of the late Middle Ages, so it was slow in travelling the torturous course of technical difficulties, which had to be conquered before true beauty of expression could be reached. Nevertheless, even at this time, music was a real art, possessing laws, modes of diction and even traditions. Though it revealed its youthfulness in its limitations and crudeness, it was by no means chaotic. The music of the mass already showed definite signs of form. There was a shadowy idea of key distribution, and efforts to arrive at a satisfactory method of modulation are evident on every hand. The compositions of the time begin to show a love of variety and contrast, together with extreme regularity in the matter of rhythm. During this time also, it is clear that in some forms of secular music, at least, instrumental accompaniments were used. Sometimes songs, and even motets, were played and not sung. Again, instruments were counted upon to assist the voices through difficult passages. The major seventh was not considered unvocal, but the compass of both instruments and voices was exceedingly limited. On every hand, efforts were made to break through the bonds of old tradition. In these and other matters, it is plain that our first Netherlander had left the troubadour Machot far behind. The next important advance in the art of polyphony is associated with the name of Johannes Ockergem, to whom the leadership in the art of music passed at the death of Dufay in 1474. Like many other musicians of the time, Ockergem was trained as a choir boy, being one of the 53 choristers in the cathedral at Antwerp just before the middle of the century. About 20 years later, we find him in Paris as royal chapel master, in great favour with King Louis XI. He travelled to Spain at the king's expense, and later, about 1484, revisited his native country, where he was received at Bruges with great ceremony. It is evident, therefore, that his fame was already well established during the lifetime of the older master, Dufay, to whose mantle he fell heir at about age of 45. It is thought that during the latter period of his life, he resided at Tours, where he died in 1495. It is most likely that he was a pupil of Binchois rather than of Dufay. The extant compositions of this master are 17 masses, 7 motets, 19 chansons, and a number of canons. One mass is in the possession of the papal chapel, and five of the chansons were published by Petrucci early in the 16th century, not long after Ockergum's death. The Missa Cuius Vistoni was used for many years in the cathedral at Munich, where the manuscript, with corrections made by the singers themselves, still exists. Another mass, Deo Gratia, has become one of the curiosities of musical history, 
from the fact that it was written for 36 parts with a ninefold canon. It may be said at once that Ockham's celebrity and his important place in the history of polyphony rest upon two things, his remarkable influence as a teacher and the fact that under him and his pupils the canonic style, in extremely ingenious combinations, reached the apogee of its development. Preceding composers had studied and written much about the proper manner of treating two or more melodies in combination, about intervals, progressions, dissonances, mensural problems, and the art of imitation, diminution, and inversion, and the like. Some of them had expended their genius in systematizing and classifying the complex rules for contrapuntal writing, and they delighted in setting themselves difficult tasks to be performed within these rigid rules. This was all very well. It resulted in the establishment of a perfected technique and a body of knowledge, the value of which was recognised by every musician with scholarly aims. Ockergum appeared on the scene, at a time when the struggle with technical difficulties seemed to be an end in itself, and his genius, of the mathematical sort, enabled him to master and play with them. It is a mistake to suppose that he devoted himself wholly, or even largely, to the composition of more riddle canons, as they are called, but it is probably a fact that he is most frequently remembered and characterised by them. A hint as to the nature of these curious compositions will be sufficient, perhaps, to mystify the uninitiated reader. The mass, ad omnem tonum, shows, instead of the clefs, question marks as signatures and it may be sung by using the corresponding accidentals in any church mode. The 36-part mass, with canon for nine parts already mentioned, is not a riddle, but has all the difficulties of one. In Ockergum's school is found the so-called crab canon, canon cancrisans, which is first sung through in the usual way from beginning to end, then repeated backward. There is also a canon which, like the canon cancrisans, is to be sung through twice, but from the beginning to the end both times. In the second singing, however, each progression of the original melody down is answered by a corresponding interval up, or vice versa. This is known as the inverted canon. One of Ockergum's followers, Horbrecht, furnishes us even with a canon which has both the retrograde and the inverted motion. In fact, canonic forms of all varieties and complications were treated by Ockergum and his school to the point of exhaustion. It must not be forgotten that the range given to a single voice was much more limited than at present. That these compositions must conform to the strictest rules, not only when sung in their normal manner, but when repeated in retrograde or inverted motion, and that the very essence of the work was the perfection attained in adhering to contrapuntal laws rather than the expression of individual feeling. Ockergum himself made these puzzles but rarely, and, as it were, in the manner of providing an intellectual treat for the educated musicians of his day, especially those who formed the church choirs. These difficult works were a test of their ability and thorough acquaintance with church modes. They afforded exercise in transposition from one mode to another, and offered the charm of variety which the special characteristics of each individual mode imparted. Furthermore, they tended to develop the highest artistry the vocalist was capable of, and were an illustration of the variety of combinations possible with the already existing parts. It has often been claimed that Ockergum was only a musical pundit, that his works are merely curiosities, depending for their interest on their mathematical ingenuity, and not on their artistic worth. But such a judgment does the master less than justice. Even from the point of view of later and more beautiful achievements, it must be acknowledged that at least some of his compositions have a certain artistic merit. Moreover, the service of Ockergum and his school was one of the necessary preliminaries to the full perfection of the art of polyphony. Technical difficulties were solved once for all, and a vast system of theoretical knowledge was prepared by their devoted labours for the use of the greater masters who should follow. So keen a critic and judge as R. G. Kiesewetter, 1841, says of Ockergum and his followers, They have greater facility in counterpoint and fertility in invention. Their compositions, moreover, 
being no longer mere premeditated submissions to contrapuntal operation, are for the most part indicative of thought and sketched with manifest design, being also full of ingenious contrivances of an obligato counterpoint, at that time just discovered. Besides, the work of Ockergum is interesting as illustrating a certain phase of character peculiar to the Middle Ages. There was at the time a love of secrecy and mystery, which led artists and expert craftsmen to embody the signs of their craft in a private and esoteric system, which no one but the initiated could understand. In accordance with this trend, the writing down of a canon of Ockergum, as has been pointed out, often took the form of a special musical design, consisting only of a few notes and a short Latin inscription. The reading of such a canon was not always easy, even to the initiated, but to the novice it had all the mystery of a Delphic oracle. It was not possible, of course, even for the most cultivated musician, upon hearing such a work performed, to recognise and follow all its complexities. Ockergum was the master who aroused and nourished the taste for these complex achievements in music, though he was by no means their inventor. Such devices, though to a less degree, were already known to Dufay and is shown in his canon L'Homme Armé. But Ockergum brought the art to the point of virtuosity, and it is for this reason he stands at the head of the Netherlands school. Judged by the standard of pure art, he is at his best as a composer of chansons. Even these, however, have long outlived their day, just as his contrapuntal riddles have long ceased to tease the intelligence or curiosity of lovers of music. It is by virtue of another quality, his gift for teaching, that Ockergum lives today. As the founder of the Netherlands school merely, his influence must also have ceased when the traditions of that school were superseded by the vital enthusiasm of another. But, as the teacher of the leaders of succeeding schools, he has achieved a kind of immortality, sometimes missed by greater artists. In the whole history of music, Ockergum as a teacher stands alone. Only Porpora, possibly, the great singing master of the 18th century, can be compared to him. Kiesewetter says, Through his pupils the art was transplanted into all countries, and he must be regarded, for it can be proved by genealogy, as the founder of all schools from his own to the present age. Only a few of his most distinguished pupils can be mentioned here. Jean de Roy, Bassiron, Jacques Barbero, Pierre de la Roue, Comper, Agricola, Caron, Verbonnet, Brumel, and, greatest of all, Josquin de Pré. Some of them, such as Agricola, unfortunately conceived the writing of contrapuntal intricacies to be their chief duty, while others use their acquired knowledge to better purposes. The Belgian, Hobrecht, 1450-1505, chapel master of Notre Dame at Antwerp, was probably not a personal pupil of Ockergum, though a zealous follower and admirer. While assimilating and adopting the master's ingenuity, he also was able to weave into his masses and motets a personal, subjective quality which marks them with the composer's individuality. So highly esteemed was Hobrecht in his day that in 1494 the whole choir of the principal church in Bruges, for which he had written a mass, travelled to Antwerp in order to express thanks and do him honour. During Ockergum's supremacy, a matter of forty years or so, some of the more interesting forms which had been cultivated in the time of Dufay disappeared. We look in vain for the medieval rondo, the ballad, the accompanied secular art song, and the paraphrased church song with instrumental accompaniment. The contribution of Ockergum and his followers was the development of technical resources and a greater freedom, both in range and style, in vocal composition. His unremitting, thoughtful search for fundamental rules established the art of polyphony on a firm basis and provided a safe starting point for the utterance of truth and passion. It is the fate, however, of work depending on a passing taste to grow old quickly, and Ockergum himself probably outlived his popularity. But his pupils spread over Europe and perpetuated his learning, and some of them, at least, enriched the art by a fresher genius. 
Unlike the old French and Gallo-Belgian masters who stayed at home, these writers overflowed into Italy and Germany, established schools of instruction and founded choruses for the production of vocal works. Among them, moreover, was one genius who exercised the strongest influence on the art of music and deserves to rank as one of its greatest masters. That genius was Josquin Desprez. Josquin Desprez is almost the last in the long list of Netherland composers and overtops them all, with the exception of La Sou. The year of his birth is uncertain, but has been placed at about 1450, since he was a singer in the papal chapel under Pope Sixtus IV, 1471 to 1484. He has been claimed as a countryman by Italian writers because his name was modified into Del Prato, by German because ethnologically and geographically the Low Countries are a part of Germany, by the French because the Netherlands became a political dependency of France about 200 years after Josquin's death, and naturally the Belgians claim some share in the fame of the man who represents the glory of Belgian music. The towns of Condé, Tours and Cambrai, the home of Dufay, and of others have all been candidates for the honour of his birth, but scholars are now agreed that he was born at least in the province of Ainau, which belonged during the middle and later 15th century to the dominions of Philip the Good of Burgundy. Josquin had been chapel singer at Milan before entering the papal choir in 1484, and afterward he is found in the service of Louis XII of France, with whom he was a great favourite. Like some of his predecessors, he received an appointment to a canonry, but seems not to have kept the office very long. In the year 1515, the Netherlands became German, and, according to Conrad Poitinger, Josquin left France for a position in the Netherland chapel of Maximilian I. It seems probable, therefore, that he spent the latter part of his life at Condé in his native country, where he died in 1521. Ockergum was still alive, and Dufay less than a score of years dead, when Josquin's fame sprang to the sky. So great a stir did his gifts create in Rome that beside him the fame of all other composers paled. The Duke Hercules d'Esti of Ferrara, for whom Josquin composed a mass entitled Hercules Dux Ferrariae, called him the Prince of Music, and the Abate Baini, director of the Pontifical Chapel in the early 19th century, says of him, In a short time, by his new productions, he becomes the idol of Europe. There is no longer tolerance for any one but Josquin. Josquin alone is sung in every chapel in Christendom. Nobody but Josquin in Italy, nobody but Josquin in France, nobody but Josquin in Germany, in Flanders, in Hungary, in Spain. Josquin and Josquin alone. Fables grew up about his name, as about that of Homer or Willem Tell. It is said that the French monarch under whom Josquin served had a bad voice and a still worse ear. Nevertheless, he was fond of music, and desired his brilliant retainer to compose something in which he could take part. Josquin was equal to the occasion. He constructed a quartet somewhat different from the usual sort, there being two upper parts in a canon and a free bass. To these he added a fourth part, the vox regis, as he flippantly called it, consisting of a single note, which it was the king's office to repeat, almost incessantly, throughout the piece. The emoluments even of a royal musician were evidently not always prompt or large, and Josquin is reported more than once to have given the cue to the king by compositions whose opening biblical words contained a punning comment on the royal dilatoriness in paying salaries or whose sacred meaning could be amusingly applied to his own indigence. When finally the king good-naturedly took the hint, Josquin poured out his gratitude in a motet, Lord, thou hast dealt graciously with thy servant. One biographer of Josquin cynically declares that the thank offering was not at all up to the mark of the petitions. Gaiety and humour were often in evidence in his music, as one would expect from so witty, lively a character. His work generally shows a careful finish and attention to details. Naumann points out that he takes greater care in declamation, groups his voices for better colour effects, and achieves results, especially in the masses, 
which foreshadow the grandeur and simplicity of the great period of ecclesiastical music under Palestrina. The Passion Motets and Stabat Mater for five voices are among the most famous of his works. Severe contrapuntal art is shown in the two Lom Arme masses, as well as in Pange Lingua and Fortuna Desperata. The contrapuntal ingenuity, however, is lost sight of in a genial, naive quality, combined with nobility and ceremonial dignity. His fame as a writer of chansons equalled his reputation in sacred music. In these also he stands far ahead of his contemporaries, paying more attention to syllabic values and entering into the mood of the text. His manner is unforced and gay, and here too his great contrapuntal ingenuity is veiled by poetical, nicely calculated effects. Concerning his work as a whole, in comparison with his predecessors, it is generally considered that he is more concise, easier to comprehend, less laden with artifice, and able at last to put soul into the elaborate framework of the polyphonic art. He is the first important musician whose work has come down to us in such quantities as to enable critics to judge adequately of his powers. He was in the prime of life when the art of printing music by means of movable types was invented, and for a century or more his compositions were included in almost every collection that was made. Among his extant works are 32 masses, fragments of masses, motets, some of them for five parts, and chansons. Portions of his work have been given to the public successively by Petrucci, early 16th century, in Junta's edition, Rome, 1521, in the Missa 12 of Graffaeus, 1539, and no less than seven special editions of portions of his works were made during the 16th century. Masses in manuscript are to be found in the archives of the Papal Chapel, as well as in the libraries of Munich and Cambrai. Besides these, numerous examples have been preserved in the works of Glarion, Siebold Hayden, Forkel, Burney, Hawkins, Kiesewetter, Ambrose, and others. The number and importance of his commentators and editors are glowing tributes to the importance of the man himself. With the exception of Lasso, no other Netherland master enjoyed such fame, either during life or after death. He is called Jodocus in affection, and described as at once learned and pleasing, everywhere graceful and universal favourite of the age, welcomed everywhere, ruling without a rival. Luther mentions the Jodocus as one of his favourite composers, saying that others were mastered by notes, while Joscan did what he pleased with them. And with all this popularity, even glorification, what living singer has ever sung, or what living amateur has ever heard, a note of his music? Specimens of it are not current, it is true, but neither are they inaccessible. 350 years are as nothing in the lifetime of a book, a building, a statue, even of a picture so much more perishable. Dante had need of a commentator before Josquin could have learned to read. The frescoes of Giotto were beginning to decay ere he visited Italy, and the beautiful cathedral of St. Quentin had entered its third century ere he first raised his voice in it. The eclipse of Josquin's fame, however, appears not to be quite so complete and thorough today as when the above words were written, 1862. A number of German societies now regularly include his compositions in their programmes, and some of his works have been given in New York during the current year, 1914. But no matter how neglected, he occupies a great and honoured place in the history of music. Hitherto, as we have seen, musicians had been almost entirely absorbed in the study and application of technical details. Their art was, first and foremost, an intellectual exercise, and its appeal, naturally, almost entirely limited to the intellect. To the modern amateur, good music is that which touches him. He wishes to be conscious of that indefinable spirit which is at once both simpler and deeper than intellect. The greater part of the contrapuntal subtleties of Ockergham must have left the listener cold, remaining in history only as amazing tours de force, whose artificial perfection could only be a stage in the development towards something higher. It was this higher quality, achieved by Josquin, which placed him at the head of composers of his time, and gives him importance in history. He too possessed the technical skill and learning necessary to the construction of contrapuntal riddles. 
He too was sometimes artificial, and occasionally surpassed even Okagum in his quaint and grotesque combinations. But such intellectual gymnastic feats were not an important matter with him. He used, and has the distinction of being the first to use, learning as a means of expression, as the vehicle of personal, subjective, and sympathetic utterance. His style became simpler and more transparent, his conception of the text more poetic, and by reason of these qualities, truth and beauty of expression are his chief merits. The labour of the Netherlanders, from Dufay to the death of Josquin, offers a spectacle of almost unparalleled activity and painstaking research. It was for the art of polyphony, the period of youth and adolescence, with its enormous energy, its too great reliance upon intellect, and its comparative lack of mellowness and heart. Dufay was a singer in the papal chapel, exactly one hundred years before Josquin held the same position. He, with other Gallo-Belgians and the English Dunstable, added to the body of technical knowledge, established the principles of design in composition, and brought sacred music into closer touch with folk song. Ockergum and his immediate followers were intoxicated, not with the wine of poetry or passion, but with a desire for intellectual artifice and refinement. They expended their genius on technique as an end, and produced compositions beside which even the most intricate contrapuntal efforts of later days seem almost like child's play. Such work carries within itself, however, the seeds of its own destruction, and so far as it rested upon puzzling subtleties, it was doomed to die. Nevertheless, the schools of Dufay and Ockergum prepared the way and the materials for the third and greatest of the indigenous Netherlands schools, that of Josquin. To him, the resources of counterpoint were merely the means to obtain the beauty of expression. It is for this reason that we regard him as the first great composer. End of section 17section 18 of the art of music volume 1 the pre-classic periods editor-in-chief daniel gregory mason this librivox recording is in the public domain read by jake milizia the italian renaissance we have learned in the previous chapters how music an incipient art fastened in the bondage of religious mysticism groped through the blackness of the medieval night how, bound by dogmatic rule, it became the object of intellectual lucubration, the scholastic medium of pedants, who reared their stupendous structure of Gothic intricacy beyond the reach of ordinary man. That Tower of Babel, in the building of which tongues were confounded, till no one understood what he sang nor what he heard. And we have seen how this edifice, in adapting itself to the use of the denizens, softened its lines and its angles, broadened its spaces and became a thing of beauty, a process in which we see reflected the dawn of a new era, when humanity breathes a freer air, that glorious spiritual awakening which found its religious expression in the Reformation, its aesthetic revelation in the Renaissance. We shall presently consider the influence of the former upon the course of music in Germany. Our immediate purpose is to follow the path of the parallel process accompanied through the Renaissance in Italy. In the words of J. Addington Simmons, the history of the Renaissance is the history of the attainment of self-conscious freedom by the human spirit manifested in the European races. In politics, it meant the breaking down of the reactionary forces vested in the Church and the Empire. In science, it meant the substitution of knowledge for superstition the fearless exploring of new continents, and the demonstration of the infinity of the universe. In art, it meant the firing of man's imagination, the stimulation of his creative faculties by the revival of learning, that rediscovery of the classic past which restored the confidence in their own faculties to men striving after a spiritual freedom, which held up for emulation master works of literature, philosophy and art, provoked inquiry, shattered the narrow mental barrier imposed by medieval orthodoxy. Just as the artist humanised the altarpieces and the cloister frescoes upon which he worked, 
and so silently substituted the love of beauty and the interest of actual life for the principles of the church. So the musician humanized the service of the church, brought beauty, expression, and emotion into his masses and motets, imbuing them with the dramatic spirit, the spirit of passion, which had never been absent from the secular music of the people, the music that is always indigenous to the soil. It is in this music that we must first seek the embodiment of the Renaissance spirit, which means the direct expression of human emotions in terms of oral beauty. That spirit has been associated in the history of music with two things, the invention of monody and the rise of opera, both of which are placed about the end of the 16th century. But recent research has shown these apparently sudden events to be the outcome of a development extending back nearly 300 years, so that they become the objective rather than the starting point of our account, which will aim to trace the steps by which this momentous reform was accomplished. Our story has a direct connection with the previous chapter on secular music of the Middle Ages, where we spoke of the art of the Provençal troubadours. Though their influence was not felt in Italy till late in the 12th century, it bore a fruit as rich as it had in France. In the middle of the 13th, a number of troubadours and jongleurs visited Frederick II at Milan in the train of Raymond Berengar, Count of Provence. The emperor extended his patronage to them, as did also Charles de Anjou, the king of Naples. They became known among the people as Uomini di Corti and Charlatanti, because their chief theme was the exploits of Charlemagne, and the natives taught by them were called Trovatori and Giocolini. These soon cultivated native poetry in the Italian vernacular, the Volgar Poesia, which spread its influence to northern Italy as well, and found representatives especially in Florence and Bologna. The 13th century records the names of Quitona d'Arezzo, Guido Guincelli, and Jacopone da Todi, and upon the threshold of the 14th stands Dante, 1265-1321, to one of the greatest poets of all times, who with Petrarch, 1304-1374, to and Boccaccio, 1313-1375, finally demonstrates the power of the Italian language as an artistic medium. In these three, Simmons says, Italy recovered the consciousness of intellectual liberty. What is more to our purpose, they so clarified and amplified the Italian tongue that it became the vehicle for a national literature, in which were produced not only epics after the classic models, but also lyric gems in new and spontaneous forms, which would inspire the creation of melody. Among these poetic forms, we frequently meet with canzone and madrigals, then called mandriale, from Italian mandra, hearth, which were evidently written to be sung. Their melodies, however, were no longer composed by the poets themselves, but by a class of musicians characteristic of Italy during the Renaissance, the cantori a liuto, lutinists, who were essentially composers and singers, as distinguished from the trovatori, who were poets primarily. One of these cantori a liuto was Dante's friend, Casella, whose name he has perpetuated in the Purgatorio. Footnote. Dante's ballate were everywhere known and sung, according to Sacchetti's novels, and when Dante overheard a blacksmith singing his song, he scolded him for having altered it. Dante himself was, according to an anonymous writer of the 13th century, dilettore nel canto e ogni suono. End of footnote. The importance of the lutinists in this and succeeding periods of music calls for a brief explanation of their instrument. The lute was a plucked string instrument somewhat resembling the guitar. Its origin was oriental. The favourite instrument of the Arabs it reached Italy by way of Spain, and thence spread all over Europe. In the 15th to the 17th century, it came to hold a place relatively as prominent as our pianoforte today. It was the household instrument par excellence, and an important member of early orchestras. In shape, the lute resembles the mandolin rather than the guitar, 
but it was made in various sizes, varieties and ranges, chitarone, theorbo, etc. The number of strings was variable. Five pairs running across the fingerboard and an additional single one for the melody were fretted. The rest, running outside, were used only as open strings. The tunings varied at different periods, and as in the case of the organ, a special kind of notation, or tablature, was used. It must not be supposed, however, that these lutenists were learned musicians in the sense of the contrapuntists, who, at this same period, flourished in the Netherlands, and who had already begun to invade Italy. They were not familiar with the complicated musical science of the time. The ecclesiastical modes, menstrual science, notation and its ramifications, ligatures, prolation and proportions, the theory of consonance and dissonance, the laws of voice progression, etc., all combined to form a science so formidable as to baffle all but those devouting their lives to its study. A boy put to school in childhood could achieve only in manhood the knowledge of a cantor. As for composing, he would first have to be, as Kieseveta says, a doctor of counterpoint. The lutenists were none such. They were essentially dilettanti, and hence their art, which was transmitted from ear to ear, has not been preserved to us. To gain a knowledge of the nature of their music, we must turn to the more learned native musicians, who we know cultivated the same forms in the 14th century. Here we meet with the most remarkable revelations. We will recall how music in its course of development, under the guidance of the church, chose a path which led directly away from the solo style of the folk song, or the song of the troubadours, and into the realm of polyphonic imitation. It has been supposed, therefore, that the vocal solo had no place in the system, and never appeared in the art music of the time. But recent investigators have unlocked for us a treasure of song by a school of Italian musicians of the early 14th century, who perpetuated not only the solo style, but the solo song with instrumental accompaniment, which is the supposed invention of the Florentine monodists of 1600. Fetis was the first to make known to the world the existence of the precious manuscript of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, dated 1375, which contains the specimens of these early Renaissance masters, among whom we should mention Jacopo da Bologna, Giovanni da Cascia, 1329-1351, Francesco Landino, 1325-1397, and Giradellus da Padua. Their worth was appreciated not only by Fetis, who, in speaking of Giovanni da Cascia, says that Guillaume de Marchot, who was the most celebrated French musician of the same epoch, does not show greater ability, but also by other historians. Ambrose says, if there, the Italians, works, take an inferior position to that of the Netherlanders, the reason is not lack of talent, but the fact that because of a disposition deeply rooted in the Italian nature and character, which later bore the richest fruits, the Italians were to develop certain sides of the art before it had to be subjected to the indispensable school of contrapuntalism. But none of the historians were aware of the full significance of this music, until Johannes Wolff's study of menstrual notation appeared, and until Hugo Riemann's deductions for the first time placed it in its true light. It is this school, which he characterises as the Italian Ars Nova, whose influence upon the French Ars Nova and its chanson literature we have already emphasised. The centre of this art is Florence, which Fetis calls the cradle of modern music. Its principal representative is Francesco Landino, mentioned above. The facts of his life are brief. He was born in Florence about 1325, the son of a painter of some reputation. Having lost his sight in his youth, he sought consolation in the study of music. He learned to play all the instruments then in vogue, and it is said even invented others but it was his ability on the organ that made him famous. In this he surpassed his contemporaries to such an extent that he was aptly styled Francesco degli Organi. The chief musicians of his time united to bestow upon him a laurel wreath with which the King of Cyprus crowned him in Venice. He died in his native city in 1390. 
What is true of his music applies in a great measure to that of his contemporaries, those named above and a number of others. The three principal forms into which their compositions are cast are the caccia, the ballata, and the madrigal. The caccia is the one indigenous form of the three, being of truly Tuscan origin. It is a canon for two voices, with or without a third as bass foundation, which does not participate in the canon, like the drone bass of Summer is I Coming In. As its name implies, catcher, meaning chase, it is a hunting song, though later it is applied to the humorous description of a market scene. The balata is clearly derived from the dance songs of the troubadours. Its form, as cultivated by the Florentines, shows at the beginning a phrase whose text and melody serve as a chorus refrain, ripresa. This is followed by a middle section which is repeated, piedi, over a different text. Then the opening section is again taken up, with fresh text as a volta, after which it is repeated as refrain. Often there are a number of strophes, copla, which are alike except for the texts of the piedi. The madrigal, too, originated in Provence, being derived from the pastorelle. While the latter, however, recounts amorous adventures with rural bells, the madrigal poems of Dante and his successors have for their subject the contemplation of the beauties of nature, with a whimsical, philosophical or sentimental conclusion. Its musical form is similar to the ballad and rondeau. It is divided into two parts with repeats, and its melodic phrases are usually not of greater length than would be required for about five text lines. We shall see later a new development of the madrigal in the polyphonic a cappella style, which became significant for the development of opera. The present form is, however, entirely monodic and accompanied. Herein indeed lies the most remarkable feature of these early forms of secular music, in that they represent a definitely thought-out combination of vocal and instrumental music, whose existence at this period was until recently unsuspected. But the latest research has definitely shown that the doubtful melismatic figures without words which proceed and follow the individual phrases are nothing but instrumental preludes, interludes and postludes. Riemann calls attention to the surprisingly definite harmonic basis of these songs, which seems far in advance of diaphony, faux bordon and all the primitive forms of polyphony. There is a remarkably varied combination of intervals, octaves, sixths, fifths, thirds, also sevenths and ninths, used in the nature of passing notes or over a pedal, foreshadowing the manner of a much later day. Consecutive fifths and octaves occur rarely, and when they do are used in a way which is not very objectionable even to modern ears. A strictly modal character is avoided by the frequent use of chromatics. Indeed, this Florentine Ars Nova of the 14th century has no connection with the laborious attempts of the Paris school. This is evident from the fact that it does not build motets upon a tuneless tenor, or construct rondo and conducts in the clumsy manner of the organum, but that it appears with entirely new fundamental forms, and with such a certainty and natural freshness, that a theoretical process of creation seems absolutely out of the question. No, this Florentine new art is a genuine, indigenous flower of Italian genius if we nevertheless insist upon tracing its roots beyond the rich soil of Tuscan literature, we can only find it in the troubadour poetry of Provence. According to our authority, there took place in the second half of the 14th century an active exchange of the achievements between the Florentines and the Paris school, in which France took from Italy a greater rhythmic variety, while Italy gained from France the manner of writing over a faux bordon foundation, the result being a decided detriment to the Florentine school, which lost much of its freedom in the invention of independent voices, though it gained in harmonic purity, while of course the consecutive octaves and fifths naturally disappear entirely. Examples of madrigals, cacci, etc., of the Florentine school may be examined in Johannes Wolf's Geschichte der Menschel Notation. A notable specimen by Giovanni da Cascia is the white peacock, quoted by Riemann. The cantori a liuto, who flourished probably throughout the 15th century, performed no doubt the compositions of these masters, no less than their own inventions and the popular songs of the day, the frottole, the canzone, villanesche and villanelle, 
which resounded through the streets and the Campania of Renaissance Italy. The 15th century saw Italy well advanced toward the state in which it had been compared to ancient Greece. The work begun by Petrarch had made mighty strides, the recovery of ancient learning and ancient art had become the great passion of the age, and the worship of beauty was the second, if not the first, creed of a people, but recently emerged from the broils of civil war, and settled down to a prosperous period, under a benevolent tyranny of which the rule of the Medici at Florence was the archetype. Learning and culture had become a badge of nobility, and the patronage of the arts an instrument of power. That music shared in the boon which came to art is unquestionable. A musical education was once again, as in ancient Greece, an essential part of a gentleman's equipment. Poets and musicians shared the patronage of princes, who themselves had no greater ambition than to be accounted men of genius. In truth, Florence had become the Athens of the modern world. Cosimo de Medici returned from his Venetian exile in 1434, and once installed in power, we see him surrounded by such men as Donatello, Brunelleschi, Ghiberti, and Luca della Robbia. Gemistos Plethos, the Byzantine Greek, fires his passion for Plato's philosophy, and Massilio Ficino is trained under his patronage to translate the works of the sage. Vespasiano assures us of his versatility as follows. When giving audience to a scholar, he discoursed concerning letters. In the company of theologians he showed his acquaintance with theology. Astrologers found him well versed in their science. Musicians in like manner perceived his mastery of music, wherein he much delighted. Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo the Magnificent, 1449-1492, far surpassed his grandsire in talent and culture. He was a writer of prose and poetry, gave the impulse to the revival of a national literature, and may be said to have raised popular poetry to the dignity of an art, in writing new verses for the canzone al ballo, which the young men and girls sang and danced upon the squares of Florence to celebrate the return of May, and the canti canascieleschi, the songs that the Florentine populace sang, masked at carnival times. He organised for these occasions great pageants in which he himself took part, engaging the best artists for the embellishment of chariots and the designing of costumes, while he himself wrote songs appropriate to the characters represented on the cars, causing new musical settings to be made by eminent composers. Every festivity, says Simmons, May morning tournaments, summer evening dances on the squares of Florence, weddings, carnival processions, and vintage banquets at the villa, had their own lyrics with music and the carola. Lorenzo's famous academy constituted perhaps the greatest intellectual galaxy of the age, for at his table sat Angelo Poliziano, Cristoforo Landino, Marsilio Ficino, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, Leo Battista Alberti, Michelangelo Buonarotti, and Luigi Pulci. Surrounded by these companions, we behold him in the streets of Florence, not disdaining to perform his own songs, in the midst of an approving populace, or perchance, when Florence sleeps besides the silvery Arno and the large Italian stars come forth above, accompanied by a few kindred spirits, lute in hand, singing the verses of a Dante or a Petrarch to the accompaniment of soft Italian zephyrs, or again in his villa, on the steep slope of that lofty hill crowned by the mother city, the ancient Fiesole, with Michelangelo, seated between Ficino and Politian, with the voices of prophets vibrating in his memory, and with the music of Plato sounding in his ears, till Pulci breaks the silence with a brand new canto of Morgante, or a singing boy is bidden to tune his mandolin to Messer Angelo's last made ballata. To such gatherings of boon companions, and to the small domestic circle, the cantori a liuto were finally relegated, for, as we shall see, their usefulness had been outlived. Such men as these were the perpetuators of their art, and the last, perhaps, to cultivate the spontaneous monodies of their Florentine forebears, for it is unthinkable that these worshippers of beauty, these aesthetic sentimentalists, should have escaped the charm of that school and have forgone it in favour of that which followed. 
For meantime, the musicians of the Netherlands school continued to spread their propaganda in Italy, and so successfully that their contrapuntal works began to supersede the native monodic style. Their method had indeed undergone great improvement. Josquin de Pré and his more expressive style had achieved tremendous popularity throughout Europe. Footnote. During 1471 to 1488, Josquin was at the papal chapel in Rome. His popularity there is illustrated by the following episode. When a motet was performed in a distinguished social circle, it passed almost without notice until the hearers became aware that Josquin was its composer, when all hands promptly proceeded to express their admiration of it. End of footnote. Toward the end of the 15th century, these masters cultivated the secular forms more and more, always, of course, in their wanted contrapuntal method. They would frequently take the melody of a favourite folk song, use it as their tenor, the middle part, around which they wove an artful counterpoint. In Germany, the harmonisation of popular melodies, or melodies in the popular vein, had been going forward for some time, and it is a noteworthy fact that Heinrich Isaac, one of those most prominently engaged in this work, was organist in Florence from 1484 to 1494, and again after 1514. The style of writing adopted in these popular settings was a simple note against note, which emphasised chord progressions rather than melodic integrity. Definite ideas of harmony were beginning to take root about this time. Ramis de Pareja, the Spanish theoretician, in 1482, had by his new mathematical definitions of the ratio of intervals established the consonant nature of the triad. Franchino Gaffori and Ludovico Fogliano, died 1539, had insisted upon the same principle. In 1558, Giuseppe Zalino gave to the world his Institutione Harmonice, which, following the Ptolemaean determination of intervals, established the natural relations of the tones of the major triad, Divisione Harmonica, and in the course of the century his ideas of harmony became the common property of musicians. With harmony as the predominating principle of music, with vertical hearing rather than horizontal as the prevailing habit, and the constant freer use of chromatics, the doom of ecclesiastical modes was sounded, even if not fully accomplished till later, and the real advent of modern music had been reached. The Italians, from early times, as today primarily and essentially melodists, never found great appeal in the barbarous descant and counterpoint of the Netherlanders. But they could not but perceive the charm of harmony, once it had been cleansed of its dross, when composers no longer worked for the eye of their expert colleagues alone, but for the ears of the people as well. Hence, polyphonic music was gradually accepted in the place of the native monodies, which had now lost caste, and it became fashionable to perform motets for the entertainment of one's guests. However, the number of native singers able to perform this learned music was insufficient to supply even the churches outside Rome, much less the palaces of the aristocracy, until the increased influx of Netherlanders as singers and teachers spread their art among the musicians of Italy. During the 16th century, the simplification of notation made the art of reading music accessible to the dilettanti, who now formed musical coteries for the performance of polyphonic songs. Native composers busied themselves to supply the demand, and their products were spread broadcast by enterprising publishers, for meantime, in 1476, the art of printing had been introduced in Rome. The first of these publishers was Ottaviano dei Petrucci, who, though not its inventor, so advanced the art of music printing as to render it a practical medium. His office in Venice produced in 1501 a collection of 96 songs written by various composers. Thus he brought polyphonic music to the people, and so caused the old monodies of the lutenists and earlier masters to pass still farther into oblivion. Among the native products of Petrucci's press, we see a number of four-part songs of lighter genre called frottole. This was a simple, popular form, akin to the ballata, and usually supposed to be of humorous content. The frottola was essentially a street song, originally sung to an improvised accompaniment, and did not really belong to the a cappella species. But, in Petrucci's collection, 
Between 1504 and 1509, he published nine books of Grottelet. They appear as polyphonic pieces in a manner of the time. In this guise, they were stepping stones to a nobler form which was to achieve immense popularity and, practiced by the more educated circles of amateurs, became the chamber music of the period. This was the madrigal, or to be precise, the new madrigal, for though the old verses of Dante, Petrarch, etc. served as bases, its musical structure had little to do with the earlier form. This, in fact, was the only excuse for adopting the name madrigal for this new type of composition. Composers were weary of the short forms with their endless repetition of phrases, and recognising the superiority of the old classic poems, both in sentiment and structure, proceeded to apply to them their polyphonic skill. Like in the motet, the setting was continuous, durch komponiert, with or without reiteration of musical ideas, but unlike that stereotyped form, the madrigal was the child of free invention throughout, not a contrapuntal exercise upon a given cantus firmus. The tenor was not more prominent than the other voices, neither on the other hand was the treble a real melody in the modern sense, being the result of simultaneous calculation. The madrigal was the a cappella composition par excellence, and as the secular counterpoint of the motet, became the standard form in which the pure vocal style was developed. Adrian Willett, 1480-1562, the founder of the so-called Venetian school, whose activities as a church composer we shall recount in the next chapter, is generally considered the father of the new madrigal. Though others went before him, it was he who endowed it with a freshness and vitality which made its extraordinary vogue possible. Master Adrian, says Ambrose, found in the smaller frottele of a Marco Caro and others many noble serious expressions of sentiment. This colorit, this peculiar tone he retained, together with the manner of treating Italian verse, but in place of the timid, poor and often clumsy technique of the Italians, he applied to them the entire Netherland mastery of accomplished counterpoint. And the madrigal was ready. The madrigal was to express only the pure and the profound. The cor gentile was the centre of this poetry and music. The heart moved by noble love, with its joys and pains, its love, hope, longing, suffering and anger. The tone of the madrigal is ever one of tender emotion, never of vehement passion. It should never burst out in unbeautiful, violent expressions. Analyzing one of his madrigals, Riemann says that on the whole there is so much originality, so much individual endeavour, that the lack of flowering fancy and warm blood is willingly overlooked. We feel, as one does in the case of moderns, for instance Berlioz, that we are in the presence of a distinguished personality. Willett is great by virtue of the various impulses that he gave, as teacher, as eminent artist, but not really because of his compositions. If we compare him to the passionate Ver de Lowe, the daring Arcadelt, the solemn Festa, the supple Gero, or the genial Rore, commanding all the nuances of expression, any one of these will be found more telling. But in all of the works of these, his pupils, we find the traces of his genius. Riemann has here named the greatest of the madrigalists, some of whom we must now consider further. They were all not only learned contrapuntists, but consummate masters of style, as is shown by the restraint with which they applied their skill, and they have left us works which for purity of style and graceful flow of melody can scarcely be exceeded. Philippe Verdelot's madrigals appear even before those of Willett, 1538, but few have been preserved with all parts complete. He probably lived in Italy during 1525 to 1565, Florence and Venice. His second book of five-part madrigals appeared in 1536, and in the same year Willert published lute arrangements of Verdelot's madrigals. Besides nine books of madrigals, four to six parts, he left motets for up to eight parts and a large mass, Philomena. But the success of his madrigals was even surpassed by those of Jacques Arcadelt, a native of the Netherlands, born 1514. The latter died in Paris after 1557. He appears a singer at the court of Florence from 1540 to 1549, when he became one of the papal singers of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, and singing master to the boys at St. Peter's. 
Besides compositions which appeared in miscellaneous collections, he published independently five books of four-part madrigals, 1537 to 1544, another for three parts, all of which went rapidly through many editions, besides three masses and a book of motets. One of his madrigals, Il Bianco e Dolce Cigno, a notable example of the style, is reprinted by Burney. The well-known Ave Maria, which has been edited by Sir Henry Bishop and transcribed by Liszt, is now thought to be of doubtful authorship. Constanzo Festa, of Rome, where he was papal chapel singer from 1517 till his death in 1545, the first Italian representative of the imitative vocal style in church composition, is, with Willert and Verdolo, the originator of the new madrigal. His Amor che mi consigli, published in 1531, even points to him as the first in the field. His works are distinguished by rhythm, grace, elegance, simplicity and purity of harmony. Burney further assures us that the subjects of imitation in it are as modern, and that the parts sing as well as if they were a production of the 18th century. His madrigal Quando ritrovo la mia pastorella, translation Down in the Flowery Vale, was for a long time the most popular piece of its kind in England. He was less happy in his motets, in which he followed the absurd custom of setting the voice to different texts. A celebrated Te Deum by him is still sung by the pontifical choir upon the election of a new pope. Festa attained the dignity of maestro at the Vatican, being at that time the only Italian to hold such position. The most distinguished pupil of Willert was Cipriano di Rore, born circa 1516, at Mechlin or Antwerp. After leaving Willert's tutelage in Venice, he went to the court of Hercules II at Ferrara in 1542, where in the same year his first book of madrigals was brought out. After sundry travels in his native country, he was made maestro di capella to Duke Ottavio Farnese at Parma, returning to Venice as Willet's successor upon the latter's death. He enjoyed great distinction as a composer of originality. Of his ecclesiastical works we shall speak in a following chapter. As a composer of madrigals and ricicari, he followed in his master's footsteps. Eight books of four to five part madrigals, published from 1542 to 1565, of which the four-part ones were issued in score form in 1577 as an aid to the study of counterpoint, constitute the bulk of his secular works. It will be well to mention here that Monteverdi, half a century later, acclaimed the divine Cipriano di Rore as the founder of the new art, because of his endeavours in establishing the supremacy of melody. Luca Marenzio, born near Brescia, 1550-1560, was probably the most distinguished of all the madrigalists, though he by no means limited himself to this field. His contemporaries called him Il Più Dolce Cigna, translation, the sweetest swan, Divino Compositore, etc., and he enjoyed the highest musical eminence. About 1584, he was maestro to Cardinal d'Este, later at the court of Sigismund III of Poland, received the unusual salary of 1,000 scudi, and was organist of the papal chapel in Rome from 1585 till his death in 1594, caused, it was said, by a broken heart, because of his love for a relative of Cardinal Aldobrandini whom he could not marry. His printed compositions comprise no less than 18 books of madrigals, four to six voices, and many ecclesiastical works. Of further names we need only mention Constanzo Porta of Padua, 1530 to 1601, Giovanni Croce of Venice, 1557 to 1609, Andrea and Giovanni Gabrielli, of whom we shall speak in a later chapter, Claudio Merulo of Correggio, 1553 to 1604, and Carlo Gesualdo, Prince of Venosa, 1560 to 1614, the most daring and most genial harmonist of the 16th century, and finally, the princely Lassou, and the great Palestrina himself, as a few of the endless hosts of madrigal writers. Not thousands, but tens of thousands of madrigals were composed in this period. It was the accepted medium for the expression of every poetic idea, every pretty sentiment. 
people sang madrigals at home and abroad, in society and for private pastime. In short, its popularity has not been surpassed even by the modern song. A distinct departure from the madrigal of Willett, and one in which historians are wont to see a direct step toward the opera, is seen in the descriptive or dramatic madrigals of Alessandro Striggio, born Mantua 1535, and Orazio Vecchi. The descriptive element had indeed invaded song composition much earlier. The French programme chansons, notably those of Clermont Jeannequin, who attempted to reproduce in vocal music the song of birds and the noise of battle, were perhaps the most remarkable phenomena of this kind. Though not an Italian, Jeannequin deserved notice here because of his influence in this direction. He was a pupil of Josquin, and besides a varied lot of sacred works, issued a great number of chansons which became popular as bravura pieces in instrumental form, being printed in Italy without texts in 1577. Partite in caselle persona. His great chansons, or inventions, which stamp him the programmistic composer of the 16th century, include La Bataille, on the Battle of Marignano, 1515, La Guerre, Le Caquet des Femmes, Women's Gossip, La Jalousie, La Chasse aux Lièvres, Rabbit Hunt, etc., etc. A curious example is the excerpt reprinted in our supplement. In it the cuckoo's call, the nightingale song, the notes of the thrush and other sounds of nature's music are introduced simultaneously. Verdelot's realistic description of the chase, Eckhard's tumult of the people at St. Mark's, and Strigio's dispute of the washerwomen at the brook are additional instances in which vocal music appropriated the dramatic elements of action, movement, the passing shapes and the play of colours. In the hands of these composers, the madrigal became a vehicle for humorous or whimsical moods no less than for the expression of tender sentiments, or a charming picturesque and dramatic symphony, for which Romain Roland finds an analogy in the Romeo and Juliet symphony of Berlioz. Such are Orazio Vecchi's La Selva di Varia di Chiatone, 1590, Musical Banquet, 1597, and Amphiparnasso. They are in reality series of madrigals which follow out a continuous idea as in dramatic action, their text comprising the dramatic forms of monologue and dialogue, but curious as it may seem, never set to music in the way that seems natural to us, as solos, duets, etc., but always in madrigalesque polyphony. Thus, instead of having the singers represent the different characters of the piece, the actual practice was to have the monologue section sung by all of them, while the dialogue would be carried on between sets of two or three singers each. For example, if Isabella, in Amphiparnaso, speaks to her lover Lucio, a group of three voices represents each of them. Isabella is characterised by a soprano and supported by an alto and a quinto. Lucio, represented by a tenor, sustained by a quinto and a bass. Never did it occur to the composer, even when the text was marked Lucio Solo, actually to write for a solo voice. By this we may understand what a revolution was necessary in men's minds to accomplish the essential step to dramatic fidelity. The following is Romain Roland's pen picture of the most interesting exponent of the dramatic madrigal. Orazio Vecchi, born Modena 1550, died there in 1605, was a man of the Renaissance. He possessed its superabundance of vigour, the desire for action, and a robust good humour. Chapel master at Modena, we find him on the highways and byways of Italy, indoors only to take part in brawls and coltellate. Commissioned as Archdeacon of Correggio to correct the gradual of the Roman Catholic Church, he is occupied in 1591 with directing private and public masquerades in Modena. A writer of celebrated masses, he becomes at the same time the creator of Opera Buffa. Three times the Bishop of Reggio dismissed him from his function, but his reputation was enormous. The House of Este and the great Italian lords extended their favour to him, while his name spread to Austria, to Denmark and to Poland. At his death in 1605, he was regarded not only as one of the foremost musicians of the century and the inventor of musical comedy, 
but as one of the greatest geniuses of the age. Comedy is indeed his fear. Rarely does he ascend to the height of pathos and passion, though he amply proves himself capable of portraying earnest sentiment and sometimes pathos. But the question whether he merits the reputation of having created comic opera or not, we shall leave to the judgment of the reader. First we shall let him speak for himself. I know well, he says, that peradventure some will consider my caprices as unworthy and light, but they should learn that as much grace, art, and fidelity is required to trace a comic part, as in representing an old reasoning sage. And elsewhere, music is poetry by the same right as poetry itself. That the conscious purpose of his music was the expression of ideas is evident from these directions, which preface his Amphipanasso. Everything here has a precise purpose. It is necessary to find this, and only by expressing it well and intelligently will you give life to the performance. The moral import of the piece is of no less consequence than the simple comedy. Since music appeals to the emotions rather than the intellect, I have been obliged to compress the development of the action into the smallest space, for speech is more rapid than song. Hence it is necessary to condense, contract, suppress detail, and only to take the capital situations, the moments characteristic to the subject. The imagination must supply the rest. Vecchi's disciple, Banchieri, gives a clear account of the manner of performing these madrigals in the preface to La Commedia di Prudenza Giovanile. Before the music, one of the singers will read in a loud voice the name of the scene, the names of the characters and the argument. The place of performance is a room of medium size, as closed in as possible for the sake of acoustics. In one corner of the room, two large carpets are laid on the floor, and an agreeable decoration is used for the background. Two seats are placed at the right and left, respectively. Behind the backdrop are benches for the singers, who must turn toward the audience and be seated at a hand's breadth from each other. Behind them is an orchestra of lutes, clavicembali, etc., attuned to the voices. Above is a large sheet, which hides both singers and musicians. The singers, invisible, follow the music of their parts. There should be three, or better, six at a time. They must give animation to the cheerful words, pathos to the sad ones, and enunciate loudly and intelligibly. The reciting actors, alone on the scene, must prepare their roles, know them well by heart, and follow the music closely. It would not be amiss to have a prompter aid the singers, instrumentalists, and reciters. These actors do not, as may be supposed, perform pantomime. They simply pronounce the prologue and announce the scenes. At the end, they would perhaps dance a few ballet steps in order to leave the spectator in a happy frame of mind. By way of example, we shall briefly recount the plot of Vecchi's chef-d'oeuvre, that Commedia Armonica, of the strangely inexplicable title Amphiparnasso. The story centres around the love intrigue of Lucio and Isabella, the daughter of Pantalone, who has determined to marry her to the pedantic Gratiano. Lucio attempts to commit suicide but is saved. Isabella, about to follow him into death, declares her love. They are married and in the last scene receive the forced consent and the presence of all concerned. Meantime, Pantalone serenades and is rejected by the courtesan Hortensia. Lelio pursues another adventure with the beautiful Nisa and the captain, Cardone, believing himself loved by Isabella, makes advances and is promptly rebuked. Dr. Gratiano sings absurd serenades, while Franca Trippa, the valet of Pantalone, goes to borrow money at the Jew's house, who reject him under pretext of the Sabbath. The book for this amazing comedy, as indeed for all the others, was written by Vecchi himself. He makes all his characters speak in their various dialects, and the score is full of humorous descriptions and characterizations. The piece had great success, and, while there were many adverse criticisms, the number of his imitators attests the continued popularity of the form which he developed. Adriano Banchieri of Bologna, 1567-1634, was Vecchi's chief disciple and one of his great admirers. He frankly imitated him in his Studio di Letevole for three voices, 1603, while in his Saviezza Giovanile he yields to the influence of the Florentine reform, of which later, 
and endeavours to present a compromise between the representative and the polyphonic styles. He was, moreover, a musician of great merit, composed, like Vecchi, numerous organ pieces and was the author of a number of theoretic works and polemics. The vogue of the dramatic madrigal continued throughout the north of Italy for twenty years after Vecchi's death. In Bologna, it survived to the end of the 17th century. Whatever its importance in the development of the opera, however far removed from realistic action, the dramatic principle is there. We have, in fact, a musical drama, or at least a dramatic symphony, especially if we regard the voices which accompany the characters in the nature of instruments. And here it behooves us to record another peculiar fact. These minor voice parts were often actually played on instruments, not only in the dramatic madrigal, but in the other vocal forms as well, sometimes because of the lack of singers and sometimes for the sake of variety. The first recorded instance of this kind of solo singing was supposed to have occurred in 1539, when Seleno sang in an intermedio the upper part of a madrigal by Francesco Corteccia, died 1571, accompanying himself on the violone, while the other parts, representing satyrs, were taken by wind instruments. Caccini, the reputed inventor of monody, in an intermezzo by Pietro Strozzi, performed at the marriage of Duke Francesco and Bianca Capello, 1579, himself sang the role of knight with an accompaniment of viols. These instances are, however, not isolated. The experiment proved popular and became common practice. A number of the frottele, villanelle, madrigals, etc., which came from Petrucci's press, appeared indeed in the guise of lute arrangements. But all this was as far from true monody, or solo melody, as the dramatic madrigal was removed from opera, for the mere emphasising of an upper part, which was developed out of, or as counterpart to another, could not make it express the sentiment intended by the text, or follow the accents and natural inflections of the spoken word. Monody was as much a lost art as the Greek tragedy, which the inventors of opera thought they were reviving from a slumber of well-nigh two thousand years. Its reinstatement was the result of a deliberate reform, a revolt against the prevailing polyphonic method, accomplished by a limited number of individuals. Even if the analytical historian must reject the possibility of the sudden invention of an artistic form, we cannot deny the merit of the most definite step towards the creation of opera to the Florentine Camerata, an account of whose activities we shall reserve for a later chapter. Our object in this discussion has been to emphasise the fact that monody, the most natural form of musical expression, was not an arbitrary invention such as the contrapuntal style evidently was that it lay indeed at the very foundation of that style, but was so effectually displaced by it that only the faintest memories of it survived. It was from these memories that the new art of the 17th century, with its new dramatic significance, sprang, just as the Ars Nova, the new art of the 15th century, had sprung from their source. The intervening space of two centuries was a period of prodigious development, both in secular and church music, and of the most active exchange between the two. But in this exchange the church unquestionably remained the debtor, for it acquired from the secular art most of its really vital elements, even dramatic force. Only thus could it become the ideal expression of that new religious spirit with which both the Catholic and Protestant faiths were to be imbued. The development of this religious art, which forms a parallel to the movements just described, is our next subject. End of section 18「Section 19 of the Art of Music, Volume 1, The Pre-Classic Periods. Editor-in-Chief Daniel Gregory Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Melitzia. The Golden Age of Polyphony. The deep vital forces which had for two hundred years been urging Italy to magnificent achievement broke through into music during the course of the sixteenth century. Music was, as she has always been, the last to respond to a general movement, but the response, when it came, entailed an entire reconstruction of the art. All through the century, the process of reconstruction was active. It was, however, gradual in its working. Only toward the very end of the century, a few bold explorers and experimenters 
turned their backs upon the past, cut loose from the old art of music, and started in to build with new stone and new tools a new art. We have had to do in this chapter with the old art, on the one hand with influences which boldly altered it, and with new developments which were set free through these alterations, on the other with its ultimate perfection and consequent end. The invention of music printing just before the beginning of the century had a powerful influence upon the development of music. The beautiful manuscripts in which early music has been preserved to us were the work for the most part of monks, and are another evidence of the restriction of music to the church. With the invention of printing came a liberation from this restraint. Music circulated through the lay society, all kinds of music, both secular and sacred. It stepped from the dim, vast cathedrals, and went among the people, and entered into their homes and into their lives. The world of men and women welcomed it and changed it, formed it to the expression of their joys and sorrows. The superhuman intricacies of counterpoint and canon, little by little, withered and fell by the way. Ulrich Hahn of Ingolstadt, in 1476, solved the problem of printing music by means of movable types, but his invention seems to have languished until other enterprising men took it up. In Italy, this was done by Ottaviano dei Petrucci, born in 1466, at Fossombrone, near Ancona. Petrucci, one of the first monopolists in the business of printing music, was, like Aldus Manutius, a man of good birth and fortune. Some time before 1498, he had established himself at Venice, and obtained from the municipal council the sole privilege, for twenty years, of printing figured music, canto figurato, and music in the tablature of the organ and lute. This meant that, so far as Venice was concerned, all the published lamentations, frottole, motets, and masses were to issue from Petrucci's press. His first publication in 1501 was a collection of 96 pieces, most of them written for three or four voices by Ockegem, Hobrecht, Josquin, Isaac, and others. The printing was done by a double process, first the staff, then the notes, in a small quarto with fine black ink. The parts stood opposite one another on the open page, thus. The text indicates soprano top left, tenor top right, alto bottom left, and bass bottom right. The registry, or fit, of the notes was perfect, and the effect of the whole was admirable. This expensive double process, however, was superseded about five years later by another, simpler one, involving only one impression. In 1511, Petrucci left his plant at Venice in the hands of others and returned to Fossombrone. Two years later, he obtained a patent from Pope Leo X for all the printing in the Papal States for a period of fifteen years. Petrucci's last publication, a collection of 83 motets, is dated 1523. His works are rare and highly valued as antique specimens of printing, and the man himself is also remembered for the standards of neatness and precision which he established. Pierre Atignon is said to be the first to introduce music printing by means of movable types into France. In the nine years from 1527 to 1533, Atteignon printed 19 books of motets of various French and foreign masters. These prints are also very rare and historically important. His work was still going on in 1543, but it seems that the famous ballads were soon to take it up. The names not only of printers, but of the engravers and founders of these first music types are justly preserved. Pierre Autain was engraver for Atteignon, and Etienne Briard, a founder at Avignon. Briard furnished the first known specimens of round notes, in place of the usual quadrangular shapes, and these were used for the first time in printing the works of Carpentras in 1532. This, however, was an exception, as the round notes were not generally introduced into print until about the year 1700. Lebert, 
was another well-known type founder. His types were of the sort which printed notes and lines simultaneously. Each individual type contained a note and a portion of the staff, but later Le Bay adopted Petrucci's method of double impressions. Adrian Leroy, a lute player, singer and composer, appears as the next printer of renown in Paris after Atteignon. Leroy presently joined forces with another follower of the craft named Ballard, incidentally marrying the daughter of the house, and in 1552 the firm obtained a patent as sole printers of music for King Henry II of France. This patent, frequently renewed, remained in the Ballard family until it was abolished by the French Revolution more than 200 years later, and the types of Le Bay, printing both notes and lines at once, purchased by Pierre Ballard in 1540 for 50,000 livres, were still in use in 1750. One cannot help suspecting that these types, excellent as they must have been, grew old-fashioned long before they were laid aside. But monopoly has its uses. There was no one to complete on equal terms with the distinguished and influential ballards, so there was no use to them in making expensive changes in type. For more than two centuries then, the Ballard family held an important place as printers of music in France. The famous Orlando de Lasso visited them. Lully's operas were printed by them, first from movable types, later from copper plates. In early days of the firm, Leroy himself wrote an instruction book for the lute, which was translated into English in two different versions, one by a writer named F.K. Gentleman. Leroy also wrote an instruction book for the guitarne, guitar, and a book of air de cour for the lute, in the dedication of which he said that such airs were formerly known as voix de vie. In England, Thomas Tallis and his pupil William Bird obtained in 1575 a monopoly for 20 years of all music printing done in the realm. The invention of printing meant, as we have said, that music was no longer centralised about the church. Yet it has to be granted that one of the greatest impulses music has ever received came to it in the early 16th century from a new religion, an impulse which, destined to be checked for a while, though not killed, by the horrors of religious warfare in the next century, was to gain thereafter ever more and more strength, and lead at last to truly magnificent heights in the work of Johann Sebastian Bach. The new religious movement to which we refer was the Protestant Reformation, under the leadership of Martin Luther. We have said consciously that music received thereby a new impulse. To hold that music was entirely reconstructed by Luther, that he discarded all the forms and technique of music that had been up to that time developed in the art, is quite as mistaken as to hold that he wholly discarded the Roman ritual and built up a new and independent service. The change which the Reformation brought to music was like the change it brought to the service, far more one of spirit than one of form. Luther's reform was essentially to abolish the mediation of the priesthood, to clear from the service, in so far as possible, all that might stand between the worshipper and his God, to give freedom to the intimate personal communion between God and man, which the northerner naturally feels and practices. In this respect, Luther's reform would theoretically restore all music in the service to the congregation. But Luther was dearly fond of music, of, so to speak, the best music. His favourite composers were Josquin de Pré and Ludwig Senfel, both contrapuntists of enormous skill. Their music was a worthy adornment of the service. I am not of the opinion, he said, that on account of the gospel, all the art should be crushed out of existence as some over-religious people pretend, but I would willingly see all the arts, especially music, in the service of him who has created and given them. Congregational singing is anything but an art, often indeed is hardly music, Luther had no intention to dismiss trained choirs from the churches and give over all the music of the service to the untrained mass of worshippers. The trained choir, therefore, was retained in all the Lutheran churches, which could afford to pay for one, and music for these choirs, that is, artistic music, often music written by Catholic composers in complicated, contrapuntal style, held an honoured place in the Lutheran ritual. 
The personal, intimate spirit from which the reform drew life, however, found an expression in music. To the congregation was allotted a greater or less portion of song. It will be remembered that the early Christians sang together, and that not until the 7th century was the privilege taken from them and restricted only to a trained choir. The German people, as a matter of fact, seem never to have quite given up their share in the musical part of the service. At some of the great festival services they joined in the Kyrie and in the Alleluia, and very early it became the custom to insert German verses in the liturgy at these places. Thus there developed a literature of German hymns, sometimes partly German and partly Latin, as the following old Easter hymn, obviously interpolated in the Kyrie. Christ ist erstanden von der Mate aller, des sollen wir alle froh sein, Christ soll unser Trost sein. Kyrie oleis. Halleluja, Halleluja, Halleluja. Des sollen wir alle froh sein, Christ soll unser Trost sein. Kyrie oleis. In connection with the mystery plays, other hymns were written, such as the following cradle song, part German, part Latin, and part nonsense. In dulce jubilo, nun singet und sei froh, unses Herzens Wonne liegt in Precipio, und leuchtet als die Sonne Matrice in Gremio, Alpha et O, Alpha et O. About these hymns there was woven a sort of religious folk music. By the time of the Reformation there was a whole literature to draw from, and Luther needed only to organise and standardise many of the hymns which had been familiar to the people for generations. To these he added others of his own writing. The music was drawn from all sources, practically none was especially composed. Luther had, to aid him in compiling his hymn book, two famous musicians, Konrad Rupf and Johann Walter. In 1524, these two men were his guests for a period of three weeks. Kurslin writes, While Walter and Rupf sat at the table bending over the music sheets with pen in hand, Father Luther walked up and down the room, trying on his fife, to ally the melodies that flowed from his memory and his imagination with the poems he had discovered, until he had made the verse melody a rhythmically finished, well-rounded, strong and compact whole. Here we have a picture of the German hymn tune, later called the chorale, in the process of crystallization. The devil does not need all the good tunes for himself. Luther wisely remarked, and he drew from all sources, secular and sacred, for his melodies. The same breadth of choice was likewise exercised by his followers throughout the century. A song sung by the foot soldiers at the Battle of Pavia became the Durch Adams Fall ist ganz verderbt. The chorale melody, Von Gott will ich nicht lassen, can be traced to an old love song, Einmal tät ich spazieren. A love song, Mein Gemüt ist mir verwirrt von einer Jungfrau Saat, by Hans Leo Hassler, became the choral melody to the funeral hymn, Herzlich tut mich verlangen, and later the same melody was set to Paul Gerhardt's hymn, O haupt wohl blut und wunden, and in that form holds a leading part in Bach's St. Matthew Passion. Nor were the chorale tunes taken from Germany alone. Favourite part songs of Italy and France were appropriated and set to German words. The hymn book, compiled by Luther, with the help of Rupf and Walter, were published in Wittenberg in 1524. It was intended for church use, and that the compilers had the choir, not the congregation, in mind, is proved by the fact that all the tunes are contrapuntally set, with the melody as cantus firmus in the tenor, that is to say, in the middle of the music, not soaring triumphantly aloft majestically to guide the congregation. We have therefore in these chorales of Luther not a new form, but a new spirit. How great a part the congregation ever actually took in them is open to discussion. Doubtless in those churches, where there was no skilled choir, congregational singing played an important role, but it seems likely that in those churches where there was such a choir, congregational singing was kept as much in the background as possible. In 1586, Lucas Osiander published a set of 50 chorales, 
set contrapuntally in such a way that the whole Christian congregation can always join in them. This was obviously a kind attempt to bring the more or less neglected congregation into the musical part of the service. In Osiander's arrangements, the melody is in the soprano, but the setting is still too intricate for general use, and the same rather condescending, yet still lofty attitude toward the congregation is characteristic of all composers down to the time of Bach. The question of just how the congregation sang those chorales allotted to them is also in doubt. It is hardly possible that in the first half of the 16th century the organ accompanied them. The organ was still far too imperfect to attempt polyphonic playing such as would afford a harmonic support to the singers, who we may presume sang only in unison. It is more likely that the organ and the congregation alternated, or that the choir and the congregation sang in turn. Toward the end of the century, attempts were made to have the choir lead the congregation, and then later, in course of time, the organ was perfected and was used for accompaniment, coming soon to drown out the choir, which had little chance to maintain a leadership over the mass of singers on the one hand and the organ on the other. Thus the organ finally took the leadership. In its new position, it no longer alternated with the congregation, and the skill which organists had had an opportunity to show in the solo passages alternating in the old days with the congregation, was now concentrated upon the prelude. In this way, the foundation for a characteristically German art form in organ music, the chorale prelude, was laid. Though Luther was too much of a musician to be willing to give over the music of the service to be mishandled by a crowd of untrained singers, he nonetheless intended his chorale melodies to enter into the lives of the German Protestants. Thus, while on the one hand we have Luther's own book and subsequent books in the same contrapuntal style, on the other we have hymn books in which only the melody was written, and which carried the noble old tunes to every hearth and home throughout Protestant Germany. The First House hymn book appeared a short while before Luther's church book. It was compiled by Luther's friend, Justus Jonas, and was called the Erfurt Echeridion. Among the hymns contained in it, were two old Latin hymns, already mentioned in a previous chapter, the Veni Redemptor Gentium by St. Ambrose, and the Media in Vita by Notke Balbulus, both, of course, done into German. An interesting collection was published in Frankfurt in 1571, with the preface, Street songs, cavalier songs, and mountain songs transformed into Christian and moral songs, for the abolishing in the course of time of the bad and vexatious practice of singing idle and shameful songs in the streets, in fields and at home, by substituting for them good, sacred and honest words. The chorale melodies indeed became the property of the Germans. They were coloured with the sentiment of a whole race. They took on a nobility and a dignity. They seemed to germinate new life, and finally, they became the glory of a lofty art, based on the skill of the Netherlanders, modified and adorned according to a new style soon to be perfected by the Italians, and infused with rich, warm life, flowing from the very hearts of the German people. The Protestant Reformation did not then at once alter the form of church music in Germany. Other influences sprung from Catholic Italy were to be far more powerful in that respect. Even the tendency toward harmonic writing, toward emphasising the progression of chords rather than the interweaving of melodies, which the chorale melodies undoubtedly furthered, was a tendency very evident in Italian church music of the time, notably at Venice, was indeed a mark of the time. The true significance of the Lutheran reform in the history of music is that it laid music open to a flood of genuine strong feeling, personal, intimate, intensely human feeling, which, little by little during the next two centuries, in spite of the horror and agony of persecution and warfare, permeated every vein and artery of music, and filled them with vital warmth and glowing colour. During the Thirty Years' War, only the hymn and the chorale melody escaped destruction in Germany, and these survived because they were actually a part of the people, and could cease to exist only when the race had been stamped out. In France and in England, the Protestant movement had far less influence upon music than in Germany. In France, this seems to be explained by the fact that the French had not, like the Germans, a literature of native hymns, but had to construct their hymn book from the Psalter, 
and that they had a more slender stock of genuine folk song to draw upon. Zwingli, the leader of the Swiss Reformation, which was to win the support of the Frenchman Calvin, was not in favour of music, and his followers were ruthless in their destruction of organs and collections of music. Calvin, on the other hand, had in regard to music more the point of view of Luther. He drew freely from the Lutheran hymn books, both melodies and words, but especially in favour of metrical versions of the Psalms. These were set to music often excellent and finely harmonised. Among the Calvinistic psalm writers, Clément Marot is most famous. It was he who, as court poet to Francis I, made several versions of the psalms into the styles of ballads, which won great popularity by their novelty and were set to gay tunes and sung by the people at court. Subsequently, in forced exile at Geneva, he added 19 more to the collection of 30 he had already written, and these were later supplemented and arranged in final form by Théodore de Beza. Most conspicuous among the musicians connected with the movement in France were Lois Bourgeois and Claude Goudemel. The latter may have been a Netherlander and a pupil of Josquin, and he was killed in the massacre of St. Bartholomew in Lyon, 1572. Bourgeois composed many melodies himself to the Calvinistic hymns and set them more or less simply in four parts. Gudemel, on the other hand, composed elaborate settings in the style of motets with the melody, seldom his own, in the tenor. The English, like the French, relied upon metrical versions of the Psalms for their hymn books. Furthermore, the beginning of the Reformation in England was complicated with political motives and the movement was, for a long time, simply a break from the Church of Rome, rather than an outburst of religious convictions. Yet, after the suppression of monasteries between 1536 and 1540, there was something of the same destruction of organs and music which had wrought such havoc in Switzerland, and a general condemnation of elaborate church service. The first attempt at hymn tunes was the Gusli Psalms of Coverdale, drawn largely from Lutheran sources. Under Edward VI, 1547 to 1553, began the organisation of the Anglican Church and the drafting of liturgies in English. The movement was checked by the reign of Mary, but under Elizabeth resulted in a standard ritual which called forth the best musical genius of the country. An elaborate setting of the canticles, etc., used in morning and evening prayer, was encouraged and a new art form, the musical flower of the English Reformation, the anthem, resulted from the setting of the variable portions of these services. The great spirit of the Italian Renaissance, which was essentially a spirit of freedom and joy in individuality, thus took shape in Germany, England and France, and laid a hand upon music as it had already done in Italy. On every hand it scatters its seeds, which will take root and later flower. Elements of form and design, rich chromatic alterations of harmony, splendid dramatic effects of answering double choirs, are woven into the intricate web of Netherland polyphonic music, touching it with colour and fire, making it fertile with new and vast developments. But all is gradual. The art grows slowly and only slowly changes. Amid the turbulent restlessness, the experiment and daring, the old ideal, the ideal of the monasteries and the great cathedrals still awaits perfection. The touch of La Sue and of Palestrina. We have seen that Petrucci's first publication of 1501 contained 96 pieces, most of which were by Ockergum, Hobrecht, Joskan, Isaac and others, such as Giselan, La Rue, Alexander Agricola, Brumel, Krain, by far the most part Netherlanders. This was in Venice. We need no further evidence of the popularity of the Netherland art in Italy. The Netherland style had become by this time the standard style of Europe, and during the first quarter of the 16th century, Netherlanders still held sway over the development of music. There were pupils of Josquin in the Netherlands, in France, in Spain, in Italy, and in Germany. His music flowed over the face of Europe, and his art penetrated to all the courts and into all the cathedrals, and upon all his pupils the spirit of the Renaissance was at work. Thousands of madrigals, of love songs, drinking songs and hunting songs, 
came crowding from their pens and jostled masses and motets in confusion. Program music was in the air, songs of battle, songs of gossiping women, of birds, of shepherds and of shepherdesses. It is hardly surprising that music for the church began to take on colours more and more brilliant. It is more surprising that the old ideal of exalted polyphony still endured and still called men to its standard. Some of the pupils of Josquin are worthy of separate mention. Perhaps the most distinguished of them was Nicolas Gombert. He was a Netherlander by birth. We find him in the service of the Sovereign of the Netherlands, later in the Royal Chapel at Brussels. In 1530, he was master of the boys at the Imperial Chapel in Madrid, and afterward probably first master in the same chapel. In 1556, he was back in his own country again, where a few years after, he died. A large number of his works, from special editions of the 16th century, have come down to us, and some of his manuscripts, like so many other treasures of this period, are in the Munich Library. His work for the church is characterised by a gentle, harmonious beauty, and Fertis called him the predecessor of Palestrina, especially on account of a beautiful Pater Noster, which is marked by a lofty religious sentiment. He was very successful as a composer of motets, and in his secular works showed a tendency toward tone colour effects, programme music, especially in his chansons Le Berger à la Bergère and Le Chant des Roisseaux. Benedictus Ducis, another Netherlander and pupil of Josquin, born at Bruges in 1480, was distinguished by the musical brotherhood of Antwerp by being elected Prince of the Guild, the highest honour an artist could achieve at that time in the Netherlands. Leaving Antwerp in 1515, he appears to have visited Henry VIII of England and later to have been in Germany. There is some difficulty in distinguishing the works of Ducis from those of Benedictus Appenzelde, owing to the peculiar custom of the time of signing manuscripts only with the Christian name. It is generally conceded, however, that Ducis composed a funeral ode on the death of his master, Josquin, also a motet for eight parts, Pecantum me quotidie, passion music, and settings of the Psalms, the earnestness and nobility of which justify his fame. Jean Mouton, another pupil, was born probably near Metz in Lorraine, became chapel singer to Louis XII and Francis I of France, then canon of Terouan and afterward of Saint Quentin. His works show him to be a master of counterpoint and a worthy pupil of Josquin. Petrucci printed five of his masses in 1508 and later more than twenty of his motets, and Atteignon included his compositions in the third book of a famous collection of masses published in 1532, and also in a collection of motets which appeared somewhat earlier. A few masses in manuscript are in the Munich Library. A large number of his motets have been preserved, justly valued for their artistic and effective qualities, which in some instances closely resemble those of his master. His pupil, Adrian Willert, was one of the most gifted and one of the most influential composers of the next generation. He may be regarded as the founder of the Venetian school of composers, who played such a brilliant part in the history of music during the 16th century, who were experimenters and innovators, whose energy opened many a new channel to the course of music. The influence of Josquin thus passed to Venice. Adrian Willert, born probably in 1490 at Roulers in Belgium, first studied law in Paris. Afterward, he adopted music as his profession and became a pupil of Jean Mouton. In 1516, we find him travelling in Italy, visiting Rome, Venice, and Ferrara. There is a story to the effect that in Rome he heard a motet of his, the Verbum Dulce et Suave, sung by the papal choir, whose members believed it to have been written by Josquin, and that they refused to sing it again when they discovered it to be by an unknown composer. If this story be true, it may be added here that Willett lived to see the day when his compositions were considered entirely worthy of attention, even from the most distinguished body of singers in Christendom. That time was not yet come, however. Willett left Italy, taking service as chapel master to King Ludwig II, ruler of Hungary and Bavaria, but in 1526 he was back again in Venice, where in the following year he received the appointment as first chapel master of the Basilica of St. Mark, 
at a salary of 70 ducats, about $160. This was later increased to 200 ducats, about $460, which was considered a princely income. For 35 years, the master kept at his post, although twice during that time, once in 1542 and again in 1556, a longing for his native country drew him back to Belgium. It was his hope, indeed, to spend his last years in Bruges, but he had taken root too firmly in Italy. Friends, admirers, and patrons urged him to remain in Venice, and it was there in 1562 that he died. The Basilica of St. Mark was already ancient when Willert came to Venice. Founded in 830 to receive the relics of the second evangelist brought from Alexandria, rebuilt 150 years later, it had received its permanent form about the middle of the 11th century. Five hundred years had but increased its beauty and added mellowness and historic interest to its charm. Externally, its domes and pinnacles, its encrusted marbles and pillars, its bronze horses and many-coloured arches constitute a unique and splendid monument of history. Within its walls, statues, columns, crowned with capitals from Greece and Byzantium, and rich mosaics blend in a beauty at once impressive and magnificent. The interior is not large, 205 by 164 feet, but it is particularly well adapted to the use of the two organs which are placed opposite each other. This circumstance suggested to Willett the device of dividing his choir so as to contrast the mass effect of the united voices with antiphonal singing. With this device, happily carried into effect, there developed in time, under Willett's hands, a new style of composition for two choirs. It was this style which continued in vogue for more than a century, and formed the standard and became the peculiar characteristic of the Venetian school. In his early experiments with the divided choir, Willett made use of the Psalms, whose poetical form, with the parallel half-verses and refrains, seemed especially adapted to antiphonal rendering. Following these, he composed hymns and masses, not after the manner of the eight- or ten-part compositions known in the Netherlands, but works specially adapted to the double choir, each part complete in itself, each combining with or opposing the other, and yet creating an impression of unity and centralization. This was actually a new artistic creation, and by reason of it, Willett became almost the idol of the Venetians. They called his lovely music liquid gold, adapted his name to Messer Adriano, honoured him with verses and public addresses, and, in his old age, besought him to leave his ashes to the city in which his artistic triumphs had been achieved. Willett's experiments with double choir effects had a profound and lasting influence upon the development of music. In the first place, owing to this, devices of imitation and canonic progression which had so long been the most prominent feature of ecclesiastical and secular music became secondary in importance to chord progressions. The reason is obvious. To get the best effect with two answering choirs, the section which each sings must not be long and complicated, but relatively short and clear-cut. Otherwise the effect of balance or of echo is lost and in these relatively short sections there is hardly time to accomplish elaborate polyphonic development. Even if there were, the polyphonic effects are far too subtle to be easily recognised in echo or answer. The tendency in writing music for two choirs was therefore toward a simple style, clearly balanced, with certain definite harmonic relationships, which could not fail to be recognised when repeated. The composers of the Venetian school were almost within reach of the harmonic idea of music, which rose clearly to supremacy only late in the next century. They were already breaking away from the ecclesiastical modes, not only by thus trying to write in a simple harmonic style, which was founded nearly on our ideas of tonic and dominant, but also by enriching their harmonies with chromatic variations. Willett thus stands out as one of the founders of what has been called the coloristic or chromatic school of the 16th century. In his music, and even more in the music of his followers, the old modes are constantly altered, and with them the practice of musica ficta, already mentioned, reaches its height. It meant the crumbling of the model system. It must not, however, be supposed that Willett abandoned entirely the traditions of the Netherlanders, and that he gave up writing in the complicated style altogether. 
he indeed employed imitation and canon, but more casually, often only at the entrance of short alternating sections. His voice parts then proceeded in solid chord pillars, as Nauman has happily said, in a style markedly in advance of the old contrapuntal conceptions. In him, therefore, we have a brilliant example of the old style worked upon new impulses, by the spirit of the Renaissance, the desire for rich colour and varied, beautiful form. Willett was an industrious composer, and his works go far toward making the period from 1450 to 1550 the golden century of the Netherlands. Masses, motets, psalms and hymns, madrigals and canzone are all well represented. One unusual composition for five voices, in the form of a narrative based on the Bible story Susanna, seems like an early prophecy of the sacred cantata, although the treatment is severely hymn-like and not dramatic. As a writer of madrigals and of frottele, Willett's position is discussed in another chapter, though it may be said in passing that in these, as in his sacred music, his individuality is marked and his knowledge and musical skill evident. Though a northerner by birth, Willett became the founder of a school characteristically Italian, and his work seemed to his contemporaries to embody the very spirit of Venetian life, in its richness and variety. He brought to the Italians the inheritance of the Netherland art, turned it into new and interesting channels, and revealed to later masters what possibilities of colour lay hidden under the strictness of its laws. Upon the death of Willett, his pupil Cipriano di Rore was appointed to the high office at St. Mark's, Works of de Rore, including madrigals, motets, masses, psalms, and a passion according to St. John, were held in high esteem by his contemporaries, especially in Munich, where they were frequently performed under the direction of Lassou. Duke Albert of Bavaria caused a handsome copy of a collection of his church compositions, graced by a portrait of the composer, to be placed in the Munich library, where it still remains. Following de Rore at St. Mark's, came Giuseppe Zalino, a member of the Order of Franciscan Monks, also a pupil of Willert, and a theorist of great importance. Few of his compositions have survived, but his theoretical writing, Instituzione Armoniche, Dimostrazione Armoniche, and Supplementi Musicali, remain in an edition of Zalino's collected works, published in four volumes in 1589. There are also in manuscript French, German and Dutch translations of the Instituzioni, which contain, besides an important discussion of the third and the major and minor consonant triad, a clear explanation of double counterpoint in the octave, twelfth and in contrary motion, of canon and double canon in the unison, octave and upper and under fifth, with numerous examples based upon the same cantus firmus. Baldassaro Donati and Giovanni della Croce, both distinguished musicians, in turn succeeded Zarlino as Maestro di Capella at St. Mark's. Elsewhere in Italy, important composers appear, native Italians who bring the Netherland art the Italian gift of melody and sweetness. Constanzo Festa, a Florentine, occupies an especially important place. Riemann says of him, he can be looked upon as the predecessor of Palestrina, with whose style his own has many points of similarity. He was the first Italian contrapuntist of importance, and gives a foretaste of the beauties which were to spring from the union of Netherland art with Italian feeling for euphony and melody. Constanzo Porta, a pupil of Willett, was successfully maestro of the Franciscan monastery at Padua, and of churches at Ravenna, Ostimo, and Loreto. Gafori, or Gafurius, 1451-1522, cantor and master of the boys at Milan Cathedral, left many theoretical writings of great value. Arkadelt, already mentioned as a writer of madrigals, composed a volume of masses, published both in Venice and by Ballard and Leroy in Paris in 1557. Jacob Clemens, better known by the name of Clemens non Papa, to distinguish him from the Pope, a fact which attests in a jocular way his popularity, was a Netherlander, and one of the most famous composers of the epoch between Josquin and Palestrina, 
leaving to posterity a large number of masses, motets, and chansons, besides four books of hymns and psalms, the melodies of which were taken from Netherland folk song. Meantime in Germany, we find also musicians of distinction, though as yet none of the very first rank. One of the oldest of these was Adam von Fulda, a learned monk, known both as a composer and theorist, and the author of at least one highly esteemed motet, O Vera Lux et Gloria. Heinrich Fink, Thomas Stolzer, Ludwig Senfel, and Heinrich Isaac all deserve an honourable place in the history of German music of the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Isaac, though for some time considered German, was born in the Netherlands, probably about 1450, and was one of the most learned of the contemporaries of Josquin. He lived for a time in Ferrara, afterward becoming organist at the court of Lorenzo the Magnificent. From this post he went to Rome, and finally entered the service of the Emperor Maximilian I at Vienna. Petrucci printed five of his masses in 1506, and included many of his other compositions in collections published early in the century. Manuscript works are in the Munich, Brussels and Vienna libraries. His part songs were considered models of their kind, and are not lacking in interest even today. It is to Isaac we are indebted for the lovely Innsbruck Ich muss dich lassen, used as a hymn by the followers of Luther and by Sebastian Bach in the St. Matthew Passion. Ludwig Senfel, born 1492, died about 1555, a pupil and the successor of Isaac at the court chapel of Maximilian I at Vienna, was later chapelmaster at Munich. According to Riemann, Senfel was one of the most distinguished, if not the most important, of the German contrapuntists of the 16th century. He is further remembered as a friend of Luther. A great number of his compositions are preserved, among them being masses, motets, odes, songs, and hymns for congregational singing. The work of the brilliant Clermont Jeannequin in Paris was largely secular, and will be treated in another chapter. It may be remarked in passing that types of composition perfected by him were to have great influence upon instrumental music before the end of the century. In England, John Merbeck died 1585, Christopher Tye died 1572, Thomas Tallis died 1585, and William Byrd died 1623, match the Netherlands in skill and bring to their music not only the spirit of the new age, but the peculiar melodiousness which has always characterised English music. The works of Tallis became great favourites, and in the famous English collections of music for the Virginals, toward the end of the century, several of his vocal works appear as transcriptions. Bird must be ranked as one of the most daring composers of the time. Though he conformed to the new religion, he remained at heart a Catholic, and his great works are akin to those of the greatest Catholic composers on the continent. He has indeed been called the Lasso of England. Here too must be mentioned, though belonging almost more to the next century, Thomas Morley, died 1602, John Dowland, died 1626, and perhaps the greatest of all English composers except Henry Purcell, Orlando Gibbons, died 1625. All these men were composing at the end of the century, especially madrigals and other secular forms, famous not only for their great technical skill, but for their remarkable sweetness and expressiveness. They were all, moreover, skillful instrumentalists, and brought music for the harpsichord to a state far advanced beyond anything on the continent. John Bull, died 1628, was not only a master of the art of counterpoint, but a virtuoso on both organ and harpsichord whose match could be found only in Andrea and Giovanni Gabrielli in Venice. Everywhere the Renaissance spirit was at work, but prosperous Venice stands out clearly as the centre of the new movement which so coloured and remodelled music. Effects of double choirs, chromatic harmonies, tendencies toward definiteness of form, and even the combination of voices and instruments within the church itself, all marks of the changes which were affecting the development of music all signs of the liberation of music from the sway of the church and of its closer relationship with passionate active life are first found in the works of the composers who were connected with St. Mark's Cathedral. 
but these men were really pioneers, and the results of their innovations, though radical and far-reaching, were hardly foreseen. They sowed seeds, so to speak, which were to grow and flower long after their death. We have now to consider how the art of the Netherlanders grew to a present perfection in the works of two men, Orlando di Lasso and Pierluigi da Palestrina, both of whom, but particularly the latter, pursued an ideal untouched by the modern forces playing upon music about them, an ideal which, moreover, they attained, and by attaining, brought to an end the first great period in the history of European music. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Art of Music, Volume 1, The Pre-Classic Periods. Editor-in-Chief, Daniel Gregory Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Militia. Orlando de Lasso was born in the town of Mons, in I know, probably in 1530. The Flemish form of the name, Roland de Latre, seems to have been abandoned early in favour of the Italian. The fate of the musically gifted boy, both during and long after the Middle Ages, was a choir school, and accordingly Orlando was entered as chorister in the local church of St. Nicholas. A writer named Van Crickelberg, giving an account of Lasso in 1565, says that he quickly came to a good understanding of music, and that the beauty of his voice caused him to be twice stolen from the school in which he lived with the other choristers. Twice also his good parents rescued him, but finally, at the age of twelve, he became attached to the suite of Ferdinand of Gonzaga, viceroy of Sicily, with whom he travelled to Italy. Orlando stayed for some time in Naples, Rome and Milan, continuing his studies, and then seems to have undertaken a long journey through France and England. By the year 1555 he was settled in Antwerp, and rather widely known as a composer. Two years later, Albert V, Duke of Bavaria, called him to serve as chamber musician at his court in Munich. Duke Albert was a liberal man, a connoisseur of art, and oddly enough, a man of some fame both in the athletic and in the religious world. He founded the famous Royal Library of Munich, to which we have had frequent occasion to refer, and enriched it during his lifetime with many valuable manuscripts and objects of art. At first, Lasso, being unfamiliar with the German language, filled rather a subordinate position among the Duke's musicians, but in 1562 he was appointed master of the chapel, which included both the choir and an orchestra. From this year on, up to the time when the illness attacked him which resulted in his death, his career was one of ever-increasing success and prosperity. He was called the Prince of Musicians. In 1570 he was ennobled by the Emperor Maximilian II, and in the year following, Pope Gregory XIII decorated him with the Order of the Golden Spur. On visiting Paris, he was received with great favour by King Charles IX, while at home Duke Albert assured him his salary for life, and appointed three of his sons to honourable positions in the chapel. The successor of Albert, Duke Wilhelm II, not only confirmed Lasso in his position, but presented him, in appreciation of his services, with a house and garden, and also made suitable provision for his wife. Neither the favour of royalty, nor the admiration of princes, however, could render him immune to ill fortune. His last few years were clouded by mental trouble and melancholia. In June 1594 he died, and was buried in the cemetery of the Franciscans. The monastery has been destroyed, but the monument to Lasso was preserved and now stands in the garden of the Academy of Fine Art in Munich. Although the name of Lasso is not well known to the world today as that of Palestrina, his career was a remarkable one. In the oft-mentioned Munich Library, among other works of the master, is a manuscript copy of his most famous work, the Penitential Psalms, written between 1562 and 1565, but not published until some time later. At the performance of these psalms, Duke Albert was so impressed and affected that he caused a manuscript copy to be made and placed in his library. It was richly ornamented by the court painter Hans Mielich and other artists, and magnificently bound in leather. 
Duke Albert was perhaps an exceptional patron. But granting that to be the case, Lasso's career shows how honourable was the position held by a musician in his century. In the Duke's chapel were upward of 90 singers and players, several of them composers of merit, all of them musicians of ability. The choir's singing was well balanced and correct in pitch, even through the longest compositions. The general order of the ducal service was for the wind and brass instruments of the orchestra to accompany the mass on Sundays and festival days, and on the occasion of a banquet, to play during the earlier courses of the dinner. The strings, under Morari as conductor, then enlivened the remainder of the feast until the dessert, when Lasso and his choir of picked voices would finish the entertainment with quartets, trios, or pieces for the full choir. For chamber music, all the instruments would combine. The Duke and his family were keenly interested in Lasso's work, passionately fond of music in itself, and proud of the celebrity of their chapel master. It is one of the instances where reverence and appreciation came to the artist during his lifetime, and it is not to be doubted that these fortunate circumstances had a tremendous influence on the master's work. His industry and fertility were prodigious. Compositions amounting to 2,000 or more are accredited to him. Masses, motets, magnificats, passion music, frottole, chansons and psalms. There are 230 madrigals alone. Following the lead of Willett, he sometimes used the divided choir and composed for it, and also showed himself not indifferent to the growing taste of psalm singing. The seven penitential psalms, composed at the Duke's request, are for five voices, some numbers with two separate movements for each verse, the final movement, sic erat, for six voices. Each psalm is a composition of some length, though modern ideas as to their tempi, and therefore as to the time required for their performance, show considerable variation. It is not true that Lasso composed the penitential psalms to soothe the remorse of Charles IX after the massacre of St. Bartholomew, but it is more than probable that they were sung before that unhappy monarch, and his musical sense must indeed have been dull if he found no consolation and hope expressed in them. This is no everyday music, which may charm at all seasons or in all moods, but there are times when we find ourselves forgetting the antique forms of expression, passing the strange combination of sounds, almost losing ourselves in a new-found grave delight, till the last few moments of the psalm, always of a more vigorous character, gradually recall us as from a beautiful dream, which, waking, we can scarce remember. So unobtrusive is its character that we can fancy the worshippers hearing it by the hour, passive rather than active listeners, with no thought of the human mind that fashioned its form. Yet the art is there, for there is no monotony in the sequence of the movements. Each variety that can be naturally obtained by changes of key, contrasted effects of repose and activity, or distribution of voices, are here. But these changes are so quietly and naturally introduced, and the startling contrast, now called dramatic, so entirely avoided, that the composer's part seems only to have been to deliver faithfully a divine message, without attracting notice to himself. De Lasso's secular compositions are placed by critics almost unanimously, even above his ecclesiastical work. The madrigals and chansons reveal force and variety of treatment, both experiments with chromatics, a freer modulation, and a keen sympathy for the popular elements of music. Lasso shed luster on, and at the same time closed, the great epoch of the Belgian ascendancy, which during the space of 200 years had given to the world nearly 300 musicians of marvellous science. The decline and fall of the Netherlands school, which began with the death of its last great master, Lasso, are ascribed by Fetis to the political disturbances and wars of the 16th and succeeding centuries but it seems more probable that these intricacies of the contrapuntal art created a desire for simpler methods. The genius of Italy and Germany, upon whose soil the last Netherland masters flourished, supplied the very qualities which brought the art to perfection. It has already been related how, even as early as 1322, the liberties which careless, ignorant, or sacrilegious singers took with the Roman service had called forth denunciations from the papal chair, the genius of the Netherlands schools, dominating church music as it did for a space of 200 years, 
was, like Janus, two-faced. On the other hand, it developed a musical technique so complete and perfect in form that any further progress without an entire change of principle seemed impossible, and, on the other, it fostered a dry mathematical correctness that led, at its worst, to an utter disregard of expression and feeling. Only the genius of a Josquin or a Lasso rendered learning subservient to beauty of expression and carried out the true mission of art. In Rome, however, no master had yet appeared who was great enough to force into the background all the unsanctioned innovations by which unscrupulous musicians sought to reach the popular taste. From the time of the return of the popes from Avignon, 1377, Roman church music had been a continual source of dissatisfaction to the curia. As had been pointed out, the plain chant became more and more overladen with contrapuntal embellishments. The mass, sometimes exhibited a laboured canon, worked over a long, slow cantus firmus, the different voices singing different sets of words entirely unconnected with each other. Sometimes again the ritual was enlivened by texts beginning with the words baiser moi, adieu mes amours, or the much tortured homme armé, of which the tunes were as worldly as the text. If these objections were lacking, another was likely to be present in the absurdly elaborate style which rendered the words of so little importance that they might as well not have existed at all. The mass, bristling with inept and distracting artifices, had lost all relation to the service it was supposed to illustrate. It was usual for the most solemn phrases of the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, or Agnus Dei to blend along the aisles of the Basilica with the unedifying refrains of the lewd chansons of Flanders and Provence. In this manner, the beautiful ritual was either degraded by pedants into a mere learned conundrum, or by idlers into a sacrilegious and profane exercise and the reproofs of popes and councils had so far not availed to keep out these signs of deterioration, much less to lift church music to the level of the sister arts. In this situation, the Council of Trent was forced to recognise the degradation of music and to take up the question of a thorough and complete reform. In 1564, Pope Pius IV authorised a commission of eight cardinals to carry out the resolution of the council, whose complaints were mainly upon the two points indicated above. First, the melodies of the Canti Fermi were not only secular, but sung to secular words, while the other parts often sang something else. Secondly, the style had become so excessively florid as to obscure the words, even when suitable, and render them of no account. Some of the members of the council, it is claimed, declared that it was better to forbid polyphony altogether than to suffer the existing abuses to continue. In the passionate desire for the purification of the ritual, even Josquin's works had been abandoned, not because of any lack of admiration for them, but because he shared necessarily in the general condemnation of all music not Gregorian. A modest and devoted composer, however, had already attracted the attention of two of the members of the Pope's commission, Cardinals Borromeo and Vitellozzi, and it was to him they now turned in their need. Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina was born in 1526, of humble parentage in Preneste, or Palestrina, a town in the Campania four hours from Rome. Early in life he came to the imperial city, studied with one of the excellent masters resident there, and then returned to his native town to become organist in the cathedral. In 1547, he married the daughter of a tradesman, by whom he had several children. In 1551, Pope Julius III called him to Rome as choir master of the St. Julia Chapel at St. Peter's, where he succeeded Archidelt. Three years later, after the publication of a volume of masses dedicated to the Pope, Palestrina received an appointment as singer in the papal choir. He had a poor voice, he was a layman, and married. Each one of these reasons was sufficient, according to the constitution of the Roman college, to forbid his appointment, and Palestrina hesitated in his acceptance of the post. Not wishing, however, to offend his powerful patron, and naturally desirous of obtaining a permanent position, 
he resigned his office at the St. Julia Chapel and entered the pontifical choir. This appointment was supposed to be for life, and the young singer may well have felt discouraged when, after four years, a reforming pope, Paul IV, dismissed him with two other married men. In place of his salary as singer, the Pope awarded him a pension of six scudi, less than six dollars, a month. With a wife and family, such a reduction of income seemed nothing less than ruin to Palestrina, and stricken with nervous fever, he took to his bed. A little more courage, however, might have served him better, for his dismissal did not spell ruin. In two months he was invited to fill the post of choirmaster at the Lateran, and his fortunes again brightened. He was able to keep his pension, together with the salary accorded him in his new position. After six years, he was transferred to the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore, where he remained for ten years, his monthly salary being about $16. In 1571, he was reappointed to his old office of chapelmaster at the Vatican. Palestrina was chapelmaster at the Santa Maria Maggiore at the time of the appointment of the Commission for the Reform of Church Music. The cardinals Borromeo and Vitellozzi, both active members, recommended that one more trial be made to harmonise religious requirements with the better taste of the people. A story has prevailed for centuries that Palestrina was requested to write a mass which should serve as a model of what the music of the sacred office should be, and that he submitted three works, which were first performed with great care at the house of Cardinal Vitellozzi before a group of clergy and singers. There was an immediate and enthusiastic verdict in favour of the compositions. The first two were good and were sufficiently praised, but the third, the Missa Papai Marcelli, as it was afterward called in honour of an earlier pope, was felt to be the epitome of all that was noble and dignified in ecclesiastical music, the crown and glory of the service itself. It was sung in the papal chapel in 1565. In appreciation of the noble work, Palestrina was made official composer to the pontifical choir, a post created especially for him, and succeeding popes confirmed him in his office as long as he lived. The story of the commission of cardinals and the musical reforms instituted by the Council of Trent has been so emphasised by some historians as to represent Palestrina as the saviour without whose services church music would virtually have ceased to exist. Such a view, however, requires some modification. Church music was not saved by Palestrina in any such sense, though its debt to him is nevertheless almost inestimable. There was never any intention on the part of the cardinals to abolish it altogether from the church, but they had long been seeking a form and a style which should be intelligible, acceptable both to the devotee and the layman of cultivated musical taste, and suitable to the office which it holds in the sacred service. Ambrose goes so far as to deny that there was any cause for such wholesale purification, but in view of the fact cited, this is evidently an error. That the evil was widespread is proved by the action that provincial synods took in following the example of the Council of Trent, Milan and Cambrai in 1565, Constance and Augsburg in 1567, Naumur and Mechlin in 1570. From the time of Josquin, Attempts had been made by one and another of the masters mentioned in this chapter to make a more suitable connection between text and melody, to simplify the contrapuntal writing, and to put expression into their art. To some extent, as has been seen, they accomplished their purpose. Josquin, Festa, Gombert, Morales, Rore, and especially Willett and Lasso, have all left evidences of their noble endeavour in this direction. It was left to Palestrina, however, to achieve a high level of style, the excellence of which was reached by the other masters only in isolated instances, and to prove to the cardinals that the music of the church could be lifted to its true dignity. He differs not in form, but in aesthetic principle, from his contemporaries, but it is precisely that difference which raised Palestrina to the pinnacle of fame. The outward facts of his later life offer little that need detain the reader. Among his patrons were popes and princes, but they did not on the whole distinguish themselves by kindness or generosity to the musician. Jealousy among members of the choir with which he was so long connected was a constant source of unpleasantness, 
and his faithful work was meagerly rewarded. His largest regular earnings amounted to something like $30 a month, and he apparently never dreamed of any revenue from the sale of his works. Indeed, it is unlikely that any very substantial reward ever came to him, with his added honours as a composer. Neither could he have added much to his gains by teaching, for in the whole course of his life he taught but seven private pupils, three of whom were his own sons. Continuous poverty was accompanied by domestic griefs of the deepest kind. Three sons, all giving promise of inheriting the father's intellect and genius, died one after another. The wife, with whom he was especially happy, died in 1580, and the one remaining son became a profligate and worthless spendthrift. It may be added that not long after the death of his first wife he married a wealthy widow, and so was well provided for till the end of his life. One event in the master's life stands out in contrast to the general sadness. In 1575, the year of Jubilee, 1500 singers belonging to two confraternities of his native town made a pilgrimage to Rome, and utilised the occasion to do him honour. Dividing themselves into three choruses, with priests, laymen, boys and women among their number, and with Palestrina himself at their head, they entered Rome in a solemn and ceremonial procession, singing the music of their great townsmen. This was perhaps the only public honour Palestrina received during his lifetime. Among the friends of his later life were St. Filippo Neri, his confessor, a favourite pupil named Giudetti, Ippolito d'Este, and Giacomo Buoncompagni, a nephew of Pope Gregory XIII. The activity of his early years continued almost to the very end. The record of the second half of his life is but a long catalogue of his publications. Whole collections of magnificent works were dedicated to popes, cardinals or princes, some of whom returned the honour with scant courtesy. The last of these was a collection of thirty Magdigali Spirituali for five voices, in honour of the Virgin, dedicated to the Grand Duchess of Tuscany, wife of Ferdinand de Medici. Baini and Dr. Burney are full of praises for these last productions. While he was eagerly at work on another volume, Seven Masses to be dedicated to Pope Clement VII, he was taken ill and died, February 2nd, 1594, comforted and cared for to the end, not by his mean and worthless son, but by his saintly friend, Filippo Neri. By order of the Curia, he was buried with all the honour of a cardinal or prince in the Basilica of the Vatican, while the citizens of Rome, high and low, followed him in sorrow to his grave. The immense number of Palestrina's works is astonishing even in that age of prodigious workers. The list appended to a prospectus of a proposed selected edition of his works mentions 93 masses, 119 motets, 45 hymns, 68 offertories, three volumes of Lamentations, of Litanies three books, of Magnificates two books, of Madrigals four books, all of which are but a portion of his labours. The Mass for Holy Thursday, Fratres Ego Enim Acepi, the Mass for the Assumption of the Virgin, Assumpta Est Maria in Celum, the Motet, Surge Illuminare Jerusalem, and the Stabat Mater for two choirs are still in use in the papal chapel. The Improperia, Reproaches of the Lord to an Ungrateful People, performed for the first time in 1560, immediately obtained a great renown, and were added at once by Pope Pius IV to the collection of the Apostolic Chapel. This work has also been repeated in the Sistine Chapel yearly on Good Friday up to the present time. Its performance made a profound impression upon both Goethe and Mendelssohn. The latter thus describes the singing of the pontifical choristers in the rendition of this work. They understood how to bring out and place each delicate trait in the most favourable light, without giving it due prominence, one chord gently melted into another. The ceremony at the same time is solemn and imposing. Deep silence prevails in the chapel, only broken by the re-echoing holy, sung by unvarying sweetness and expression. The Missa Papai Marcelli, which proved so important an instrument in the history of church music, is written for six voices, soprano, alto, 
two tenors and two basses. Immediately upon its production, its popularity became very great. Cardinals quoted poetry in its praise. The Pope commanded that a special performance be given in the Apostolic Chapel, and that it be transcribed into the chapel collection in unusually large characters. Baini compares its grandeur to that of 33rd Canto of the Inferno. Curious legends as to its origin sprang up, and unauthorised arrangements went through several editions. A poor adaptation for four voices was made by Enerio, and others for eight and twelve voices by other followers of the Roman school. It is perhaps the best known example of the celebrated Palestrina style. In a classification of Palestrina's work, the German writer Hauptmann distinguishes three styles, corresponding generally to the master's very early, adolescent, and mature years. The first shows markedly the influence of his Netherland predecessors and teachers. The melodies move along independently, without melting into chords, and the predominating character is fugal and canonic. In this phase of his work, he was still influenced by the evil fashion of the period, which for the most part subordinated the true meaning of the music to the display of contrapuntal science. This quality is shown occasionally also in later compositions, as, for example, in the mass with the well-worn L'Homme Armé theme, wherein he boldly met the Flemish composers on their own ground, and proved that he could write as learned counterpoint as they. In these examples, he seems intentionally to have adopted the florid style of his predecessors, overlaying the theme with erudite contrapuntal figures, and rendering it elaborate and difficult. The mass... Assumpta est Maria, may be said to illustrate the second style, which is in marked contrast to his preceding work. The music is much less elaborate, the voices proceeding for the most part simultaneously in smoothly flowing phrases. The third, that known as the Palestrina style, illustrated so famously by the Pope Marcellus Mass, is a combination of all that was best in the Netherland and Italian schools. It is a vocal style in simple counterpoint, mostly note against note, with only a moderate use of imitation, and an avoidance of chromatics, violent contrasts, and everything approaching the dramatic. At first he followed the custom of using secular tunes for sacred works, but in his best period he almost invariably employed the ancient plainsong melodies in connection with the proper sacred text. Many of his canti fermi are placed in the soprano instead of the tenor voice, Strict attention is shown to syllabic declamation, and to a simple, singable arrangement of the voice parts, which is frequently based upon a succession of pure triads. The harmony is gentle and serene, and the devices for obtaining contrasts and tone colour are conspicuous by their absence, while the whole is imbued with sincerity, devotion, and a great sense of beauty. Thibault, a Frenchman, says of him, he is so completely master of the ancient ecclesiastical modes, and of the treatment of the simple triad, that repose and enjoyment are to be found in his works in a greater degree than in those of any other master. Contrasts and similarities between the lives of Di Lasso and Palestrina suggest themselves at once. The one a northerner, aristocratic, famous, successful, rich, welcomed in the most courtly and cultured circles of Europe, encouraged and richly rewarded in all his endeavours. The other, a southerner, poor, burdened with sorrows and difficulties throughout his life, pursuing his calling without regard to favour or disfavour. Yet they were alike in their prodigious activity, in their lovable and gentle natures, and in their devotion to the Catholic Mother Church. Both were rich in genius, the northerner more emotional, more sensuous in harmony, more dramatic, the southerner more calm and serene in the beauty of his work. Palestrina seems to have stood apart, untouched both by the swarming intellectual novelties of the time and by the revolutionary spirit within the church. Great of intellect indeed he must have been, for he conquered a vast field of learning and reached a point where his art was objective, universal and perfect according to its type. With the death of Palestrina, the first great period of what we may call modern music, in distinction from the music of the ancients, which was purely melodic, came practically to perfection, which was an end. 
a few distinguished composers carried on for a while the traditions of the vocal polyphonic style, now perfect, chief among whom were Giovanni Nanino, died 1607, Thomas Luis de Vittoria, died circa 1613, Felice Anerio, died 1614, and Giovanni Anerio, died circa 1620, possibly the brother of Felice. But new and powerful influences were at work to turn men's minds from this perfection, and rapidly so to modify the style itself that the characteristics and the spirit of it vanished. It had grown up within the church. It was apt only to the expression of exalted religious rapture, and even before the century which brought about its flawless perfection, the more passionate spirit of man was seeking to express itself. Such a spirit brought colour and fire and dramatic vigour to music, even to music of the church such as we have seen in Venice, and such emotional force the exquisitely adjusted mechanism of polyphony was in no way suited to express. We must remember that it was essentially religious music, and that pronounced rhythm and sharp dissonances were consciously avoided. Furthermore, that at its best it was to be sung without accompaniment, and that a conjunct, smooth movement of the voice parts was necessary, since singers in choir without accompaniment cannot be sure to sing wide or unnatural intervals exactly. Since rhythm, dissonance, and sudden leaps or turns in melody are the chief means whereby music can express emotional agitation, the Palestrina style was not even remotely suitable to the new and active spirit spread abroad through the influence of the Italian Renaissance, which had discovered new worlds, new arts, new sciences, new life. The delicate and infinitely complicated structure could not but be rent and distorted. Luther with his chorales, the English with their new service and the coming of the Elizabethan age, even Willert in Catholic rich Venice with his two organs and his double choirs, had forecast the end of the Palestrina style. Several features of this marvellous style were destined to disappear simply with the natural growth of music. In the first place, the polyphonic ideal in its highest, strictest sense, the submersion of many melodies in a river of sound in which no melody is evident, the complete suppression of individual personal utterance, was a medieval and essentially intellectual ideal. It could not long maintain its hold against the inborn natural desire of the individual to sing out his own personal feelings, for it meant the suppression of melody, an unnatural restraint. In the second place, from the time when two melodies were first joined, the knowledge and appreciation of harmony were bound to grow. That is, the knowledge of the effect of dissonances and consonances following each other, and it needed but a matter of time for men to come to plan music with the end of producing such effects in a definite sequence. Now in polyphony the consideration of the progression of chords was entirely secondary to the ideal of writing several independent voice parts. Of course the influence of the church mose was strong in delaying the development of the harmonic bases of music. They were iron bands about harmony, and they quite fettered modulation, for it was forbidden to pass in the course of a piece from one mode to another. But here, against the Palestrina style, is related to the scholasticism of the Middle Ages. The ecclesiastical modes were in general closely connected with the philosophy of aesthetics on the one hand, and with mathematics on the other, and all the popular music which has been preserved in the Middle Ages shows an unmistakable and deeply significant choice of those modes only which resemble our own major and minor. In the suppression of individual emotion, in the banishment of rhythm and other active, startling elements of music in order to produce the effect of vagueness and mystery, in the limitation of music to ecclesiastical modes, the Palestrina style is the flower of the spirit of the Middle Ages, of a spirit that in the lifetime of Palestrina himself was already dissipating in thin air. He stands looking backward upon the centuries which had given him birth, while on every hand the activities of man were urging impetuously forward. To the new aims, therefore, we must now turn our attention. End of section 20 Section 21 of The Art of Music, Volume 1, The Pre-Classic Periods Editor-in-Chief, Daniel Gregory Mason This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Militia. The Beginnings of Opera and Oratorio. 
In tracing the genesis of the connection of music with dramatic action, we shall rely upon the delightful and exhaustive study of M. Roland, entitled Et l'Opéra avant l'Opéra, in which he shows our most popular species of musical art to have descended from the pastoral play and the antique drama with music, this in turn to have come out of the sacra rappresentazione, sacred representations, and the magi, the May festivals, which still exist in Italy. The sacred representations, again, were a union of the 14th century devozione, or liturgical plays, dramatizations of the religious offices, and the National Festival of Florence, held in honour of its patron saint, John. These remarkable festivals date back to the 13th century, and were staged so sumptuously and elaborately as to require months of preparation. Research has shown that the words of the sacred plays were at first entirely sung, and by analogy with the traditional May festivals, we are even informed as to the nature of the melodies used. There were traditional cantilena forms for every part of the action, prologues, epilogues, prayers, etc., and we meet already the familiar variety of solo, duet, trio, and semi-choir, even though all the voices sing in unison. Popular songs and dance music were interpolated, as well as tediums and laudi, and the intermezzi, later so popular, were already in evidence. The costuming and personation of characters were consistently carried out, and the properties and mechanical devices, ingegni teatrali, were the creations of the genius of such men as Brunelleschi in Florence and Leonardo da Vinci in Milan. Parallel phenomena are the Marienklagen, existing in Germany from the 14th century on, the music of which was similar to the liturgical chant of the church. We have mentioned the interest which Lorenzo de' Medici took in the carnival celebrations. The sacred representations engaged his attention no less. Following the spirit of the age, he secularised them to some extent, substituting classic myth for Christian allegory. The 15th century saw the spread of humanism in the wake of the revival of learning, and the 16th beheld its ultimate triumph. The theatre felt the effect of the movement no less than architecture and sculpture. The love of show, of rich display, which obsessed the princely despots of the period, coupled with their ardour for the beauties of antiquity, found its expression in the classic tragedies, the comedies and pastoral plays, which now taxed the talents of poets, of painters and of musicians. Far from being exclusive, these spectacles became the popular amusements in such centres as Rome, Urbino, Mantua, Venice and Ferrara. On festival occasions they assumed phenomenal proportions, as for instance at the marriage of Lucrezia Borgia to the son of Hercules d'Esti, when five comedies by Plautus were played in one week in a theatre holding 5,000 spectators. Music always played an essential part in the performance, though mostly in the form of intermedi, which, as they assumed a more independent, dramatic character and developed their dancing features, became in themselves the forerunners of the ballet opera. Notable exceptions, in which the purpose of music was something more than mere relief, were the great poet Poliziano's Orfeo, given in 1474, with music by one Germi, and also a Daphne, produced with music by Gian Pietro della Viola, in 1486, both at Mantua, that same Mantua in which there were to be played 140 years later, the Orfeo of Monteverdi, and the Daphne of Galliano. The coincidence is indeed striking, as is also the fact that the Florentine inventors of opera in 1600 chose as their first themes the same two classic tales. It would be interesting to compare the 1474 version of the perennial and ideal operatic subject, the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, with that of the mighty Gluck, but, alas, the music has not been preserved to us. Mr. W. J. Henderson, who has endeavoured to prove this Orfeo to be the first opera of record, concludes that the frottola, in its solo arrangement, formed the basis of the music, that the dialogue was probably sung throughout, that there were choruses and ballets, all the accessories of modern opera, in fact. It was nevertheless nothing more than an antique drama with music, 
with the only difference that in this case the subject was a musical one, that the leading character represented a singer and was in fact impersonated in the original performance by one of the most famous Italian vocalists of the period, Baccio Ugolino, who sang to the accompaniment of his own lyre, Lira da Braccia. The scenery of this performance at the Palazzo Gonzaga was simple, only one setting being required. The stage was divided, one side representing the Thracian countryside and the other the realm of Pluto. But Poliziano later revised the work, dividing it into five acts and elaborating it along the line of the Sacri Representazione. Not only at Florence and Mantua, but in Venice, in Ferrara at the court of Hercules I, in Rome under papal auspices, in fact, wherever there was a fastidious aristocracy, these antique commedie flourished. Among artists, Leonardo da Vinci at Milan, Raphael at Rome, Andrea del Sarto at Florence, Dosso Dossi at Ferrara, and numerous other immortal names of the Renaissance are associated with their production, and among musicians, Alfonso della Viola, Antonio dal Cornetto, Claudio Merulo, Andrea Gabrielli, and many more. As humanism succumbs to the Catholic reaction, with the pillaging of Rome by Charles V, 1527, and the taking of Florence soon after, as liberty of thought is crushed by the Inquisition, as petty tyrants supersede broad-spirited despots, the harmless pastoral play succeeds the Commedia. Sumptuous settings and meaningless music now outweigh dramatic significance. Poets such as Ariosto and Tasso are the authors of these spectacles, and another generation of great artists, John of Bologna, Salviati, Bernardo Bumlalente, and perhaps Michelangelo, lavish their skill upon them. Indeed, both painters and poets in this age are musicians. Music had, at this epoch, obsessed the entire thought of Italy. Painters, writers, the elite, especially in the north of Italy, madly abandoned themselves to it. Nearly all great Venetian painters of the 16th century, Giorgione, Bassano, Tintoretto, Giovanni d'Udine, Sebastiano del Piombo, were musicians. Let us recall the numerous paintings of concerts, either sacred, Bellini, or profane, Giorgione, Bonifazio, Veronese. Remember how, in the marriage at Canaan of the Louvre, Titian holds the bass viol and Bassano the flute. Sebastiano del Piombo was celebrated as lute player and singer, while Vasari recognised more willing Tintoretto's talent as a musician than a painter. At the court of Leo X, music superseded all other arts. The Pope decreed for two virtuosi, charged with the superintendence of St. Peter's, a stipend equal to Raphael's. A Jewish lutenist, Gian Maria, received the title of Count and a Palace. A singer, Gabriel Marino, became Archbishop of Bari. Finally, it will be remembered that when Leonardo da Vinci presented himself at the court of Ludovico il Moro at Milan, it was, according to Vasari, not in the capacity of painter, but as musician. Girolamo Parabasco said, I am a musician, not a poet. And the great Tasso, music is, so to speak, the soul of poetry. Beccari's Sacrificio, produced in 1554, with music by Alfonso della Viola, which is preserved, before Hercules II of Ferrara, the Aratusa of Alberto Lollio, 1563, the Sfortunato of Agostino Argenti, and the famous Aminta of Torquato Tasso, given with music at the court of the Grand Duke of Tuscany in 1590, are examples of pastoral plays. Tasso's collaborators and advisers in this production were none other than Emilio de Cavalieri and Laura Giudicioni, perhaps also Ottavio Rinuccini, at any rate a spectator, who we shall presently see are to become instrumental in the creation of true opera. In the same year, 
These two produced privately their pastoral plays with music, Il Satiro and Disperazione di Fileno, the first known examples of opera, for they were set to music throughout, and probably even in representative style, as it was called. Five years later, 1595, followed Il Gioco della Cieca, played before the Archduke Ferdinand, but the music of none of these works has been preserved. The opera, then, had arrived, but, unaware of the fact, its so-called inventors, caught in the spell of antiquarian research, their imaginations transported by the glories of classic past, turned their vision back to ancient Greece, to Athens, that prototype of their own city of Florence, where Aeschylus unfolds before the eyes of his countrymen a spectacle worthy of the gods. They see no analogy in their madrigals and the dithyrambic chorus of the ancients, no parallel in their sacri rappresentazione to the Eleusinian mysteries and Bacchic festivals, but, rejecting all that has gone before, attempt to resurrect the magic power of music as an organic part of human speech, and the revival of the greatest product of classic genius, the Greek tragedy. Such was the purpose of the Camerata, that genial circle of amateurs, literati and musicians, which gathered at the house of Giovanni Bardi, Count of Vernio, in Florence, one of those famous academies which were the centres of the intellectual life of Italy in the 16th century. Jacopo Peri, an erudite musician and a favourite singer, his younger colleague Giulio Caccini of Rome, the already familiar Emilio de Cavalieri, inspector general of the artists in Florence, Luca Marenzio, the most eminent musician of the city, and Cristoforo Malvezzi, all of whom had collaborated on the intermezzi to Bardi's Lammico Fido in 1589, were, together with Jacopo Corsi, a wealthy and intelligent patron of music, and Vincenzo Galilei, father of the great astronomer, the chief members of the circle besides the host. These men, liberal thinkers, modernists, literati rather than professional musicians, were out of sympathy with the pedants of the contrapuntal school, the Goths against whom Galilei had already published his diatribe in 1551. Footnote. Born in Florence circa 1533, died there in 1600, he was a pupil of Zarlino, an excellent musician and an able lutenist and violinist. He published two books of madrigals and made the first known experiments in the representative style of melody. He was a deep student of Greek music, discovered the hymns of Mesomedes, transcribed successfully only 200 years later, and published Dialogue on Antique and Modern Music, 1581, a diatribe against Zarlino and his methods. His son, Galileo Galilei, the great astronomer, is said to have constructed his first telescope from an organ pipe belonging to his father. End of footnote. The Latin translations of Aristoxenus's Ptolemy's and Aristotle's treatises on music, published in 1562, aroused their keenest interest and discussion, and their admiration of the plastic arts which had signalised the Renaissance in the preceding centuries, now found an echo in their attempt to reconstruct a lost ideal. In 1585, the great Andrea Gabrielli had written choruses for the solemn performances of Oedipus Rex at Vincenza, and in 1589, Luca Marenzio wrote a Combat of Apollo and the Dragon, drawing his inspiration from the descriptions of the Nomos Pythagos of the Greeks. See previous chapter. Convinced, despite the lack of examples, of the greater expressive power of Greek music with the employment of simpler means, Galilei, after long research with the aid of Bardi, now composed for a solo voice and instrumental accompaniment Dante's Lament of Ugolino, in the so-called stile rappresentativo, the representative style. His experiment proved suggestive, if not altogether successful, and the task was next taken up by Caccini, who, with probably more natural talent than Galilei, set himself to the composition of several canzone in the new style, a simple cantilena over a figured bass, which provided a harmonious support to be executed by instruments, lute or theorbo. 
Endowed with a beautiful and well-cultivated voice, he achieved a genuine success among his sympathetic circle. To make sure of himself, however, he proceeded to Rome, where his new songs were applauded by an assemblage of connoisseurs. Thus encouraged, he appealed to his literary friends for verses in all metres, which he promptly set to music. Some years later, 1601, these were published under the title La Nuove Musiche, The New Music, with a remarkable preface in which their author claims the merit for having originated the stile rappresentativo, and which contains so much technical information for singers that it may well be considered the first vocal method. Caccini's arie were disseminated largely through his vocal pupils, for they adapted themselves admirably to the beautiful Italian style of singing of which he was one of the first masters. We may mention incidentally that his daughter, Septimia, became one of the famous singers of the period, and aroused the admiration of Monteverdi. Her sister Francesca achieved distinction both as singer and composer. Caccini, though he was probably the first to use and secure public acceptance of the Arioso style, was, despite his own claims, not the originator of the true recitative. That distinction belongs to Jacopo Perry, a more learned musician, though a less genial personality, who meantime had begun the application of the representative style to the drama. Corsi, the successor of Bardi, now become papal chamberlain in Rome, as host and patron, was a close friend of the poet Ottavio Rinuncini, died 1623. Both were familiar with the experiments of Cavalieri in the realm of dramatic music. After joint deliberation, the two appealed to Perry to give a simple proof of the power of modern music by setting Rinuncini's dramatic poem Daphne, a scene of which had already been experimented with by Bardi. Remembering that it was a question of dramatic poetry and that the melody must at all times be modelled after the words, Perry concluded, that the ancients employed musical forms which, more elevated than ordinary speech, yet less regularly designed than common song melodies, were halfway between the two. In an effort to forget every known style, he at first attempted to rediscover the diastematica of the Greeks, the quarter-tone interval, in the inflections of ordinary speech. According to his own testimony, he closely observed persons speaking, so that he might reproduce as naturally as possible their expressions, whether moderate or passionate. Thus he decided to have quiet expressions sung in half-spoken tones over a resting instrumental bass. In emotional moments, however, the voices proceeded in a more animated tempo, and by larger intervals instead of strictly conjunct motion, while the accompaniment indulged in more frequently changing and sometimes dissonant harmonies. In other words, he used what we know today as recitative. The importance of the principle thus introduced, the preference of expressive quality to purely musical effect, cannot be plain song, germ of romanticism itself, lies in this departure, the elements of Gluck's reform, of Wagner's creed, repose in the assertion of Caccini that one is always beautiful when one is expressive. Perry's Daphne, after charming the circle of intimates, was performed at the house of Corsi one evening during the carnival of 1597, the composer singing the role of Apollo, in the presence of the Grand Duke Ferdinando de' Medici, the Cardinals Dalmonte and Montalto, the poets Piero Strozzi and Francesco Cini, and a great number of gentlemen. The pleasure and the stupor which seized the audience is inexpressible, said Galliano later in the preface to his own Daphne. Every person there felt that he was in the presence of a new art. Spurred on by this victory, Rinuncini composed his Eurydice for the festivities occasioned by the marriage of Maria de' Medici to Henry IV, King of France, in 1600. Perry again wrote the music, though at the performance which took place on October the 6th at the Pitti Palace, some of the numbers of Caccini's version, composed after Perry's, were substituted because of Caccini's influence with the singers. The title role was sung by the famous Vittoria Archilei, the Utopy of Italy, while Perry himself impersonated Orpheus. 
The event not only aroused the greatest enthusiasm among the distinguished assemblage, but its echoes resounded through all the courts of Europe, and tremendously stimulated interest in the new art. The score of Eurydice has been reprinted in Florence in 1863, and may be examined by the student. It consists of 48 small octavo pages of simple recitative dialogue written over a figured bass, interspersed with five-part choruses in predominatingly diatonic harmony. The preface indicates that the figured bass was executed by a clavier, a chitarone, a lira grande, and a large flute. In one place, a triflauto, triple flute, is added, but it is not clear how the musicians manage to produce effective harmony without written-out parts. The impoverished quality of the music indicates a distinct retrogression from the contrapuntal compositions of the day, and vastly so when we consider the a cappella style of Palestrina. Its striking novelty alone accounts for the extraordinary effect it had upon the hearers. Its value was not in its intrinsic quality, but in the direction which it indicated, the path which was led to untold riches of sound. Following closely upon the heels of Perry's work came the setting of the same poem by Caccini, who had already produced Il Rapimento di Caffallo, 1597, performed 1600. Marco da Gagaliano, 1575-1642, was already at work along similar lines and in 1608 produced his Daphne at Mantua, one year after Monteverdi's Orfeo, which, however, marked so great an advance that it might have been written a generation later. Before discussing that master, it will be necessary to consider the utilisation of the representative style in another field, that of the sacred drama, or oratorio, by Emilio de Cavalieri, whose dramatic essays in connection with Laura Giudizione have already been mentioned. The origin of the oratorio is twofold, the prose oratorio latino and the Italian oratorio volgare. The former is derived from the medieval liturgical plays already spoken of, and the mysteries and moralities of the 15th century are clearly forerunners of it. The oratorio volgare, a didactic poem independent of scripture text, had its point of departure in the esercizi spirituali, scriptural lessons, instituted by the priest Filippo Neri, afterward canonized at Rome. He became the founder of the congregation of Oratorians, which regularly met for Bible study under his leadership. On certain evenings of the week, his sermons were preceded and followed either by a selection of popular hymns or by the dramatic rendering of a biblical scene. From the place in which these were first enacted, the Oratory of the Church of St. Maria in Vallecella, they received their name, Oratorio. Just as the dramatic madrigal was built upon the style of the secular madrigal, so these sacred dramas probably modelled themselves after the spiritual madrigal. While Peri and Caccini were still engaged in their experiments, Cavalieri, in 1600, staged in Neri's oratory his most important creation, La Rappresentazione di Anima e di Corpo, slightly antedating Peri's Eurydice. Like that work, it was written in expressive style, of which Cavalieri must indeed have been the real originator. Cavalieri's work belongs to the province of sacred opera, being the first of this important branch of the music drama, which is further represented by such works as Landis's Saint Alessio, 1637, and Marazzoli's allegorical opera La Vita Umana, 1658. It is distinguished from the true non-scenic oratorio, which is associated with the artistic personality Carissimi. To show the distinction between his work and that of Florentines, however, we quote the criticism of his Il Satiro by Giovanni Battista Doni, the historian of the Florentine monodists. It must, however, be well understood, he says, that these melodies are very different from those of today, 17th century, which are written in the stile recitativo. The others of Cavalieri, etc., are nothing but ariettas with all sorts of artifices and repetitions, echoes and some similar things, 
having nothing to do with the good and true dramatic music. On the other hand, Cavalieri's own instructions show his wonderful practical knowledge in the performance of opera and give us an exact idea of the first operatic theatre. The hall should not hold more than a thousand spectators comfortably seated, in the greatest silence. Larger halls have bad acoustics. They make the singer force his voice and they kill expression. Moreover, when the words are not understood, the music becomes tiresome. The number of instruments must be proportioned to the place of performance. The orchestra is invisible, hidden behind the drop. The instrumentation should change according to the emotion expressed. An overture and instrumental and vocal introduction are of good effect before the curtain rises. The ritornelle and sinfonia should be played by many instruments. A ballet, or better a singing ballet, should close the performance. The actor must seek to acquire absolute perfection in his voice, physique, gestures, bearing, and even his walk. He should sing with emotion, as it is written, not one passage like the other, and he must be careful to pronounce his words distinctly, so that they may be heard, che siano intese. The chorus should not think they are excused from acting when they do not have to sing. They must feign to listen to what is going on. They must occasionally change their places, rise, sit down, make gestures. The performance should not exceed two hours. Three acts suffice, and one must be careful, to infuse variety, not only into the music, but also the poem, and even the costumes. Gluck and Wagner, says Romain Roland, have added little to these rules. The favolo in musica, it was not called opera as yet, had taken root. Its first tender shoots, delectable morsels for a fastidious intellectual aristocracy, nurtured in the soil of princely patronage, had given evidence of hardihood. But it was an exotic, a hothouse plant, limited by its very nature to the homes of aristocracy. In order to flourish and grow to noble proportions, it had to bathe in the sunlight of popular favour. It required the care of a master, a genius who substituted imagination for synthetic reason, intuition for experiment. That master was Monteverdi. If the works of Perry and Caccini smelt of the midnight oil, there coursed in his creations the red blood of humanity. If their music was representative of the exact meaning of the word, attuned to the niceties of accent and inflection, his portrayed the gamut of human passions, the soul itself, even at times violating literary fidelity to reach that greater purpose. While they had thrust upon them the honour of creating a new method of expression, he, the musical genius of a century, could deliberately choose between the old and the new, and he chose the new. With him the new evolution began, and the new edifice, hardly rising above the ground, became a magnificent monument. Well did he see what was lacking in the conception of the Florentines. He understood that to fight successfully against the resources of counterpoint, new riches had to be brought, different but equally valuable. His prodigious inventive genius discovered them. He found them in harmony, in the expressive accent of the monodic chant and in the variety of instrumentation. Claudio Monteverdi, in Old Prince, spelt Monteverde, though by himself as here, first saw the light of the world at Cremona in May 1567. His father was probably a physician, at any rate a man of culture, who provided for his children an education far above the average. Claudio gave early evidence of musical talent and was placed under the tutelage of Marc Antonio Ingenieri, the choir master of the cathedral and musical arbiter in Cremona, with whom he studied viola playing, singing and composition. Ingenieri was a composer of genius. His responsoria, published anonymously, were for a long time ascribed to Palestrina, and, while worthy to be ranked with that composer's, they contain harmonies and modulations foreign to his style. Here in the master's originality we seem to find the explanation of his leniency toward his pupil's vagaries. For Monteverdi, from the first, showed a most persistent tendency to break the rules of counterpoint. 
He first appears as composer at the age of 16, publishing in 1583 his Madrigali Spirituali for four voices, and in the following year his Canzonette a tre voci, which were full of irregularities and forbidden progressions. His first book of five-part madrigals was brought out in 1587, and it was evident that he was already reaching out for realms unknown, though perhaps not yet equal to the leap. An extraordinary addiction to dissonances, frequent use of the seventh in suspensions, and a number of unpleasant progressions characterise these otherwise beautiful madrigals, as well as the additional collections printed in 1590, 1592, and 1603. But they nevertheless became popular, the last two going eventually through eight editions. Meantime, Monteverdi had become an able violist and aroused attention to his playing in high quarters. His virtuosity opened him the doors to the service of Duke Vincenzo di Gonzaga at Mantua, whither he went in 1590 as violist and singer. His modernist tendencies aroused the opposition of local musicians, which already evident when he became Maestro di Capella in 1602, broke out openly, as the madrigals of his fifth book, including the beautiful Cruda Amarilli, made their appearance. These drew the fire of Giovanni Maria Artusi, theoretician and canonicus regulatus of St. Salvatore, who attacked him in a polemic, on the imperfections of modern music, 1600, not mentioning his name, but quoting his newest compositions still in manuscript as examples. The attack is so amusing, and its adherence to the perennial arguments of contemporary criticism so striking, that we cannot refrain from quoting it in part. Though I am glad to hear of a new manner of composition, it would be more edifying to find in these madrigals reasonable passaggi, but this kind of air castles and chimeras deserves the severest reproof. Like all critics, he cites the example of the masters, Palestrina, Porta, Merulo, Gabrielli, Gastode, Lasso, etc., whose works these moderns should emulate, but instead are content to concoct as great a noise as possible, a confused mixture of unrhyming things and mountains of imperfections. Behold, for instance, he cries, the rough and uncouth passage in the third example by Monteverdi. After a rest, the bass attacks on a diminished fifth against the upper voice. Not after a consonance, mind you, as the masters have done, but after a rest, and as for the seventh unprepared, preposterous. Monteverdi had had the temerity not only to use the dominant seventh without preparation, according to the established rules, but to use other dissonances, diminished and secondary sevenths, ninths and elevenths in connection. He had introduced a freedom in the movement of voices and a sequence of chords, the audacity of which still startles us today. Modern, certainly he is modern by these tokens, says T.S.O., after hearing the Paris revival of Orfeo. But truly and spontaneously has he made his discoveries, they were so little searched for, that neither his contemporaries nor his successors, perhaps not even himself, have understood their value, and it has taken us centuries to arrive at a true appreciation of their merit. Monteverdi replied to his critics, for the cry had been taken up by others, and the argument developed into an open war, with the publication of his fifth book of madrigals, containing all the criticised compositions, with not a note changed. He even travelled to Venice to supervise the printing so as to ensure accuracy. In his preface he said that, having endeavoured to express emotions hitherto unexpressed in music, it was necessary to invent new tone combinations. New harmonies, moreover, required new modulations. He insisted that more than one point of view is worthy of consideration, and advised the cognoscenti to study further and learn that the modern composer builds upon a foundation of truth. These madrigals reach eventually nine editions, were reprinted in Antwerp and Copenhagen, and spread their composer's fame throughout Europe. 
Moreover, Monteverdi stood in high favour with his patron, a man of understanding who shared his ancestor's leaning to lavish patronage of the arts. He accompanied Duke Vincenzo on his war expedition to Hungary, when in 1595 he supported Rudolf II against the Turks, and in 1599 went with him to Flanders, whence he brought a new style of composition, the Canto alla Francese, which he afterwards adopted in his Scherzi Musicale e Tre Voci. His domestic circumstances, however, were none too favourable. He had married in 1595 Claudia Cataneo, the daughter of a violist and herself a singer at the ducal court, where her salary even exceeded Monteverdi's meagre pay. She had borne him two sons, and existence became more and more difficult. In 1607 she was taken seriously ill, and continued hardship and solicitude for his family spurred Monteverdi to complaint, but without result. His duties were most onerous, for besides directing the music at court, he was obliged to participate in the church service, and the many special performances which the Duke's love of festivities occasioned. On one of these occasions was the Carnival of 1607, when Vincenzo, familiar with the successes of Peri and Caccini at Florence, determined to surpass them at Mantua, and entrusted the preparation of the work to Monteverdi. The result was the Favola di Orfeo, the text for which had been written by Alessandro Striggio, son of the famous madrigalist. It was performed first in the Accademia dell'Invagite, and again on February 24th and March the 1st in the Ducal Theatre. Its success was enormous. The music aroused the most profound admiration, as did also the book, which by the order of the Duke was printed, so that the audience might follow it during the performance. As Orfeo is the only opera of Monteverdi preserved to us in its entirety, we may examine the score in Robert Eitner's edition with modern notation and the figured bass harmonised, and so realise the tremendous advance it shows over Caccini's Eurydice, for instance, reprinted in the same publication. The style of the recitative is similar, though it shows much greater fluency. The harmonies are beyond all comparison, richer and more varied, dissonances, especially the diminished seventh, being used with great dramatic effect. Suspensions and anticipations are particularly frequent and there are many daring chromatic modulations, such as from G-sharp minor to G and from E-flat major to E, reminding of Wagner's use of these same progressions. Instead of a simple figured bass, we have in the instrumental numbers at least a completely worked out harmonic structure, and for the first time, instruments are used in definite combinations with respect to their various timbres. There is an agreeably varied sequence of toccata, overture, recitative, arioso, ritonelle, chorus, and sinfonia at ends of acts. In fact, we find in Orfeo all the elements of the later opera, from the instrumental introduction to the final movement, even though in small proportions and of modest pretensions. The ternary form, later so important, opens its way here and there, i.e. in the first movement of the second act. The great bravura aria is also represented and offers opportunity to the skilful singer to exhibit his technique. Sometimes the vocal part appears in two ways, first in the simple unadorned form and directly under it in elaborate coloratura arrangement, evidently leaving the choice to the singer. The orchestra instruments play together only in the instrumental numbers, in the choruses they simply double the voice parts. But in accompanying the solo voices, the composer has made use of a curious device of associating the tone quality of a certain instrument or group of instruments with each character. This is indicated in the table of characters, which at the same time shows the composition of Monteverdi's orchestra. The table in the text is as follows. Music and prologue accompanied by two gravicembani, similar to spinets. Orfeo, accompanied by two bass viols. Eurydice, ten violas. Chorus of nymphs and shepherds, one double harp. Speranza, two small French violins. 
caronte or caron by two kitaroni or zithers the chorus of infernal spirits by two organi di legno or small pipe organs proserpina by three basi da gamba large vials pluto by four trombones apollo by one regale or reed organ and the chorus of shepherds who dance the maresca at the end were accompanied by two cornets a flute a la vigesima seconda a clarino or a small trumpet and three muted trumpets this recognition of a psychological correspondence between characters or situations and the timbre of instruments is interesting because it points the way to the dramatic utilization of orchestra color directly after orfeo monteverdi produced his ballo della ingrate a ballet scene in the manner of the usual intermezzi the arduous labor and nervous strain incident to these performances forced upon him the necessity of a rest which he spent in a visit to his father's house at cremona there his wife again stricken died and plunged into grief he himself succumbed to illness his income reduced to his own earnings he sent through his father an earnest appeal to the duke for greater emolument and that denied a request to be released from further duty but instead he was speedily summoned to return in order to prepare a musical spectacle for the coming nuptials of the heir apparent don francesco and margarita infanta of savoy his financial condition was now slightly improved and spurred by the prospect of greater fame he plunged into the task of setting the music of a new opera ariana for which rinuncini had been commissioned to write the book the work was to be staged on a scale far beyond anything attempted till then the best singers available were engaged and the rehearsals occupied five months it is interesting to note that another opera tiede by cini and peri competed for the honour of the performance at these festivities but was rejected in favour of ariana peri was however commissioned to write the recitatives for ariana the performance took place may twenty eighth sixteen o eight the theatre we are told by the official historian folino was not large enough to accommodate all the nobles visiting in the train of foreign princes and the natives had to be denied admittance while the play itself made a deep impression in the music monteverdi had surpassed himself the orchestra behind the scenes continues folino accompanied the beautiful voices throughout following the character of the singing most faithfully the lament of ariana abandoned by theseus was performed with great feeling and pictured so touchingly that all the auditors were profoundly stirred and not a lady's eye remained tearless this lament afterwards became one of the most popular pieces in italy after cosimo the second de medici in sixteen thirteen obtained the score of ariana from the duke and performed it in florence it was said that the favourite selection was heard in every house that contained a clavicembalo or a lute the sumptuous ballet idropica for which monteverdi composed the prologue was produced during the same festivities the succeeding period saw no diminution in the output of this indefatigable composer in sixteen ten we see him in rome suing for the favour of clement the eighth to whom he presents his ecclesiastical compositions which were however inferior to his secular works in sixteen twelve duke vincenzo died and monteverdi resigned his post to accept the most coveted musical office in italy that of choir master at st mark's venice his position there became the source of the greatest satisfaction to him for aside from the fact that he received three hundred ducats yearly and after sixteen sixteen four hundred while finally his total income increased to six hundred and fifty he was honoured and esteemed better even than his illustrious predecessors willet de rore zarlino etc he enjoyed the title of maestro di capella to the republic brought the music of st mark's where he had a choir of thirty singers and twenty instruments to a high degree of perfection superintended the chamber music of the city as well and earned the most general popular appreciation 
in 1621, he composed the music for a requiem in memory of Duke Cosimo II of Tuscany, and from Strozzi's enthusiastic description, it was a most gorgeous tone creation, better fitted for a theatre than a church. Similarly, in 1631, he was called upon to provide the music for a great thanksgiving in St. Mark's, after the terrible plague raging through Italy, and responded with a mass, in the Gloria and Credo of which he introduced a trombone accompaniment. His creative power in the dramatic field remained unabated. Il combattimento di Tancredi e Clorinda, half dramatic, half epic, with narrative testo connecting the speeches, composed in 1624, was followed in 1627 by La Finta Pazza Licori, by Strozzi and Strigio, and five intermezzi for the marriage of Odoardo Farnese at Parma, and in 1630 by Prosapina Rapita. The first public opera house in Venice, the Teatro di San Paolo, and soon after the Teatro San Giovanni e Paolo, for which Monteverdi furnished La Donne, 1639, Le Nozze di Enea con la Vigna, 1641, and Il Ritorno d'Ulisse in Patria, which last is preserved. Thus, even in his last two years, he was occupied on a series of operas, of which L'Incoronazione di Popea, 1642, was his last great effort. It might be added that his seventh book of madrigals had appeared in 1619, and his eighth, the famous Madrigali Guerrieri e Amorosi, in 1638. In his Combattimento, Monteverdi introduced a new effect, now familiar as the orchestral tremolo, which so startled the musicians that at first they refused to play it. His own explanation for its use is curious. I have recognised, he says, that our passions or emotions are expressed in three grades, anger, violence, temperate moderation, and humility or petition. These three grades are clearly reflected in music, namely in that of excited, tender, or moderate character, concitato, molle, e temperato. Finding only the last two represented in the older music, he studied the question of spondaic and phyric verse meter which the Greeks had transferred to music. Taking the semibrief, whole note, for the unit of the former, he proposed to break it up into sixteen semichromes, or sixteenths, which are to be played in succession upon one note to obtain the faster measure, which he calls concitato, tremolo. This is but one instance of how Monteverdi constantly sought instructions from the ancients. In his letters of 1633 and 1634, he tells of his labours to rediscover human melody and the music of the passions. He had no one to guide him, and no books but Plato. The information which Galilei conveyed interested him, but he was careful not to be misled by the phantom of a lost art. He believed that in following his own principles, he would be more true to classic thought than by trying to apply its formulas. He claimed that modern art had profited more from a study of Greek thought than from old-fashioned harmonic exercise. Thus the ancients had rendered to music the same service which the century before they had rendered to sculpture. They had taken it out of the studied formulas and had led artists back to the sole observation of nature. Indeed, a real renaissance opens at the beginning of the 16th century with Monteverdi, the renaissance of the heart in the language of music. Monteverdi's artistic creed and theories are to some extent perpetuated in his Selva Morale e Spirituale, dedicated to the Empress Eleonora Gonzaga, and published in 1640. Monteverdi died in Venice, November 29th, 1643, and was buried with great honours at the Chiesa dei Frari. With his death, we see opera finally established in that place in the heart of the Italian people, which it has held to this day. Others had already taken up the work, notably his pupil, Pietro Francesco Cavalli, whose genius burst upon the world in 1639 with his Nozze di Teti. With the next generation, the Florentine school divides into the new Venetian school, founded by Giovanni Legrenzi, 
1635 to 1672, of which Antonio Lotti was to become the leader, and the Neapolitan, which found its guiding genius in Alessandro Scarlatti, one of the most conspicuous musical figures of the 17th century. From him and his teacher Francesco Provenzale, circa 1669, there issued a long chain of masters and pupils. Francesco Durante, 1684-1755, Leonardo Leo, 1694-1744, Francesco Feo, 1685-1740, Gaetano Greco, born 1680, etc., who developed the Italian opera in its narrowest sense, an opera that was purely vocal, whose chief aim was the production of beautiful melody, and which paid a minimum of attention to orchestration and dramatic pathos. It was a purely musical school, and even more than that of Venice, removed from the ideal of the Florentines. Against this school were ultimately to be directed the reforms of Gluck, whose theories are solidly founded upon the creed of Florence. Florence, then, is the true cradle of opera, also in its more modern sense, for the precepts there laid down have remained valid even to Wagner and the music drama of today. End of section 21. Section 22 of The Art of Music, Volume 1, The Pre-Classic Periods. Editor-in-Chief Daniel Gregory Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Melitzia. New Forms, Vocal and Instrumental During the 16th century, a style of music attained perfection, and as we have seen, two composers, Palestrina and Orlando Lasso, put upon it the final stamp of great personal genius. This style is known as the vocal polyphonic style. The music was written for choruses, and for the most part, was intended to be sung without accompaniment. Centuries of endeavour had gone to its development, during which composers bore in mind, first and always, a great ideal, the combination of many melodies in one euphonious whole. The result was a texture of music so nicely woven that in the mass of smooth flowing sound, no one melody was evident to the ear, though many melodies moved simultaneously forward with seeming independence, each crossing and recrossing the others, each free to sustain a note while the others moved above and below it, all coming at certain points to dwell together in rich chords. Intended only for service in the church, it was a music perfectly expressive of a rapt and exalted state of religious devotion, from which had been expelled all the elements that might disturb and excite, all harsh intervals, all suddenness, all lively rhythm. It was woven about the Latin text of the Mass, and of other rites and ceremonies of the Church. But except for this connection with words, it was without form and unconfined. Without rhythm and without symmetrical form, the very foundations upon which most music rests, it seems like an edifice floating in mid-air, without foundation, ethereal, mystical, and perfect. Such a music could indeed be brought no further after Palestrina and Lasso, but it left the world a model of polyphonic technique which was to aid in the development and enrichment of subsequent music and which has had an indirect influence upon every great composer since that time. The last years of the 16th century gave evidence of a rebellion from the laws of polyphonic technique, yet the musicians are at first not so much actuated by a feeling of rebellion against this established form as by an enthusiasm for other kinds of music, which during the centuries when all musicians gave their most serious thought to the development of polyphony had been more or less neglected kinds of music in which solo melody and rhythm play a part. Perry, Caccini, Cavalieri and other brilliant young men, who just before the turn of the century composed music in a so-called new style, are not inventors of anything new, but experimenters with the simple kind of music which must have endured among the people through all the civilised ages of man. They sought to raise simple song into an art, and their experiments turned the attention of all men to those branches of music which had for centuries been considered beneath the dignity of serious effort. 
At the start, spurred on by the desire to restore the combination of music and poetry, which had been practiced by the Greeks, they became intoxicated by the sheer beauty of the human voice in single melody, and by the ever further discovery of the power of music to express live, poignant human emotions beyond the ascetic rapture of religious devotion. Indeed, the desire to express new emotions in melody and harmony, and the sensuous delight in sound are the main causes of the remarkable developments of the 17th century, which not only produced a new form of vocal music, completely secular and independent of the church, though still bound to words, but also firmly established instrumental music, untrammeled by words or adherence to text, beautiful and noble in itself alone. Inasmuch as the marvellously perfect technique of writing polyphonic choruses for voices was suited only to the expression of the vague ecstasy which had formed it, composers were forced to invent a new technique and a new style of writing. The ways by which they arrived at this new style form the subject of this chapter. It will be seen that certain ones built directly upon the polyphonic style, that others developed solo melody and the solo adorned and elaborated by many devices, and that it was by a union of the two ways that at last the new style was made worthy and sufficient. At the beginning of the century, music was, so to speak, taken out of the church and set free and weak into the open world. At once, social fashion seized upon it. Opera, for instance, became almost at once the fashion of the day. From the opening of the first public opera house in Venice in 1637, opera composers had to write their music with regard to popular success, in other words, with regard to what the public wanted, and since the public came soon to worship the human voice even more than music, the composer and his works were often at the mercy of the reigning favourite singer. Moreover, in the course of the century, a race of virtuosi sprang into prominence, men who thrilled and electrified by display of technical skill, and won the public by amazement. Music which is written only with the aim of giving the performer a chance to exhibit technical skill cannot be adjudged great music, nor even good music. Yet the influences of attempts at virtuosity were of inestimable value to the growth of music in the 17th century, and indeed have been so at all times, though they often appear a fruitless, hollow sham. For the virtuoso discovers the utmost capabilities of his instrument, and thereby widens the field of composition. In the 17th century, and in the 18th as well, the composer and the virtuoso were one. As we have already seen, in the church music of Palestrina and Lassu, there were no active rhythm. The recurrence of regular beats was as far as possible disguised to avoid the excitement which a persistent, marked rhythm must convey upon an audience, and which is out of place in the mystical rites of the church. But in the 17th century, composers of vocal music made more and more use of marked rhythm as a means of conveying emotional excitement. And instrumental composers, finding out little by little how lifeless music for instruments was when not animated by rhythm, made rhythm more and more persistent and obvious in their work. Along with the recognition of the life-giving power of rhythm came the appreciation of clearly balanced structural form, which is only a broader kind of rhythm. Melody, rhythm, and symmetrical form seem to us the very essentials of music. It must be ever a source of wonder that for centuries musicians gave themselves to the development of a style of music which deliberately suppressed them. Yet those very musicians whose long labours are summed up and glorified in the works of Palestrina and Lasso laid the foundation upon which the art of modern music has been built. The polyphonic style, animated by rhythm and moulded to melody, became counterpoint, which, though in a sense the mathematics of music, and in the hands of an uninspired composer dry as dust, is nonetheless the very essence of the art, and in the hands of a master, the power and glory of man's mind in music. We shall see it prepared in the course of the century for the hands of perhaps the greatest of all composers, Johann Sebastian Bach. Spreading gradually through all the music of the century, came the new, warm force of harmony. In the works of Palestrina and Lasso, the appreciation of chords is often evident, 
but the attention of both was mainly centred upon the interweaving of many melodies, and for the most part the chords which resulted from the simultaneous sounding of many voice parts were not regarded in relation to each other, nor planned beforehand in a definite progression. The flow of the various parts was theoretically never directed nor influenced by a harmonic plan. Moreover, the vocal polyphony was in the various types of scales known as the ecclesiastical modes, types which owed their peculiar characteristics to the position of the semitone steps within the octave. A change in the course of a piece from one mode to another, a modulation as we should say today, was most rarely ventured. In other words, there was no change of key. The practice of raising or lowering notes in the scales by sharps and flats in order to avoid harsh dissonances, or to let parts glide by the interval of a semitone into the chords of cadences, which practice was called musica ficta, had by the middle of the 16th century softened the rigour of the modes. Yet during the first half of the 17th century, the modes were still held to differ from each other in aesthetic qualities, and composers were still under the sway of the laws which governed them. The modes broke down gradually, it is true, and traces of their influence are found late in the 17th century, but by the end of the century they had practically given way to the major and minor keys upon which our greatest music has been based. The subtleties of the modes were artificial. The popular music of the Middle Ages shows an instinctive choice of modes nearest our present-day major and minor scales. The enthusiasm for melody in the 17th century at first allowed to an accompaniment only simple chords to be played by lute or spinet which very soon came to be regarded as harmonic progressions. These chords were not the result of the interweaving of various melodies, but were entities in themselves, and came to be appreciated as such. Freed from the laws of counterpoint, and calculated to aid in the expression of keen emotion, sudden, unprepared dissonances found their place in music. Chords were contrasted, their beauty and power were perceived, and they were studied and used for themselves. Moreover, it became the custom to play a few chords as prelude to an instrumental piece, and out of this custom there grew up in the course of the century a type of instrumental music called a prelude, which was hardly more than an elaborate series of chords broken up in arpeggios, of which no finer example can be mentioned than the first prelude in Bach's well-tempered clavichord. Thus the rich beauty of harmony came into music, the most subtle, the most coloured, and the most profound of her expressions. Perhaps the most characteristic mark of the new school of composition, and one which points suggestively to the way in which harmony developed, is the employment of what is known as a figured bass. The voice parts of the great polyphonic masterpieces were often printed separately, rarely together in one score, but the first operas were printed in score on two staffs, on the upper of which the melody was recorded, and on the lower a single bass part, with figures and sharps and flats written under the notes to indicate the chords of which these notes were the foundation, and which constituted the accompaniment. The origin of this figured bass is doubtful. It is possibly the result of the endeavours of Italian organists in the 16th century to free themselves from the task of playing those pieces written in the old style from a number of separately printed parts. Whatever its origin, it was perfectly suited to the monodists, and to those who during the century wrote in the new style. It is indicative of the way composers centred all their interest in the melody, leaving the details of the accompaniment to the discretion and the taste of the accompanist. Thought of in this case as a single player, using lute, harpsichord, organ, or any instrument upon which chords could be played. Evidently only a most simple accompaniment was expected, one which merely supported the melody with chords and attempted little or no contrapuntal intricacies. In cases where the accompaniment was given to a number of instruments, the figured bass still served only for the instrument which could play chords, though the single notes of it might be reinforced by an instrument of low range such as the viol. For the other instruments which were to enrich the harmonies and add touches of orchestral colour, special parts were written. So the harpsichord became the centre of the group of accompanying instruments, and later the centre of the orchestra, apart from opera, 
supplying the harmonic base of the music in solid chords. It continued to hold its central place until, at the end of the next century, Gluck took a definite stand against it. The bass part itself was at first considered only as the foundation of the harmonies of the accompaniment. It was not therefore an independent melody, and was not planned in any contrapuntal relation with the melody above it. But before the end of the first decade of the century, composers began to give it movement and a character of its own, sometimes treating it in definite contrapuntal relation with the melody. Thus, early did the composers of the new school turn to the science of counterpoint for aid in the construction of their music. Thus early began the new and the old to work together. The figured bass is significant, not only of the way composers came to an appreciation of the value of an harmonic foundation in music, and of how counterpoint came to the aid of the new music when it was leaden and uninteresting. It points also to the slow development of the orchestra, of the skill to write for groups of instruments in such a way that they could stand independently without the bolstering of the harpsichord or the organ. The orchestral style proper is the most complex style in music and was the slowest to develop. The employment of the figured bass is evidence of the inability of composers to master it during the 17th and 18th centuries. Yet though the composers of the 17th century were unable to master the problem of the orchestra, their accomplishments in the development of instrumental music, especially of music for small groups of string instruments, were most important. The achievements of the organists may be considered first, because in them the tradition of the polyphonic style most evidently perseveres, and because they were the first to develop a suitable instrumental style. The organ had been used in the churches from very early times, and had been little by little improved until by the middle of the 16th century, it was capable of great power of tone, and of some beauty and delicacy as well. During the 16th century, music for the organ had been cultivated by three great Venetian organists, Andrea Gabrielli, 1510-1586, Claudio Marullo, 1533-1604, and Giovanni Gabrielli, 1557-1612, nephew and pupil of Andrea. All three were world famous in their day, and men came from Germany, France and England to hear them play and to study with them. The organs in St. Mark's Cathedral were among the finest in Europe. Venice was brilliantly to the fore in music, and these three great organists were in the very front ranks of innovators. If their music sounds to us antiquated now, it is because it was hardly in the power of three men in the span of half a century, to develop a style of music for the organ which would be suited to its special qualities. It must not be forgotten that serious musicians had given relatively little thought to instrumental music, and had spent their lives in the perfecting of a style in vocal music. These three pioneers in organ music, therefore, had first to discover what sort of music sounded well on the organ. The problems were difficult, for not only was there the question of instrumental style, but likewise the question of form, since instrumental music, deprived of the continuity of a text to hold it in some measure together, must be wrought into definite form or else remain an inartistic chaos of sound. It can hardly be said that these early organists invented any clear, self-sufficient forms. In fact, all form had to wait until the harmonic idea was clear in men's minds until the middle of the next century. In the collections of their works are to be found Ricercari, Canzone da Sona, and Toccatas, but none of these had definite form. The Ricercar was a piece in polyphonic imitative style, of serious character, ancestor of the instrumental fugue, but very strongly bound to the vocal style of the day. It differed from the fugue in that it presented no clear so-called second subject, as foil or playfellow to the main subject, and moreover, in that there was no consistent main subject throughout the piece, but a rambling from one to another suggested by it, and so on. Rhythm was indeterminate and frequently changing, and there was little suggestion of a definite metrical structure of formal significance. The canzona was originally no more than an arrangement for the organ of a secular song in polyphonic style of the kind made popular in France 
in the period of the Ars Nova. The characteristic feature of these songs, or chansons, was a division of the music, following the stanzas of the poem, into several sections or strophes, some of which were in polyphonic style, others in simple note-for-note -note harmony. And in working them over for the organ, composers maintained the division. We shall see how composers for other instruments worked upon the same plan, and how in this plan lies the germ for which was to spring one of the so-called cyclic forms of music, a piece in several distinct movements called Sonata da Chiesa, which was one of the direct ancestors of the symphony. However, in the early canzona, there was no actual splitting up into movements, but only a series of rather distinct sections within the one movement, differing from each other in style and rhythm. The organists used the canzona with rather more lightness than they ever displayed in the treatment of the richer car, and in an attempt to animate and vary the simple song parts, they hit upon not a few of those devices of ornamentation which came to play a great part in instrumental music of the 18th century. Andrea Gabrielli's canzona, Un Gay Berger, is an excellent example of the type, while the connection with its prototype is still distinct. Though there is a canzona for organ by Bach, the form never developed in organ music to any very great importance. It was assimilated on the one hand by the richer car, and on the other by the more brilliant toccata. The toccata was from the first a piece for display, and more than any other called the suitable organ style into being. The early toccatas might be called ventures in virtuosity. In them, composers broke free, little by little, from the slow-moving vocal style. They discovered how much more rapidly their fingers could move than voices could sing, and they learned to leap and run, so to speak, and gave over, once for all, the slow pace of the vocal style, which, admirably suited to voices, is intolerably heavy and dull upon instruments. The first attempts amounted to little more than rapid running of scales over a foundation of uninteresting chords, but by the end of the 16th century, the chords had become more interesting, and other runs than simple scales had been developed. Two men, especially, are important in the history of organ music of the first half of the 17th century, Peter Sveilink in Amsterdam and Girolamo Frescobaldi in Rome, the one commonly accepted as the first of the school of great organists of northern Europe, the other strongly influential in forming the style of the organists of southern Germany. The best of the northern and southern schools came to be united in Johann Sebastian Bach, the greatest of all organists, for whose music, therefore, Sveilink and Frescobaldi may be said to have laid foundations. Both were daring, brilliant performers, and equally bold and venturesome composers. Sveilink was organist at the Old Church in Amsterdam from about 1581 to the year of his death, 1621, and Frescobaldi, considerably younger, organist at St. Peter's in Rome from 1608 to 1628, and again later in life. In both cities, crowds flocked to the churches whenever these great men played. Of Sveilink's music that has been preserved, a great part shows strongly the influence of the early Venetian organists, but, as might be expected, he goes beyond them in instrumental effects, and in serious works, not calculated merely to display the skill of the virtuoso, he really creates a definite fugue form, independent of vocal style, animated and impressive. As a performer, he was excited to experiment in effects which often led him into meaningless passage work, striking perhaps in his day, but to our ears childish and quite lacking in musical worth. But his influence was long felt, and was the incentive to ever bolder and bolder effects to expand the range of organ technique. The younger Italian was no less daring, but seems to have been gifted with more sensitive instinct. He never offends by empty display. His style is consistently higher than that of any other organist of his day. His advance over his predecessors is most marked in his use of animated rhythmical subjects, which he developed more often in genuine fugal style with answering counter-subject and logical balanced form, than in the aimless style of the older Richard Carr. 
Moreover, the passage work in his Ducatas is built upon chord progressions, which are very nearly free of the old modal restrictions, and which are impressive in themselves and of genuine musical worth. Among works published in his lifetime are a set of Fantasias, 1608, all but three of which are in Richard Carr's style, a set of Toccatas, 1614, a set of Richard Carri, 1615, which show a marked improvement in construction over earlier works, and a second book of Toccatas in 1627, and in 1635 the most famous of all his works, the Fiori Musicali, which contained pieces in all styles known at that time. Among his pupils was the brilliant Saxon wanderer Johann Jakob Froberger, who was for many years organist at the court of Vienna, for four years in Rome, two in Paris, later in London under romantic circumstances, of which he has himself left an account, and still again in the Netherlands, in Halle, in Vienna, and in France, where he died in 1657. In the work of such a man, many influences are of course evident, but in his organ compositions, that of Frescobaldi is most consistent, and thus the style of the Italian passes over into German usage. After the death of Frescobaldi, the importance of organ music in Italy steadily declined, but in Germany, both north and south, it grew steadily greater. It was built up upon the foundations laid by the Italians themselves and by Svelink, who was strongly under the influence of the Italians. But there entered into it an element of purely German nature, the Protestant chorale. These noble, expressive old melodies, though of varied origin, some sprung from the old plain song melodies of the Roman ritual, others from the folk songs of the people, had become the religious folk song of the German Protestant. Upon them organists constructed a singularly lofty and expressive form of music known as the chorale prelude, which combined with the polyphonic skill, the remodelled heritage of the old masters, the genuine serious feeling of the chorale. As the name implies, the chorale prelude was played by the organist before the congregation sang the chorale, and might be regarded as the organist's prologue inspired by a musical text. Two kinds of the prelude were developed to a high state of musical excellence at the end of the 17th century. In one, the chorale melody was treated in flowing contrapuntal style, appearing now in long notes, now in short, woven into a smooth texture of sound. In the other, the melody was often brilliantly adorned with trills and turns, and was made to stand boldly forth over an accompaniment which often presented a vigorous counter-subject, and which was filled with the most striking and daring devices of the virtuoso. The former was more in keeping with the spirit of the South German organists, one of whom, Johann Pachelbel, a Nuremberger, developed it richly. The other was fostered by the vigorous, daring organists of the South, among whom the Dane Dietrich Buxtehude stands out most conspicuously. We shall see later how much Sebastian Bach was influenced by these two great organists. At the end of the 17th century, organ music was independent of vocal style, free of the old church modes, built solidly upon an impressive harmonic foundation, animated by strong rhythm and varied by a thousand devices of virtuosity which had their being in the nature of the instrument itself. It makes evident the great changes which had come into music during the century. On the other hand, the general employment of a polyphonic style, for which the organ is of all instruments the best suited, and which moreover is in keeping with the dignity and noble solemnity of the instrument, shows the perseverance of those high principles of musical composition which had been first established and glorified in the vocal works of Palestrina and Lasso. And in the forms of prelude, toccata, fugue, and choral prelude, composers had found suitable forms in which their musical ideas could stand, apart from a text and self-sufficient as absolute music. Inasmuch as the organ was the instrument for which the most suitable style was clearly to be found in a modification of the old vocal polyphony, organist composers were spared much of the difficulty which hindered composers who strove to write for other instruments, or for combination of instruments. 
we have seen that organ music, set upon its way by the Italians, was dropped by them before the middle of the century. All their interest in instrumental music came very early in the century to be centred upon music for the violin and instruments of that family. This is due to the fact that during that century there arose in northern Italy families of violin makers who, selecting generally the least clumsy of the types of bowed instruments, and particularly the violin, with marvellous worksmanship and natural endowment of instinctive skill, developed them into instruments of a sweetness, flexibility, and power of expression which can be rivalled only by the human voice. The names of these violin makers have long been famous in the world, and neither their skill nor their success has ever since been matched. The first of them was Gasparo da Salo of Brescia, who worked in the last half of the 16th century and a little way into the 17th. Working a little later in Brescia was Paolo Magini. The centre of the industry soon shifted to the town of Cremona, and it is in the list of the Cremonese makers that we find the names of the Amati family, of whom the last and most famous was Niccolo, died 1648. The Guarneri family, of whom the last and greatest was Joseph, who lived far into the 18th century, and the great name of Antonio Stradivari, who, born about 1644, lived until 1737. The violin itself was in use early in the century, mostly as soprano in a group of viols. The rapid and remarkable perfection of it, however, soon attracted almost the exclusive attention of composers, and it was thus raised from a minor role in a group of instruments to be the head of all instruments. The earliest attempts of Italian composers to write violin music were singularly childish and unsuccessful, and in most cases they seemed stupidly against the simplest principles of instrumental music. But one must not forget that the only art of composition which had been developed to a technical excellence was the art of vocal polyphony, and that the only skill the fine instrumental composers had to bring to writing music for their instruments was the skill which they had acquired in the study of polyphonic choruses. We have seen that the early organ composers worked upon the same plan, but whereas a polyphonic style is essentially suitable to the organ, and the modifications of the vocal style necessary to convert it into a style for the organ suggested themselves naturally and obviously, the instrumental composers were face to face with a far more elusive problem. They progressed by much the same steps as the organists, but noticeably more slowly. The form in which most of the earlier attempts were cast was the canzona. This, as we have already seen in organ music, was modelled upon the form of the French chanson of the 16th century, and its characteristic feature was a division into several short sections, not actually cut off from each other, yet differing quite distinctly both in rhythm and in treatment, some being in the polyphonic style, others in a style of simple chords. The number of instruments might vary from 4 to 16, but the majority of early canzonas were written for four instruments, usually of the viol type. In a collection of canzonas published in Venice in 1608, there is one, however, written for eight trombones, and another for sixteen. The number of little sections in the canzona also varied. The tendency at first was toward a great many, ten or twelve, but with the general development of instrumental style came the lengthening of the sections and a consequent reduction of their number. A typical canzona of this period is one for four instruments by Giovanni Battista Grillo. It is made up of ten sections. The first in common time is but seven measures long, and is in the style of the Rijkaar, i.e. built upon an imitation of short motifs. The second section is in triple time, in the general style of a galliard, a dance form of the time, and is eleven measures long. The third section is again in common time, and in the style of a Rijkaar, and is twenty measures long. The fourth has ten measures in the slow common time of the Pavan. The fifth, eight measures in the triple time of the galliard. The sixth, six measures in the style of the pavan, the seventh, thirteen measures in galliard style. The eighth and ninth are repetitions of the first and second, and the whole series is brought to a close 
by a short coda of five measures. Those sections which are polyphonic in style are more or less closely related to each thematically. It will be observed that of the ten sections, seven are made up of an irregular number of measures and cannot give to our ears an impression of rhythmical structure. One should notice too the return of the first two sections at the end which gives some primitive balance to the little piece as a whole. The obvious weakness in such a form of movement lies in the division into so many little sections, no one of which is long enough to claim the serious attention of a listener. True enough, the early works of the instrumental composers show very few rhythmically animated themes which could suggest any considerable treatment and development, but in the few cases where such themes do appear, there is not space enough in a section for the composer to do anything with them, and they drop out of the piece almost as soon as they have awakened in the listener the desire to hear more of them. The natural development was toward the extension of the section, therefore, until each made the impression of a definite and well-balanced whole, and from that it was but a step to cutting off the sections one from the other by pauses. That is what happened. The canzona grew from a movement in many little sections to the ripe form of a piece in four distinct movements to which by the middle of the century was given the name Sonata da Chiesa. Among the first to write sonatas of this type was Giovanni Legrenzi, who published a set of them in 1655. Legrenzi is one of the most gifted composers of the time, not only of operas, in connection with which his name is most often heard, but of instrumental music as well, of which the sonatas just mentioned are excellent examples. The last of them is well planned and interesting throughout. The first movement is an excellent, well-knit fugue built upon a definite rhythmical subject against which two interesting and varied counter-subjects are set. All these subjects have vigour and distinct individuality, and they are treated with a skill which is proof of Legrenzi's instinct for the instrumental style. The second movement is in the dignified rhythm of the saraband, a dance form of the day. The third is a short adagio, leading to the last which is lively and rapid, but rather loose in structure, recalling the old style Richard Carr. However, the sonatas of Legrenzi are often in more than four movements, and the credit of giving the sonata da chiesa its definite and lasting form belongs to Giovanni Battista Vitali in whose collection of them, published in 1667, there is at least a regularity of plan in the number and arrangement of movements. The scheme is practically tripartite. There are two fast movements in common time and in fugal style, one at the beginning and one at the end, and between them a movement generally in simple harmonic style and in triple time. There are also a few very slow measures either before or after the middle movement or at the beginning of the sonata as introduction to the first fast movement. The two fast movements are frequently in thematic relation to each other. Here we have the form made ready for the later masters, of which we shall see them make use. Compared with the canzona of the first half of the century, Vitali's work shows a striking sudden advance, not only in clearness of form, but in instrumental style. Not much is known of his life, but his works show that he was a player of brilliant skill, one of the first of virtuoso violin composers. Though the Sonata da Chiesa was descended directly from the old Canzona da Sonar, and is therefore connected with the old music, it was greatly affected on the way by influences not remotely connected with the old polyphonic style. In the preceding pages it has been shown how the cultivation of the monodic style led to the cultivation of the technique of the human voice. Already in the works of Caccini, himself a great singer, there appear passages for the solo voice intended to show off its flexibility and technique. The influence of the monodic style made itself felt at once in violin music and prompted the cultivation of a form of solo music which had little or nothing to do with the polyphonic canzona. No pieces have come down to us from the first ten years of the century which were written for the violin alone with accompaniment of figured bass for lute or harpsichord. But there are many written for two violins, which, in that they play seldom together but pursue a sort of dialogue in music, 
may be said to belong to the monodic style. The early pieces in this manner are under the influence of the new vocal style. Passages of any lively movement are written after the manner of Caccini's newly discovered vocal agilities. But very soon the suitable violin style began to make its appearance, and we come across passages which could not have been sung, but were suggested by the nature of the instrument for which they were intended. The early efforts were called sonatas. Like the Canzona, they were given special names, for example, Salvatore Rossi's Sonata on the air of the Romanesca, and another on the air of Ruggiero, both of which are no more than a series of variations over two melodies, both well known in their day. The practice of composing variations over a bass part which remained unchanged, or was only very slightly adorned in a few cases, and was called a ground bass, or basso ostinato, was most common throughout the entire 17th century. No manner of securing an effect of form and symmetry could have been simpler, and no other form could have spurred composers more effectively towards the discovery of trills, turns, runs, and other ornaments within the power of instruments, as a very means of saving themselves from the deadly monotony of a few phrases reiterated inexorably again and again in the bass. That the practice even of extemporizing variations, or divisions as they were called, on a ground bass was much in vogue, as the improvisation of descant over the cantus firmus was in the early days of church polyphony, is witnessed by the famous work of the English musician Christopher Simpson, entitled The Division Violist, which appeared in 1659, and which was intended to teach the art. Simpson says, A ground, subject, or bass, call it what you please, is pricked down in two several papers, one for him who is to play the ground upon an organ, harpsichord, or what other instrument may be apt for that purpose, the other for him that plays upon the viol, who, having the said ground before his eyes as his theme or subject, plays such variety of descant or division in concordance thereto as his skill and present invention do then suggest unto him. The true instrumental monody makes its first appearance in 1617 in the works of Biagio Marini, the first famous violinist. In the first of his publications, a set of pieces called Affetti Musicali, printed in 1617 in Venice, where Marini was then playing in the orchestra of St. Mark's. There are two pieces called Sinfonie, for violin, or cornet, with figured bass which may be said to represent the point where two distinct styles of instrumental music begin to diverge, one proceeding directly from these to pieces of widely developed solo music, the other developing through the canzona and works of that kind to modern orchestral music. The first work of Marini presents many innovations. The bowing is suggested by slurs. Use is made of the tremolo, seven years before Monteverdi's Combattimento di Tancredi e Clorinda, in which it was long held to have appeared first, and there are many passages of double stopping. Another composer of the early times is Francesco Turini, writing trio sonatas in the style of Salvatore Rossi, for two violins and a figured bass, and the works of Giovanni Battista Fontana, 1641, show ever further development, not only in violin technique, but in the construction of music as well. Treading so carefully over new ground, the early composers seldom let themselves go in melodies of any long sweep, but restrained themselves to short phrases, just as in writing canzonas for groups of instruments they held fast by short sections. But in the works of Fontana, long smooth phrases of well-balanced melody give proof of the rapidity with which the art was progressing and the confidence that was coming in the treatment of music for the violin. In the works of a contemporary, Tarquinio Merula, there is often even a lively humorous free swing. So the first half of the 17th century brought an understanding of the character of the violin as a solo instrument, and of its special treatment, and of some of the possibilities of virtuosity that lay within it. And through the cultivation of the solo sonata, direct offspring of the early monodic style, there grew up an art of composing long, smooth, expressive melodies for the violin, 
which, exerting an influence upon the canzona of polyphonic birth, was to aid in freeing it from its restriction to short motifs and in setting it upon its way toward the sonata da chiesa of Corelli and the symphonies of Beethoven. End of section 22